are live from City Hall Chamber. Yes, we have quorum. All right. I would like to call this meeting to order. Uh, at this time, I would like to acknowledge uh, that we meet on the traditional land of TD6 territory and acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, Nakura Sioux, as well as Métis and Inuit, and all settlers from around the world. To a roll call of committee members, Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Councillor Rice. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Good morning. And I'll check other council members joining us. Councillor uh, Jans is here with us. Good morning. And uh, Councillor Wright, you're here. I mean, you're yes. joining us. Good morning. And Councillor Prince Bay. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Tang. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Cartmel. Good morning. Okay, so that's everyone for now. Uh, uh, adoption of the agenda. Councillor Rice, do you want to move the adoption of the agenda? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I move. Uh, Executive Committee and adopt the agenda for August 24th. Yeah, with additions and... With addition uh, as follows, uh, 7.3 and SCONA pool recommendations, and then 10 uh, motions pending and 10.1, Ajia Kenha uh, Foundation tax balance, uh, replacement report uh, 7.2, uh, Violin, Violin Line West approve of increase of pipeline agreement amount. Uh, deletion 7.1, Kinsman Club of Edmonton, Kinsman Twin Arena uh, Lease Agreement. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, okay, what happened here? Here we go. Uh, any questions on the adoption of the agenda? Seeing none, please vote. I'm a yes, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, approval of the minutes. Councillor uh, Stevenson, you want to? Oh, you can go to Councillor Nack. Councillor Nack, can you move the uh, approval of the minutes? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I will move the approval of the August 10th, 2022 Executive Committee. And, and I just want to note uh, my apologies for not being on camera. I'm in uh, Drum Heller using hotel Wi Fi for an Alberta to get all these meetings. I'm not tempting fate and using that. So, no. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Any uh, additions or omissions to the approval of the minutes? Seeing none, please vote. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. And any protocol items? None. Select items for debate. All right. Please sign up to select items for debate. Councillor Knack. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. On behalf of Councillor Jans, I'll select uh, 7.3. 7.3. And I don't think, I'm trying to remember under the new rules, do we need to select the unfinished business or is that essentially treated as selected? Uh, we have to select items uh, again if we need to have a discussion because they're uh, back on the, on the new okay. agenda. Okay. And I just, just hold on before you do that. Uh, Madam Clerk, have we confirmed uh, if we still have a speaker on 
Yes, we do. I believe they are online. Okay, we do. Okay. So go ahead, Councilor in which, in which case, I'll select 6.1, and uh, and I believe uh, I'll need to select 6.2, so we can yeah. discuss a motion. Thank you. Okay. Any other selections? Councilor Rice. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, I'm going, I would like to select 6.3. 6.3, okay. Uh, 7.3 already selected. Right? Yep, it has been, yep. And is then also 7.2. 7.2. Uh, do we need to uh, select as a pending motion? Uh, pending motion, I don't think we have to select. No, we don't motion. have to select. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's help. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Okay. All right. So that is, are the items that we, uh, can somebody move the balance, please? Councillor Stevenson. Sure, Mr. Mayor. I'll move um, items 5-1. Five two and seven two. Okay. No, seven two is uh, selected. Oh, it is selected. Yeah, yeah, I apologize. Yeah, 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 so yeah. just five one and five two then. Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, any questions? Seeing none, please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Now we go into request to speak. We can have we, a number. Can we just confirm? Yeah. Uh, can I read off what we Yeah, please do. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So August 24th, 2022, Executive Committee has approved the following requests to reschedule reports 5.1. Revenue source for transit, potential risk and implementation and intergovernmental advocacy revised date, due date to be determined. And 5.2, Edmonton Metropolitan Transit Services Commission Phase 1 Service Plan impl Implications revised due date September 7th, 2022. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Okay, request to speak. We have a number of speakers. Uh, uh, Councillor Stevenson, you want to uh, read sure. the names, please? Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm assuming that some of our speakers are anticipating the 1.30 p.m. time specific, uh, but I'd like to move that executive, com executive committee hear from the following speakers in panels where appropriate. On item 6.1, Ricardo uh, Casanova from Yake Soccer. I see you there, Ricardo. Thanks for joining us. On item 7.3, Gary Meyer, Elaine Soles, Michelle Chu, Hugo Nguyen, Svetlana Troiskaya, Kirby Feng, Brian Torrance, Elliot Wright, Kim Clegg, Katrina Semenuk, Felicity Kusik, Maddie Chan, Amelia Zayan, Jeff Papineau, and Jared Bueller. Okay. All right, so please vote to uh, hear from the members of the public. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried on to request for speci specific time on the agenda. So, Madam Clerk, even though there is a request uh, from one of the members of public, but we also have a number of people in the, in the house now, right? So, and we probably get to this item, or, or sorry, Scona pool recommendation item well before 1.30. So I think we just follow the agenda as it is. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. And please advise Elaine Schultz that uh, it is not at 1.30. If she wished to participate, she would have to participate earlier. We will do so. Thank you, Please. Mr. Okay. Mayor. Thank you. All right, we are into our unfinished business.
item 6.1 Edmonton Soccer Association Edmonton Soccer Center South expansion lease agreement is there a presentation from the administration on this no there is no presentation there's no presentation then we'll go to our speaker all right uh, Ricardo Casanova. Ricardo, are you there? Yeah, I see you there. So you will have five minutes to make your presentation. And after your five minutes are concluded, uh, then committee members or council members may have questions to you. So remain online, please. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so this is the opportunity uh, to speak. Uh, Can't hear you, Ricardo. Can you speak up? Uh, yeah, just, just let up low. Can you hear me all? Uh-huh. Can't hear you. Mr. Mayor, we're fairly confident it's on his side. Um, yeah, can you check we your... Um, call in. Uh, ...equipment? Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. No, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to um, hear from uh, myself. And I wanted to uh, touch on a couple of things that um, raised some questions in the documentation that was provided in the agenda. Um, you know, outside of the, the, soccer concerns and, and the facility, you know, and questions around whether that, that serves the community and in, in what they uh, what they want and need. Um, what appeared, there's no lease agreement um, that we've been able to see. Um, so the documentation refers the original lease agreement, but we have not been able to see it. So that's a concern. Uh, the other concern is why are we extending a contract for 18 years when there's already seven years remaining on it? Um, it seems that it's a very odd, I've, I've been dealing with um, procurements in the public sector for decades now, and it seems a little bit of bad governance to extend a contract without going to tender, particularly by 18 years. If we look at how soccer has changed in um, the last five years, never mind 10, never mind 18, never mind 25 years. Um, it seems like a very odd extension uh, to be coming from a lease amendment. Um, so what I would ask uh, committee is that we pump the brakes, is that we look at um, due diligence, and proper governance procedures um, before we make a decision on what this lease agreement or amendment looks like. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, this was exempt, exempted by Councillor Knack uh, to allow Ricardo to speak. And I have Councillor Rutherford on board. So Councillor Rutherford, go ahead. Yeah, and I must say I'm a bit surprised by your your presentation. Um, when I read the report, to me, the extension to 18 years was to account for the payments back for the contribution of this organization. So there, rather than that 20 years, we heard about the hardship that you had, and so this was extending. So it felt to me like the city was actually working with uh, your organization to find a path forward so that you could have the, the, the payments frozen in the short term right, while you recover. But then that would mean that the lease, yes, is for 25 years because there's payments every year to make I, that contribution. Can you speak to that? Or I am I misunderstanding something? Yeah, I should clarify that I am actually not with the Edmonton Soccer Association facilities. I okay. am part of an advocacy group called YAG Soccer that works okay. with the grassroots uh, communities uh, in soccer to advocate for the sport itself. So 
I have nothing to do with the facilities group. Okay, so what your concern about is that then this facility, if it's ex that makes more sense. So the the extension of this lease agreement to 25 years means that other organizations like Yeg Soccer don't have an opportunity to potentially be the um, stewards of this space. Is that how I'm understanding it? Yeah, yeah, agreed. They're, you know, in, in good governance and procurement policy and, and trade agreements, um, you know, extending a contract by 18 years in an amendment seems unheard of in, in my experience. Um, but yeah, definitely, like, things like uh, something of this scope should be going to tender, um, you know, and there's, there, there's references to hardship. There's references to a 20 year plan. There's references to an original lease agreement, but there's no detail in any of those aspects. So, I mean, you're being asked to make a decision, uh, with very limited information in my, my opinion. But what would, what would, okay. So if we pump the brakes on this lease agreement, what would be your solution then for the 9.5 million that is is owed to the city as part of that joint agreement for the building of the extension? There's lots of parties in the city that would be willing to step up and and put their hat in the ring for um, responsibility. So I mean, you you don't know what's uh, what's being offered when you don't put it to tender, and that's really the the, the point of going to tender is due diligence okay no thank you for your answers that that helps i'm glad i i asked those questions and clarified a few things appreciate it ricardo and appreciate Absolutely. you being as happy to be here yep. thank you thank i'm you. done mr mayor thank you Councillor rutherford Councillor Wright. hi good morning um mr casanova i'm just wondering what do you uh, what is it that you want to see in the lease agreement or or, or what are you? What are your concerns with the the lease agreement that you'd like to have a closer look at it? Well, I mean, no concerns per se because I don't know what's in it. Um, I've asked on multiple occasions to see the original lease agreement, and have not been provided it. Um, so I mean, I can't ask or provide concerns in something that I've never seen. Okay, I, I'm just wondering, did you want like? Well, I guess, what would you like to see in the lease agreement? Like, would it be in relation to allowing other organizations and that to use the facilities or? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, there's there's some concern. I mean, it is a, a taxpayer funded facility. It is a city owned facility um, and is the operator um, allowed to determine who uses it? And what are those specifications? So I think that's a great question. Um, that wasn't kind of top of mind for me, but now that you mention it, I think that's I think that's a very good point um, as to you know what what are the the um, qualifications? What you know how how is that decision made? Um, you know, and I think when we start to look at what's happening in the in the larger scheme of things, we have uh, Hockey Canada, Canada Soccer. A lot of questions are being asked about transparency and accountability, um, you know, and, you know, there's that old saying that poop rolls downhill. I think that this is a, a fantastic time to start asking accountability from our grassroots organizations in our local cities um, while these questions are being asked at the national level as well. So if there's a lack of transparency or accountability, I think now would be the perfect time to um, start asking those questions. So Councillor Wright, I am going to, sorry, unfortunately, I'm going to stop here and I'll give okay. you three minutes so when we come back again, because I nope, believe... that's quite all right. I was no, actually yeah, done. No, Thank no, you. Sitting, sitting, <laughs> in this, sitting in this chair, I sometimes forget that this is not a council meeting, this is a committee meeting, right? So I should have gone to okay. Councillor Wright before as a committee oh, member. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. No, and I'm, I'm, I'm done. I've got My questions mistake. I'll come thing. back to you. I'll come back to Councillor Wright. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chair. Um, <clears throat> so... Uh, I would like to ask a few questions to get a clarification. Uh, first one is about the lease agreement. Uh, based on the report, our city manager actually has agreements with the three existing and soccer facility. And right now we're, change, uh, we're amending agreement to include that um, two fields in South and including new addition. 
uh, are you referring, say, and really no lease agreement to existing three facility or just only specific to the new two fields and in South uh, that is intended to be added into this agreement? Uh, well, I think the, um, the intent of this amendment is to include the addition of the South extension. Um, however, I think the um, larger question of the other facilities, I think is worth asking the same thing is, you know, obviously this one is a lease agreement on the South extension. Um, so I would assume, but again, I haven't seen uh, that there would be lease agreements on the East Center and the West Center as well. Um, and, I, you know, if we're looking at one of them, I think we should look at all of them. Okay, uh, thank you for that clarification. Uh, so the next question, you mentioned about the, in the past five years, there are lots of change in this industry, uh, specifically related to the soccer programs. Uh, can you provide a little bit detail and specific information? What does that mean? How, uh, what does that change mean? Or uh, how those changes could impact our city decision and for this lease agreement and many? Um, so, I mean, there's there's lots of different changes. I think one, uh, a few of them that kind of come top the top of mind is we have two different youth leagues, which is unprecedented across the country uh, for a major city in Canada. We have two competing leagues, whereas every other city has one, you know, minor um, soccer league. Um, so that's that's a hindrance and a um, a challenge for many in the grassroots soccer community, uh, those that uh, don't hold the, the reins of power. So, um, you know, we we see, uh, and I'll use an example, we see a group like BTB um, that has grown uh, significantly and they want to be able to provide grassroots uh, community-based organizations. Now, I won't speak for them, but I will say when you have a group that gets larger and larger and larger, they're capacity or requirement for capacity increases. And if they don't have access to certain facilities, that stifles their ability to provide programming to children. We are a winter city. Um, you look at free play for kids uh, as well, right? So there's different groups and things have changed significantly um, just based on capacity. So is that is that fair to interpret and your uh, answer uh, about to increase that accessibility? and also fairness and cross the city for all the organizations. Absolutely. Yeah, accessibility is a huge one. Affordability is another uh, significant oh, one. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I think the um, accessibility becomes um, just more and more important uh, every day as groups grow. Okay, so thank you. And my last question about you, you talk about due intelligence diligence. Uh, so it's my understanding, yes, our, our city actually uh, doing lots of work related to the to refract this. And then based on the reports and provided here, uh, from in your opinion, how does this look like uh, due intelligence? What's expectation and from public and also from, uh, you mentioned a lot of uh, grassroots organization who are actually doing the soccer program to support our community. So can you uh, give me a little bit more details about how does that look like and then from public, from organization, and from our soccer uh, players and to our uh, city? Um, yeah, so I think there's, you know, there's some mention in, in the documentation that there was community consultation and, and, and that sort of thing. And that refers to the extension uh, or the addition uh, of those two fields. Um, but when we're talking about extending a contract for 18 years, was there consultation with the community on that? Um, and I think the answer would be no. Um, and it's tough. I'm over time now. So, I mean, it's tough to be able to outline all of these, these challenges. Um, you know, and that's why, you know, we don't say, I'm not saying, you know, don't go forward with this. I'm just saying, let's pump the brakes. Let's do some due diligence so we can actually have these conversations in full as opposed to five minute bites of time. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Reyes. Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thank you so much for your, your presentation this morning and, and uh, helping me understand some more of the nuances around this. 
So, so just to clarify too, so, so would there be interest from, from a group like Yeg Soccer to take over um, management of the facility or your concern is more primarily around ensuring equitable access? Um, I think it's, it's equal, um, equitable access, uh, obviously to the community, but also equitable, equitable access to, uh, the ability for, um, other groups to be able to put their hat in the ring to take responsibility for, uh, management of facilities. Great. And so, and so there is appetite there in terms of other groups wanting, wanting that opportunity, having the capacity to take that on. There's a lot of, uh, buzz in the community. Um, I can't say specifically any groups, but um, yeah, I think there is. And, you know, if it goes to tender and, and you know, and again, it's the process of, of going to tender and finding out these different nuances. And if nobody puts their hat in the ring, then then that's fine. It's just like every other procurement process yeah. um, that the city has an obligation to follow. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, there's just some clarification I need around um, some of the cost sharing uh, but again, are some of these other organizations, I mean, uh, is there sort of capital available or at least an ability to sort of uh, pay back a, a capital contribution as part of this, potentially? Great question. Um, you know, with limited information being provided, there's not much information that can be shared back. Um, you know, what are the nuances of that lease agreement? And until we know what those are, we can appropriately say whether it's doable or not. Um, I would say it's feasible considering, you know, some of the fields are now being given across to, to ball hockey um, and, uh, and the facilities are kind of running themselves. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's a way to say I don't know how to answer your question without <laughs> knowing the details of no, deal. that's that's just fine. That's that is a helpful response, and uh, I'll take that forward with, for some questions with our city staff. Thank you again so much for being here this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. So that concludes the questions to you, uh, 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 Ricardo. Thank you for joining us. Uh, you can stay on to uh, listen to the conversation uh, if you wish to do so. Uh, nice to see you. Uh, okay, we are going to go to administration now. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you. Thanks uh, um, for the report. And um, I have I have some very basic questions, and I do apologize if if these are spelled out in the report and I, I miss them. Is there is there uh, in the past for the original agreement, and then as part of the expansion, is there an actual capital cash contribution from the Edmonton Soccer Association, or is it? Uh, sort of the city lending over the course of the lease agreement. So the rent payments are paid back and in, in, into the capital reserve fund. Uh, but sorry, so in the report, in the report, it talks about, I think for the original, uh, it was 4.6 million. Um, and then there's 9.5 million um, plus interest paid back. So, so just so I understand is is the Soccer Association actually coming forward with $9.5 million? Yes, they're contributing $9.5 million towards the capital of the construction of the facility. Okay. And then... Sorry. Then, sorry. So they've contributed the $9.5 million, and then it's paid back through the rent? That's right. So it's paid back through the rent. So their, okay. their contribution is is provided for the capital and then the city will be receiving that back through the rent payments over the term of the lease agreement itself. Sorry, but if they're contributing that cash, why why are they also paying the city back through rent? What I meant to say is that their contribution is through the rent payments that are that are p paid back to the city, if that makes sense. So they, they're committing to 9.5 million and the way they're doing that is making those payments through the term of that lease, and that's how the contribution comes back to the city. Okay, so that's the clarification, but there's no upfront, they are not writing us a check for $9.5 million? No. Okay, 
Okay, I think, I think that's an important clarification because I think um, in that sense, if another provider could make those same lease payments that would uh, you know, contribute to the city's capital cost, is that, is that a possibility? So it is, I understand that for this specific agreement, there was council approval back in 2016 in order to progress the construction of the facility. And there was a business case that was prepared at that time to support the, the construction. Um, and at, it would have been at that point, I believe that it would have been necessary to go through uh, an option to review what other parties could step in. But I would just maintain that the lease agreement was still in place for seven year period and so we were still in the midst of uh, an agreement and that's the reason why we have not gone out through a broader tender process yeah yeah absolutely i think i think that makes sense to me i think just in terms of that model um because you know i think it's great when we can partner with with other agencies and groups in the in the community and we can uh, all share that capital cost but again if it's you know, if it's not a prerequisite for the organization to have that cash at hand and that they can contribute into the capital over the course of the lease, I think the opportunity to open that up to other groups makes sense to me, but, but just wondering your thoughts on that for the expansion, recognizing the existing lease is still there. So I believe we do have Linda Borak on the call from Community Services. I'm wondering if maybe she can comment on this. Good morning. Uh, yes, the Edmonton Soccer Association is a long-standing partner with the City of Edmonton, and we've worked closely with them as the sole provider of indoor soccer facilities um, for decades at this point. Um, they approached us to um, consider this expansion project, and as Chris mentioned, a business case was put forward with council approval to work with the ESA for the contribution of funding for this expansion. It is the model that has been used for each of the other facilities, and the Soccer Association has diligently contributed that financial um, commitment for each of the facilities thus far. Great. And, and well, okay, yeah, I, I will leave that question. Just in terms of the lease agreement, so, so I didn't see anything just sort of in the high-level terms that we were provided with around equitable access or collaboration with other soccer groups. Is that part of the agreement in terms of having having some provisions around equitable access? So my understanding of the lease agreement is that uh, at the end of the day, ESA would be managing that facility. And so part of that is also subleasing out to various organizations that could make use of that facility. It would be up to them to, to go through that process. Uh, but I believe through conversations, it's always important from administration's perspective that that is provided equitably to to all parties that come forward. Thanks, I'm out of time, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thank you. Um, I think I wanna pick up a little bit on what Councillor Stevenson was leaving off on because I really wanted to dig into the GBA plus analysis section of this report. Uh, Cause it says, you know, that the users represent diverse groups. However, support for diverse groups and marginalized participations is at the level of the organizations that book time at the soccer center and do not and not directly under the control of ESA. And what I just heard kind of is, is similar to that. But my concern is what is ESA charging for leases? Is that accessible? Are there groups that are being left out? And if we own the facility, are we not? Why are we not putting some sort of caveat on an expectations of accessibility within the lease agreement? So for this one, I might go to Linda Borak as well, just in terms of maybe speaking to the accessibility and the conversations that she has with the association on a regular basis. So the Edmonton Soccer Association is responsible for the operation of the facility, and they have two member associations. Um, EMSA and um, the Adult Soccer League. And though the EMSA is essentially um, all ages and abilities and they get participants from diverse groups. So ESA, who holds the lease, manages the facility and the organizations within uh, have the membership of the people within Edmonton that want to play soccer. There's also ample hours available after the user groups books. So that would be all hockey, lacrosse, inline, and all of the soccer groups through EMSA and um, ESA, then there's uh, abundance of hours available for casual bookings as well. 
Okay, but what is the cost? What 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 is the what is the rate that they are currently charging? I will have to get that for you and bring that back to you. Okay, I would I would appreciate that. And then my other question was on the agreement where I I saw kind of a bit of a weird loophole because the report talks about how the they're required to top up their um, capital reserve fund to have sufficient, you know, in case of, but then it says that their agreement allows them to use the capital reserve fund for rent. So I feel like even if they prove that they've topped it up, if they can use it for rent, like how are we monitoring that? Because it feels like it could just be very cyclical and we don't actually create that safeguard. Administration has to consent to any time they use the reserve fund um, to pay for their rent. So it, it would be in, in conversation. Can you move with, close to the mic, if you don't mind, oh, please? Sorry. Yeah. Administration has to consent to that use, so it would be in a circumstance that we would find uh, applicable in that situation. Okay. And, and another thing that was mentioned kind of with the line of questioning with Councillor Stevenson that I thought was really interesting was, you know, that this group has been the sole provider of indoor soccer for decades. And whenever something is going on in per perpetuity for decades, I get concerned. Have we assessed what else has emerged, other grassroots organizations, any, like, have we done an assessment on, on this or is it just, this is the status quo and this is what's been done, so we just continue with that? So at the time these facilities were built, they were built in partnership with Edmonton Soccer Association. I think what you're what we're experiencing is a change in the landscape. So for many mm -hmm. years there was a single provider and the yeah. landscape is changing. Now we still have lease agreements with seven year terms on them. And, yeah. and an approval of an expansion on a facility that has an existing seven year term. So I think we're in a place where the environment is changing after the, we could, so we could wait until the lease agreements are done and then reconsider, but there's still seven, at least seven years on this lease agreement. Yeah, and I don't think that we're, we're you know, the seven years folding this new expansion into that seven years. But I do think it is, it does bring up a point about the 18 year extension. So that's, that's where I'm trying to, to dig into. I'll, I'll, I'll let my colleagues ask questions and potentially circle back. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Rice. Thank you, Ms. <laughs> Ms. Mayor. Um, I do have a few questions regarding the partnership. So I really appreciate our cities uh, always and then leverage that partnership to support our Edmontonians. Uh, but the concern, what I heard here, is how that partnership impact our taxpayer dollars to be used. Uh, so my question was related to this partnership and also financial uh, modeling and for those uh, soccer center um, facilities. Um, the first one is about if you, we still have like seven years away and why we need to do this uh, right now. I understand that because the new addition and for that in South Extension will be operate soon and in 2022 or next year 2023, we need to ensure that piece and how we can uh, manage that piece and to ensure accessibility and also affordability as well. So can you give me a little bit of information on that? Yeah, that's correct. So the lease firstly is amended to include that extension area. Uh, if we didn't have that, that wouldn't be included, but also ESA in their financial position needs more time to pay off the cost of the extension, the existing uh, uh, monies owed for that. So the, the extension is allowing them uh, firstly, to, on the amendment to defer payments over a couple of years and then increase those payments in two years when they can start paying into that cost again. And then, then my question come in would be, and then, so Sadie and actually, um, so just just to clarify, if, uh, I have a misunderstanding. <laughs> uh, Sadie actually use our capital uh, budget and we build all those 
facility centers and including the new addition and the south extension. So if it's that case, uh, do we do any consultation publicly and then to open door to all organizations who actually doing seminar uh, support to our soccer players, including youth, including kids, and say there is opportunity and then. So how that be reflect in this lease agreement extension? So firstly, I would say, state that yes, the capital profile for the construction of this was previously approved and that's what's funded the construction of the building up to this point in time. Uh, there was always the commitment through a previous council approval that the Edmonton Soccer Association would make the 9.5 million contribution through repayment of, uh, we'll call it rent over a set period of time. And right now, what we're here to do essentially is to extend that time based on their request due to the fact that they need a little bit more time to make it more financially feasible for them to do that because of the impacts that they've experienced, especially during COVID, where they had a large uh, drop in, in, in attendance and, and users within that building. Uh, in terms of then the second part, which is around how, how do we make sure that we get more parties involved, that's something that we can take into consideration, I believe, for future facilities, and we can work with our community services team to build that into, um, processes. Uh, okay. Um, so for the maintenance, uh, I want to look at the cost for the maintenance and I, ta I talk about the cost for the construction to build those uh, facilities. That is our city's capital. And then for the maintenance, and once this needs agreement signed and who uh, what's the cost for the maintenance and who is responsible for the maintenance cost? So the tenant is responsible for the maintenance costs right now because they're still okay. an existing lease in place and so they will and continue the, to be. for the existing uh, lease agreement, uh, I'm talking about for the new one. The tenant, so in this case it would be Edmonton Soccer Associ Association would also take over the maintenance costs of that, the additional facility that's built. Uh, do we have sense like how much cost for each uh, existing for each existing facility and a soccer facility? Let and me see if we can find that for you. And it's because that is could reflect our rental and how we calculate why we use basic rent to pay that contribution. And then I don't know how that contribution be calculated and based on how the basic rent to calculate it. So if I can just, so I believe the way these leases, leases are structured and, and my team can correct me is that Edmonton Soccer Association operates the facility and maintains the facility and the rental charge covers their capital contribution to the building. So they're operating and maintaining these buildings at their cost. Very different than like, then for instance, our arenas where we operate and maintain the arenas and we charge out ICE rental fees which cover a portion of the operations. So there's, oh, uh. there's so, those operations and maintenance are with ESA under these agrees, agreements. So I, I, my time is up. I, I will come back for the next round. Okay. I still have a few questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Constance Rice. So the landscaping is changing and uh, are we need to respond to that change. Uh, this might be too late because of the previous agreements, but we are responding to some of those changes as well. I remember city having an agreement with PUSHA. PUSHA is a Southeast based organization. They run outdoor uh, soccer fields uh, and they have planned to expand. So we are looking at opportunities for making sure that we are responding to the changing needs, right? Yes, that's correct. We do have agreements with different entities out there that support soccer in the city. And, and we also have increased our support maybe not to the level that community like to see, but we are on the right path, for example, for uh, uh, free play, right? Uh, with uh, uh, Tim Adams group, we increase that support. So we are responding to some of those real, uh, changing needs. Yeah, 
That's yeah. correct. And, I, and Free Footy does have sublet in the, 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 the I believe, the West facility. Right. Someone yeah. can correct me on that. Yeah. So is there a way for us to, I mean, ESA itself serves very diverse population of players, but is there a way for us to look, maybe have conversation with ESA about their governance structure? Uh, to have diverse voices included that can talk about diverse needs of the of the city and also the changing needs of the city that ESA, even though it's evolving, I know ESA while well, they're they're evolving, but is there a way for us to influence some of that change? I would say yes, but I would defer to Linda Borak just so she can make a comment on this. I would say yes as well. Um, however, I think that the the nature of the diverse population, again, is from the member organizations and the users of the facility. ESA themselves operate the facility um, solely, and they get rentals from whoever would yeah. like to use the space, yeah. primarily from members um, of EMSA and EDSA along with the other concrete users. But again, there's ample opportunity for um, general users, casual users, school groups, et cetera, to also um, use the facility. But if there is a willingness of other groups or a desire of other groups to um, discuss with ESA the use of the facility, I'm just, they'd be open to it. Yeah, well, it's, it's similar to community leagues, right? Community leagues been an institution in the city for 100 years and we, have a very strong relationship with them, but community leagues also need to evolve our, as our community is evolving to respond to the diverse needs of the, of the community. So all these are very important questions that council members are raising, right? So how do we, how we do that at the same time, uh, you know, maintain the relationship with the existing organization or help them evolve to, uh, uh, so that's where my question is on the governance, right? Is there not, like I know they have, rental agreements, I understand that, but is there a way for us to maybe have that broader conversation with these well-established, very valuable organizations that their, their governance is changing to respond to the needs of the community? I believe we can. Uh, this is something that um, through our community services team, we can have conversations with the different entities that are out there and make sure that they, they're all being considered in terms of how space yeah. can be utilized within the facilities that the city leases out uh, and then are managed by yeah. other parties. Yeah, they're, look at, they're important partners, but city is still putting a lot of money into these agreements. And uh, I think it's a way to leverage that to influence some change in, uh, uh, for, for, for responding to uh, new, re new realities. So okay, that's that's I I would be interested in that. Uh, I I hope that you will have that conversation. So uh, uh, okay, that's for me, and I'll go to Councillor Wright next. Thank you very much. Um, so I you mentioned that um, when the expansion came about um, that it didn't go out for tender because there was already that existing contract in place. But would it would a contract like this, or did it initially go out to? Uh, through an RFP? So uh, let me just separate the construction of the facility versus the partnership agreement on funding. So the, the construction of the building would have been tendered by the city of Edmonton in accordance with any other um, procurement rules. The, uh, the agreement to enter a lease is not sub with a non-for-profit is not subject to trade exceptions. And okay. so that like just there are two different transactions. There's a transaction for a lease of a facility that builds into it a capital cost contribution paid back through rent and the construction of a facility that follows the procurement standards of the city. Okay. So and now that that payback through rent. Um, in the report, it says that they can use their capital reserve fund to cover the rent arrears. Do they have sufficient in their reserve? Uh, they do for now, and they'll be increasing those payments in two years to, to keep on adding to that. And as I had uh, mentioned earlier, um, 
any time they have to use that fund, it has to be approved by administration. Okay, they do for now for two years, but I thought it's a dollar in the first year. So what they've requested was a deferral for a couple years to help build up that capital reserve and their cash position at this point in time, which is why there's the further extension in this in this agreement. They have money currently available, but it's, it's not readily available in, in terms of the fact that it needs to mature in the where it's currently at. Um, so I'm hoping that's answering your question, but please let me know if you need any further clarification. I mean, on the, on the surface, this report made sense um, in that as treasurer for a community league who used to um, write checks to the, the different soccer association for, for vouchers parents earned, um, yeah, there was, there was act, absolutely no activity in the past couple of years. So, um, but it does just con concern me. And, and I think that Mr. Casanova brought up a, a good point as far as um, what's going on with Hockey Canada. In our, um, in that lease agreement, is there any sort of a, a termination clause or something? If, um, if something like what's going on in Ho Hockey Canada were to be brought to light with, with an organization, and I'm not insinuating anything, I, I just want to know, is there something that can be built into... Um, so we can disassociate ourselves from any organization that might. Uh, not that I am aware of, but just to confirm, so ESA runs the facility and then obviously the user groups or the, the organizations like EMSA will be the groups that, like the user groups that would probably be more, um, would be more equated to if anything was, was happening in an organization, not the actual facility itself, I would imagine unless the way they operated the facility was uh, not quite right. Anyhow, I, like I said, I, I'm not insinuating anything. I was just curious about um, such a clause. Um, and, and normally these, these lease agreements are not um, public, is that right? Yeah, under four, if we don't release um, the agreements themselves, we can, we can discuss major terms as we did, and we, we uh, included that as an attachment in the report. Okay, so what what makes the lease agreement um, not accessible under FOIP? Is it because they're a nonprofit? Is it, I, I, I'm just trying to understand why we can't get that information. So typically the FOIP considerations that we're looking here are just to not impact any of third party business interests in this situation, but a separate party could at any time make a FOIP request to the city uh, and we would go through that process at that time. So Mr. Casanova could do a FOIP request? That's correct. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for the clarification. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I'm still still struggling with this this phrasing of a capital contribution. So so ESA is not getting an equity stake in this building, correct? It's still the full ownership of the city of Edmonton? So the full ownership of the building is with the city of Edmonton. What happens is the lease agreement requires them to operate and maintain this building at their cost, and the rent covers a portion of the capital contribution, which I would say is different than things like arenas where the city covers 100% of the capital cost, and ICE rental covers only a portion to operate a facility. For sure, for sure. And I think I think sort of the parallel that I draw is that if I build a new commercial building and I lease that out to a tenant, the lease rate I charge them is going to cover my capital expenses, right? And I know I know this isn't covering the city's full capital expense, but it's a similar, like again, they're not getting an equity stake. The reason I ask these questions is I just want to ensure that this isn't an organization that has put their own money forward and now they're going to be out of pocket if we change the length of, of an agreement with them. If you were to try and terminate this agreement early, they there would be consequences. Sure. And sorry, I don't mean terminate early, but it's not that they have... Like if, if, a, if a community group had invested $5 million in a building and they wanted... 20 years of use out of that for that capital contribution. Like I see that logic, but that's not what's happening in this instance, right? So if you if you don't recover the full amount from 
ESA under the lease agreement as designed, you will be short capital funding and you would have to find alternate funding for that. Right, but it could be if another organization says, I can make those same payments, then we're not out of pocket. Correct, but the lease was designed with a term to take ESA to the end of the commitment. Yes, but not for the expansion, right? You could separate the expansion, but I believe there's a different, I'm gonna defer to Mr. Jiraki. So you could separate the expansion in some way. However, I think in this situation, due to the fact that the city typically would not be operating the facility, we don't have the staff and resources to do that. That's part of the reason why we wanted to continue to work with this organization because of the partnership agreement that was entered into prior to uh, this, this lease amending agreement, which now just, sorry, moves the, uh, uh, changes the premises to include both the building and the parking lot. Yeah, and I think, and I don't think I have any concerns with, with, the, with the structure of the relationship, with how it's operating. I think it makes a ton of sense. The question is just, can we invite others to, to, to have that same partnership with us? And does that respond to community needs in a better way? So maybe maybe just, uh, just you know, I think a couple of my colleagues have picked up on it as well, but I was also surprised to see that they could use reserve funding for, for rent arrears. And I think, you know, what we're seeing a lot of right now is, uh, you know, buildings that were meant to be maintained by other groups not being maintained very well. We're now dealing with the end of life cycle costs so just wondering, you know, what what prevents, what protects us in these instances, and do we require, you know, regular building condition reports, for example? So part of this is due to the fact that we have an agreement that was already in place from years ago. And so right now, the amending agreement that we have put forward is really shifting the premises and the location, um, as well as extending the term. The the component around the capital reserve and the fact that that can be used for payment for arrears. That was something that was previously negotiated and was already in the agreement. So we, based on conversations with the, with the tenant in this case, we decided to maintain that position, knowing that the city will have that protection that we still need to consent to that use. Um, uh, building condition reports and the building condition rep thank you for that uh, yeah we do regularly complete building condition reports usually they're completed I would say maybe I can defer to others but generally I would say every five years for buildings depending on how new they are um, and so right now there wouldn't be a necessity to complete a building condition report for the new facility but the older ones we would have to look at Bart is correct. Uh, we typically get on a five-year cycle to do building condition assessments, and as this is our asset, we would be doing that. Um, and along with that, that provides us the opportunity to, to gain the assurance that the operations and maintenance requirements are happening um, based on the terms of the lease as has been outlined. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the first question for the uh, South Extension and the new addition and the, that project, so for two new fields, still on schedule or not on schedule? Just give me a moment, Councillor Rice. Uh, I just want to make sure, and because right now we're talking about the two things. So one is the existing uh, Agreement that one still have seven years to go. I think that that one I'm I'm definitely to support to continue to do that. So no intention to change that. But the key argument point here is should we add this new addition and South Exchange into that existing uh, agreement and also in ten extended to eighteen years. So I want before make that decision. I want to make sure the first the project the new addition and the South Extension is on schedule. So the operations open date will be September 2022 or still that date or we are on the delay. The, the latest I have is that it's Q3 of 2022, not a specific date as they're approaching sort of finalization of the build and fit up. So if you, we still have, have delay, could we use this time to refract my colleagues mentioned about that uh, accessibility and also uh, equity and to open the door 
and for the other organizations see if there is an opportunity for them to look at. And because right now the key point here is we're talking about how we need that new facility and use that basic rent to pay $9.5 million. There is no front payment made by ESA yet. So if that is the situation, do we have enough time to do that consultation and to get engaged and from other organizations and who are willing to do this? And specifically, I ask this question. I heard lots of concerns from my area, South Edmonton. There are no facility indoor soccer at all in the entire world. And for 80,000 people with not younger families and with lots of kids' desire and to play game and in the winter. So I believe the, the best way to answer this is to suggest that um, based on this conversation, we can go back to Edmonton Soccer Association, have a further conversation around governance and accessibility and see if there's a way to uh, communicate with them the necessity of providing additional sublease space to all types of different user groups that may want to use the space. Um, with that in mind, the, the lease agreement right now is really being put in place now so that they can right away move forward with uh, managing that facility. And although it's Q3 that it's supposed to be completed, I believe it's it's on Q3. track. I've been there recently and it, and it was very close to being finished. So this would address the, the issue of just uh, providing additional space for, for those that clearly there's a demand for soccer and, and these two facilities will help in that regard. Uh, okay, so then the two questions related to this. And one, with the delay, and do we have the budget over, over it, or we still keep on budget? No, the project's on budget. I would just say that this is a an active operational facility while this expansion is happening. So to Mr. Uh, sorry, Bart, Bart's... Jiraki. <laughs> Jiraki um, <laughs> comment, um, this is a necessary amendment to ensure that continued operations can happen. Um, earlier, Ms. Padbury talked about different models. We don't have many models like this, and um, I would caution Council uh, around the, the desire to um, um, encourage okay. a group to take on more than they're comfortable taking on. Um, it's not to say that they can't improve uh, or that we can talk to them about different opportunities. I just caution that we don't have many models like this where others are willing to contribute to uh, facilities yeah, yeah. that are operational. Okay, I, I get it. And then specifically for certain models and then people say the change and then people say uh, some improvement. I believe ESA and they always work on that improvement as well. Uh, so due to the delay and then uh, I... I would like to say, can we, uh, is that feasible and for us to put the referral motion and to say and then to use this time uh, to talk with ESA and say if there's anything that we can uh, make make some improvement or change to reflect what I heard and also my colleagues' points here and then to make that decision and come back uh, next time. I'll, I'll let Linda speak more to this as well, but ESA is already... My, my time is up. Sorry, they've already yeah. in, invested significant funds in this project, and I believe this is in their business plan. I don't think there is an option for us not to include them in this extension. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, yeah, so I, I'm going to put a motion on the floor and then I would appreciate administration's thoughts on that motion. So the motion that I'd like to put on the floor is that the lease agreement between the City of Edmonton and the Edmonton Soccer Association on the terms and conditions outlined in Attachment 1 of the August 10th, 2022 Executive Committee Report FCES 01195 be approved with the following amendments and that the lease amending agreement be in form and content acceptable to the city manager. So the extension term is for seven years, so with the expiry date of October 2029, and with a clause in the lease agreement for community benefit. So... Uh, can you... Do you have the wording to the clerk, Councillor Rutherford, or...? Yes, just give us one moment. Yeah, you, We're putting yep. it up. Go ahead. Uh, Ms. Badbury. So, and, 
And it just, just hold on. I just want to, you will have it on the screen. Uh, Councilor Rutherford, you want to explain it? Yeah, so I think that I, from my understanding and through a bit of conversation with my other colleagues, uh, we understand and, and value the Edmonton Soccer Association as, as a partner, but we do think that extending, I do think that, I shouldn't speak for we, I do think that extending to 18 years in addition to the seven years uh, doesn't open any space or impetus to really have this pause and, and reconsideration of what other landscapes have changed, whether organizations may be able to step into that managing of the space. And I do agree with the idea that it, it, it could, but I do also understand the tension of this extension is opening imminently. And so we do want somebody to be able to operate that imminently and, and recognizing that we have seven years of the agreement. I would not want to in any way financially harm that by by breaking that. Um, I also do recognize still giving them a bit of a grace period as they recover from COVID. So that is why I did not amend that clause. Um, that's my opening. And I know it sounds like Ms. Padbury has some thoughts. Yeah. I, I think I just need to remind council of what was approved in the capital profile. And so this is roughly a $30 million facility. And part of the approval of this facility is self-supporting tax guaranteed debt of $9.5 million. And this is the interplay with the lease agreement. And so as a city, we borrow for this and the self-supported tax guaranteed debt is ultimately paid back through those rent payments. If you alter that, so you, I don't believe you need an extension. So if I just take this seven years, there's seven years left on this agreement we would need to amend the lease to include the footprint of the facility. But if you only go to the seven years, you must find an alternate funding source than what is stated in this capital profile. I'm, I'm out of time. I would have a question to that, but uh, I'm out of time. Okay. Councillor Rice. Uh, I actually agree uh, the um, uh, Ms. Patel mentioned this very important understanding that financial impact. Uh, specifically, if we only intend uh, extend seven years, we actually we, we don't have the time period for them to pay back. And then because this motion to me is not clear, uh, we already uh, agreed to give that uh, attention. Oh, sorry, uh, addition, the new addition and the South extension and including in. So if we include, if this new motion includes that new addition, but seven years does not allow them to pay back. This cannot work. Uh, I rather to have the referral motion to look at the opportunity, how we, how we can uh, use this new facilities and also the new terms and to include and improve accessibility and for other organizations. That is why I think the referral motion could address those concerns. So is my understanding right? So I just want to get a clarification from administration. Yes, I, I'm not sure I can speak on referral motion though, just to be clear. Uh, not refer motion, just my understanding for this motion, what impact could could be. Your understanding of the impact is correct. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thank you for that, that clarification. So I think, again, my my intent or my interest would be that we we absolutely continue this this model where where some of the capital costs are recouped over a 25 year period that that makes total sense to me i think you know what what my desire is is that other groups are at least offer the opportunity to assume that that cost the least cost so so to councillor uh rice's question would a referral motion provide the opportunity to see if there is appetite for other groups to pick this up after that seven year expiry? So I also just want to rem maybe state how we got, like we are here because Edmonton Soccer Association 
approached council about an extension, which was then approved. If you are asking about how do we work these things going forward, I think that an appropriate way could be if we were approached by an extension, then seeking a wider market before we make decisions. On this particular decision, I believe you've made at least some sort of commitment, certainly through the profile, the, the capital profile that you've approved. And so I'm struggling a bit with how do you unwind what, what does seem to be a commitment. The lease was almost housekeeping for a commitment was, that was made and a funding structure that was put in place in approved capital budget through a budgetary process. And, and I hear you uh, absolutely. I think what I just keep getting stuck on is I am unclear, and, and maybe this is just the question that I need clarity on, is what costs have has ESA incurred? Because again, to me, it, it doesn't sound like they have put capital dollars in. So incurred is not necessarily relevant here. What you have approved as a funding source is self-supported tax guaranteed debt, right, which but, means you must recover lease yes. payments. And but so if, you, we... if they haven't incurred it, then what you actually have to do is find another funding source for the 9.5 million. Or can we not find someone else to cover the payback? Not for the seven years. Right, but after the seven years, that's what we're interested in. So after the seven years, can we see if there's someone else who will take back those, re take on the repayments? I just wanna make one clarification on the seven years. So yes, the existing agreement runs until 2029. There are two five-year extensions that are applicable in that. So it actually continues on until 2039, just to make sure that we're considering that part. And apologies um, for not mentioning that previously. And they are at the sole discussion of ESA. Oh. This would have been an, the existing agreement that was entered into uh, prior to like, considering this amending agreement right now. And if I can just add, the Edmonton Soccer Association has contributed $500,000 through grant funding to this expansion project to cover off costs of SF and E. They have also, uh, they paid for the um, initial design of $150,000, the schematic design many years ago. And they have um, contributed through partner organizations like Ball Hockey and Line Lacrosse, um, another hundred thousand dollars towards this expansion project so in addition to that 9.5 million dollar financial contribution they will pay back they have already contributed funding for this right and I, I think the question is uh, you know how how long is an appropriate time to to kind of uh, recoup that cost so I but I do just want to go back to that so so the current agreement ends in 2029, but there's 10 years extension to 2039 that's at the sole discretion of ESA. Correct. So expanding it so that extra eight, it's effectively just another eight years when we're looking at that 18. So is it 18 plus another 10 year, two five year extensions? 18 plus five. 18 plus just one five. So what I'm hearing is that we really don't have an opportunity to look for another operator until 2039 unless we want to break the lease agreement. Okay. Generally, yes, that's correct. Okay, that's helpful clarity. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I think uh, if uh, ESA folks are listening, uh, none of the council members dispute how valuable they are. They're absolutely integral to building healthy communities and they've been doing that for decades. I think the questions are more around the changing landscape and changing needs and how as a council we grapple with that, that reality. I think why we really want ESA to, uh, to, to know that and under, understand that. Uh, so unwinding is the wrong decision in my, in my mind, right? Uh, lease has been agreed on in the past uh, and they contributed in the design of the new, uh, the addition, they contributed some resources to it and they made a commitment 
to pay their share of $9 million or so right through the rent that they will charge along with maintaining the building and upkeeping it and uh, paying for the uh, any other related cost. I think it's, I don't think it's, a, a, I don't see, I don't think it's appropriate to, to unwind that and I think we need to move forward. I think we need to have conversation with the ESA and other organizations and community leagues as well, EFCL and others, right? To, uh, how how they're responding to the changing needs of uh, of Edmund. So I don't I, I can't support this, Councillor uh, Councillor Rutherford. I think uh, we need to honor that commitment because it was signed in good faith, and it was uh, you know uh, uh, built on a long history with the with the ESA. We need to find a we need uh, what I'm saying that we need to find a different different way of responding to all the questions that council members and community has raised right on uh, on on the changing needs of the city. Okay. All right, so Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. I, I'm, I must admit my confusion in the, in the use of the term unwinding throughout this conversation. So the motion that I'm reading, and, and again, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, says that we would still have essentially a seven year remaining on the existing space. We would have a new seven years on the new space. And as we've heard, there's also already the ability for two five year extensions at the uh, at the will of the ESA. Really, all this does is this adds in the potential desire to have a, a more explicit community benefit requirement. So I, I can you explain why that is an incorrect assumption? Because I keep hearing the use of the term unwinding. So, um, apologies, I'm, I, I can't recall if we used the, the term unwind. I think what I was simply trying to communicate was there is an existing lease term to alter the terms of the lease would invalidate the source of funding that's on the capital profile. I'm in, I'm in, I think we could work with ESA to add anything around community benefit, but that would be a negotiation of an existing lease. Absolutely, so, so, so this motion doesn't give you that ability, like that's what I, 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 my, my read of this motion is it gives you that ability to go and, you know, negotiate that piece because it does sound like it's important. So I, I'm again, you know, I, I get the point that after 2039, if we didn't have some type of additional operator or if ESA did not sign a new lease, we would need to find money in our own budget to address whatever the remaining capital cost is. But, but that's a 17 year problem from now and we that would also give us 17 years seemingly to engage ESA and any other organization um, around what what the future would be so I don't so believe I, it's a I'm, 17 year problem I believe you have to correct your funding source if you choose to alter the terms of the agreement yeah and, and it would take effect uh, as early as seven years from now if there was no engagement with any with ESA or any other organization but but there would still be for the next seven years essentially the capital cost being paid for yes but I think you have a profile out there now that is short sure. funding you you must have a solution you must have a capital profile that's valid counselor absolutely so maybe the question is, is it is instead of um, so can this motion be referred, this motion on the floor be referred so that we can go take a couple of weeks and go engage ESA just to maybe firm up the community benefit piece? Like that to me, it maybe helps address that and then we can talk about the lease piece separately, but, but it sounds like that would be maybe an opportunity. So to clarify, with the way I'm reading this, the terms and conditions as shown in the report would be approved? but the request would be that administration goes back to uh, the ESA to negotiate more of the community benefits within, within the lease before any agreement is executed. Is that correct? 
I, I believe yeah. that. Lease be approved for seven years. That's the, what the motion is. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that part needs to be taken out then if we, if we just want to, want to talk about community benefits, but extend the lease, then have conversation about community benefits. So what this doesn't give me clarity on is Funding am, source. Am, am I, are we doing the 18 year extension? This this would suggest that we're not, yeah. which I would argue then invalidates sure. your funding source on your capital profile. Yeah. Would you, Councillor Rutherford, would you be uh, agreeable that we approve the lease as presented by administration, but then uh, have further conversation about community benefits? Okay, you wanna keep it to seven years? Okay. Uh, Andrew, is or any other committee member is welcome to do a refer back motion, which would trump this motion. Okay, all right. Uh, so, Councillor Nack, oh, carry on. Sorry, I uh, took some of your time. No, I think I had my question. I was just trying to see if you know if we gave a couple of weeks to go and do that engagement, and then have this come back. Does that add value to see if we can sort it out quicker? Because I hear the uncertainty from admin right now, but. I also understand the ra rationale why we want community benefit piece. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Nack. All right, Councillor Stevenson. Sorry, Councillor Rice is next because you they haven't she hadn't had a third round. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I I think I still want uh, uh, to to be clear here. Um, existing agreements is already existing. We don't need to talk about that piece. Right now, today, the focus point is about should we add this new addition and south extension into the existing agreement and then to approve for 18 years uh, this agreement for them to be able to pay and the contribution for the capital uh, cost for the co for construction. So if that is the case, there are two things here. Uh, so I, I, I saw the lot here, and my understanding is, uh, is correct. Um, so I would like to say, um, even for us today, um, I would like to refer the approval uh, for the next meeting. And at least we, we have the opportunity to look at, should we add this as their responsibility to pay this $9.5 million as a rent, or we should give this opportunity to the other organizations who also willing to do this. And this is the key point here. So it's not about the, uh, the years. The years is already there. So if we, if council willing to give this addition piece to ESA, that means we have to do that 18 years and for them to be able to pay back. So, right? So my, my question is, is that feasible I ask this again for us to go back, take some time, and before we approve this lease agreement today, and to say um, that engagement and how options could come out. And if, like, but based on those few weeks or few months working, and then because we have delay, we have delay for the project. So, this is not in urgent, will be open September 2022. And so if you use that delay time to do this engagement and provide opportunity to everybody who are willing to do this, and then we will have better information to inform our decision should approve this lease agreement amending or not. So I, I think for sure the engagement's an important step, and I, I'm not sure I if that would, that would happen to have outside of this. So just to confirm, they have a lease in place for 17 years with their existing facility. This addition was built at the request of ESA, and they've they funded and paid for the design of this addition as well. So we did this because, and it was approved in the capital budget. We did this because ESA had asked for this to approve uh, to create more space for their user groups. Uh, so we can bring you something back that outlines yeah. um, the consequences of not doing this, so that you're clear on what those are. Um, I think like what what I just am, I just need to be clear on what is being referred back to us. Like what are you looking for as, what information would you like us to bring you back? 
I am looking for, and because of the decision right now we have to make, I need to add this new addition and South Sea extension into the existing agreement, and also extend from uh, the seven years left to 18 years. And so that's, but for us to make a decision, I, I think I'm struggling. I, I heard struggling from my colleagues as well. Yeah, so and so then that's, to me, to resolve this issue, that means can we have the opportunity to discuss, uh, should we add right away or we should have the different opportunity and a different option to add this or not add this new addition piece there. And because of the challenge pieces, this new addition people look at, they said we can do the same thing. We can contribute that capital funding source for that $9.5 million. So if some organization willing to do this, why is not opportunity and open to everybody? I think that is also the, the concern we heard and from public speaker today. I think that is referral's intention. So hopefully I explain this better, uh, clear to you. So the issue that we have maybe with referral is we have an existing lease agreement with an existing tenant and a budget based on an approval for self-supporting tax, self-supported tax supporting debt. I don't believe that it is appropriate, and I would maybe look to a, a lawyer to confirm this, for us to, while we're in a signed existing lease agreement, to engage with other parties to work against that lease agreement. So we will be in violation of the lease agreement, right? That's my, like if, if we reach out to someone else, say, can you step in and sort of ESA, then we are not honoring the agreement with ESA, right? I, I would say that it's inappropriate. I'm not yeah. a lawyer, so I can't comment on the legality yeah, be good, of that. Good, uh, can somebody from legal please advise? Mr. Mayor, I can maybe comment on that. Um, and, and one item that I'm a little concerned about is that ESA has already expended, it sounds like, significant sums of money. Um, and it l sounds like it was based upon some promises probably made by the city that they were going to continue to operate this, or they were going to operate this new addition. Um, and that could have legal consequences if we were not to now lease them that addition. Good. Thank you so much for that. Uh, okay. Well, you know, we are at 11 o'clock and we have quite a bit of agenda to complete. and. Uh, I hope we can wrap this up soon. Uh, Councillor uh, Stevenson, you're next. Yeah, I think I think Councillor Rice, I really appreciated your line of questioning. And I think maybe where, where I'm confused is that I appreciate there's an existing agreement in place. When an agreement is being amended, that creates an opportunity for, for negotiation and discussion. And so, I guess I'm just unclear. So the expansion area, which is like a parking area, that's that's new to the lease, but is the new actual physical facility being added to the lease? Yes, it is. So why do we not have flexibility around that, given that it's not currently part of the lease? I think this is an integrated facility too, but I defer to Mr. Jiraki. I see nods from Mr. Lachlan. Yes, it's built right onto the existing facility. Mm -hmm. but, but, but I think that's just where our confusion is, right? That it's not currently subject to a lease, and so why aren't there more opportunities to explore different operators? I think part of the original decision when the council approved the, the budget for this project with the contribution that the ESA would make is that the original intent was that these payments would have been made through the existing lease agreement that was in place. Um, ESA ran into issues like all other businesses with COVID. They had greatly reduced revenues. And so with that, they, they are looking for and have requested and spoken to administration around an extension for the, the lease term as well as administration sees the value in having them be the operator based off previous commitments that were made for the new facility itself. Okay, well I think I, I think where, where I struggle, so I think there's two, where I struggle is that 
with the existing lease terms, it still seems like we're pretty locked in until 2039. With the extended, with 18 plus five, we're locked in until 2045. So does administration see any opportunities to open up the management of the facility, expansion, the expansion portion of the facility to other groups before 2039 or 2045? I may defer this one to Linda if you wanted to. I think it's important to understand that this is an entirely integrated facility. This expansion came about at the request and interest of the Edmonton Soccer Association. They would have taken this project on themselves. The city decided to take over the construction of the project and ESA was involved from the start through the construction, through tender, through design, and it is an absolutely integrated facility. So the systems from the existing facility to the new facility are integrated. It's not, it, there isn't a separation that you could parse off the expansion and have somebody separate operate that. Yeah. So business, then, the business um, plan and financials that ESA has put together for payback of this uh, financial contribution includes the revenue to be generated from the two new fields. ESA has also have agreements with external organizations for the use and hours at the two new fields in exchange for their contribution of funding towards the expansion project. Yeah. Well, and so I think I think then the other opportunity that is provided to us through the request to amend the lease is that we do work on that community benefit provision. Does that seem like an opportunity? Absolutely, an opportunity we can consider, and certainly something that um, I don't I don't see the soccer association having any issue with. Great, and so is that best accomplished through uh, an amendment to this motion or or a referral back? I think I'm just struggling with process at this point. I I think that if we were only dealing with the amend if we were only dealing with the second part on adding a community benefit, we could, council could approve it and we could go and negotiate that as part. We've been given the authority to negotiate that. I don't think we can do it as written with the seven years. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we do have a motion on the floor and Councillor Rutherford, do you have questions or you wanna close? No, this has brought up so many more questions. Go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm extremely frustrated, quite frankly, by this um, whole conversation. because and, and so I just want to clarify what I'm hearing, because what I'm hearing is essentially what was before us is what we have to approve. So why was this even, why did this even come back to us as a decision point? What is the decision point that we have then? Where is council's authority today? The decision point that we're looking for is to amend the premises of the lease to include the new facility, which is not part of the existing lease. Okay. And then also to extend the term uh, to allow for ESA to make payments based on the conversations we've had with them. But it's not really what we're hearing today from administration is that's not really actually a decision point we have, because if we don't decide to do those things, there's too much harm and risk. So I would and say, Councillor, so you're- So that's where I'm confused right now. You are here by direction of council. So ESA came forward as part of the budget, something was approved. That approval of the profile with this as a funding source then necessitated the step for us to go and work on those agreements. It's not that we're it's not that we're bringing this out of the blue. It is connected to a series of decisions that we are working our that we work our way through when we do these approval processes. But there's a series of decisions. But what I'm hearing today, and this is where I'm getting really frustrated and confused, is there's a series of decision points. But what I'm also hearing is there's really truly no decision point today except for housekeeping, which is means approve what is before you, because if we do anything that changes the course on this, on this decision point, it's problematic. This is what I'm hearing today. You, you try. 
Okay, so I, I think I would take you back to the most critical decision that a council has made, which is you agreed to build this facility with a funding source that was called self-supporting tax-supported debt, and that gave us, that then instructed us to work with that party on agreements that bring your vision as council to light. We can't do all of these things at the exact same time. We mm -hmm. have to get the approvals in stages. There's also, no. I, I mean, there's also a partnership opportunities. Yeah, and I think this is again, bringing up a whole bunch of similar questions that I line of questioning I had around the facility yesterday with the ski club. Um, like, I feel like there's, it's kind of case by case, like we have policies, but it seems like sometimes the city owns it, sometimes the, the partner that initiated owns it. There, to me, I'm, I'm finding that this is what's getting frustrating is as we go through this, it's to me getting more and more convoluted. But at the end of the day, I, I'm still really struggling to understand why a either a decision is even before us right now and it's not just a receipt for information then that administration is doing this lease or b if there is a decision point why when we put this to say just do the seven years that's problematic i'm really i'm really like genuinely struggling right now okay mr Tyson is going to explain why we're here in particular for a council approval on term so essentially council had already approved the project itself, but we have to come because we don't have the delegated authority to approve a nonprofit lease for this length of term. So executive committee has to provide that approval for us. Okay, but what if the executive committee doesn't want to approve that term of lease? Like, is it, cause if it's a decision point, don't we have the ability to not approve that term of lease? So I, I, I would say this, I suppose that you do in doing so, you have now invalidated the capital funding source and you must find the source of funding that you previously approved. Like, I, I think that's the simplest way that I can state it. Just, like, we do different agreements with different parties under mm -hmm. our work with partnerships and under the policy. So we do many different things as a corporation. I would just convey that this is and has been a very financially effective arrangement. Very few organizations contribute to the capital of the facilities in which they participate. Good, thank you so much. Okay, um, Sorry, I boss. know I'm out of time, but Mr. Mayor, if you'll indulge me for one minute, I will withdraw my motion. Okay, okay, so motion is withdrawn. Uh, does it need council, sorry, committee consent to withdraw? We do either need unanimous consent or a vote. Okay, uh, do we have a consent to withdraw the motion? Councillor Nack? Sure. To withdraw the motion, you, you, you have your consent? Yes. Uh, Councillor Rice? Yes, okay, good. So motion is withdrawn. All right, and I will move the, uh, uh, the recommendation in the report. Okay, any questions on the recommendation in the report? Any further questions? Are we ready to vote? Oh. Anyone to speak? Well, I'm still clean. Sorry, Councillor. I'm still clean there. So, Councillor, are you Councillor Nack, you up there? Councillor Nack? Sorry, one more question then. Go ahead. So, can we do a subsequent motion? that would tie in the community benefit conversation at least? That might be a cleaner way of doing it, right? Uh, then it's a subsequent. I just wanna make sure based on the conversation that that is still a reasonable course of action to, to go and work with them on that, right? I'm getting nods from uh, administration, yeah. Okay then I think that would be something we should be doing in this. Okay, okay. that's it, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Councillor Rice? 
that's his my question, but I'm I'm ready to speak. If I Thank you, Councillor Rice. So, Councillor Naki, will you prepare a subsequent, please? Then, okay. All right. So, uh, now to speak, Councillor Rice, go ahead. <clears throat> I I really appreciate today's conversation, and that actually uh, brought lots of questions, and to reflect uh, this different model our city has been a uh, work with our partners. Uh, I also believe uh, working with partner and to support our Ed Edmontonians are extremely important for every part and in this. Um, how we operate like sports uh, centers, like soccer centers, specifically our winter city. Uh, I do appreciate our partners and put the effort and also provide the lots of contribution to our community. And even though we heard lots of concerns and then different perspectives on how our community benefits, how our youth and to achieve that equity and accessibility and also affordability uh, piece. Um, and from another point, and then city administration brought a very good point as a city, uh, even as a council, uh, how we honored uh, the agreement we already have with our partners. And specifically by clarification provided by say, city administration says this project, this new addition, this South Extension project actually initiated, requested by ESA. And they are willing to take some responsibility to extend the services, uh, willing to provide to our Edmontonians. And from, from that honor perspective, and as a city, not only to this partner, and as a city, we need to demonstrate the same value to the different partners we already built that partnership. Uh, I think for that piece, and then even though, and we are struggling, and today I, I struggling too, and my colleagues I heard struggling too, what's the decision point we have to make today? And if there is a decision point we have to make today to honor that contract, to honor that agreement, I think I don't have choice to say no for that. And however, I do want to bring all these concerns and all what we heard from different organizations and from different um, community and specific community leagues and other organizations who provide and the services and who are even willing to go extra mayors and to provide excellent access services to our community and to our kids, to our youth. And then they deserve the opportunity as well. They deserve the opportunity looking for that partnership, working with the city. They are willing to work with our city. And how our city moving forward to open that door to everybody and then to have that opportunity for everybody to provide these services to address their concerns. Uh, I think that is very important to reflect our city's value and then and also to reflect everybody and in our city willing to help each other. Um, so I'm looking forward for the subsequent the motion and come from my colleagues and how we can address that issue. Uh, at the same time, I think the decision point we have to make today and in front of us, um, we have to. And even though it's a challenge, and it's not easy, and sometimes this is council face very tough decisions. Uh, but I do want to say uh, thank, thank you to administration work to keep reminding us what impact could happen and for our city for this type of partnership. I also am looking forward for the future opportunity for our city to look at a different type, different model, and for us to work with community as a partner. And maybe, and since uh, the change in past five years, there's lots of changes there. And how that change to remind us, all of us, to looking for 
different opportunity and work on the different model or different type of agreement and to include everybody, every organization who willing to provide excellent services to our Edmontonians. And thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this was definitely definitely an interesting conversation this morning. Uh, did want to start by echoing the mayor's comments uh, that what I hope hasn't been lost in this is just how valued a partner the Edmonton Soccer Association is. I know when I first started playing indoor soccer, it was in a freezing cold warehouse uh, up north in an industrial area, and and we've come so far since then. So so really value the work that's happening, and I think it is a good model for our community. You know where my I think that uh, providing a range of organizations the opportunity to manage facilities is a really critical part of building those organizations' capacity. So in the affordable housing sector, so many grassroots organizations really struggle to become self-sufficient um, and able to do the great work um, that they were capable of uh, due to lack of access to opportunities like this. So this is why I do think it is incredibly important that we um, you know, I think it's great, you know, a subsequent motion coming forward in terms of providing access to this facility for other groups. I think, uh, you know, I really look forward to supporting that subsequent, but I do want to reiterate, I think it's incredibly important that administration look for opportunities to empower a range of organizations to be involved in this way, uh, to build their capacity and build that grassroots, um, uh, those grassroots organizations up. Uh, so thanks again for the conversation. Certainly learned a lot today. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rutherford. Yes, I will just echo again that this conversation was not about the value of any particular organization, just like many of our conversations that we're going to have in the context of budget are not about the value of the organizations. This is a fiscal responsibility that we have as an, as an organization. And I am concerned about the length of some of our lease agreements in terms of a very changing and dynamic city that we live in. And um, yeah, I, I think that that's something that's very concerning for me. I feel that this conversation is also concerning in terms of actual decision-making authority that a new council has. I think there's a, there's a balance between honoring previous council decisions, but if the previous council de decisions preclude really any choice in how and how we what we can do today, then to me the decision point is a fallacy. And and that's extremely frustrating. Um, I will not be supporting the motion on the floor. Not because again, I it will likely pass and that's fine. I think it needs to be stated that that there was some concern that came out of this conversation. And there was some concern for me with the length of the term and some concern in terms of the sole provider. We have so many safeguards around sole providership for so many other procurement spaces, but yet in this one, we're not holding that same account. So I will be voting no to this motion, not again, because I don't think that it's great work that the Edmonton Soccer Association is doing, but because I look at this from some of our processes as a city and our contract agreements and our procurement agreements, and I don't think that this rolled out in a way that I can support. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Rutherford. So <clears throat> a few words to close. Uh, uh, and I echo my colleagues' comments about ESA. It's a very reputable, valuable organization in the city that has done so much good work and continues to do some good work. Uh, and I understand that under the lease agreement, ESA will provide city with monthly energy use data needed for uh, uh, City of Edmonton's Building Energy Benchmark Program. So that is part of the alignment with the, with with city city priorities. Uh, it will also maintain the uh, the leadership in an energy and environment design certificate. Uh, I understand, and uh, I also understand that under the GBA plus analysis, uh, City's Accessibility Advisory Committee reviewed the design of this expansion. Uh, that ties into community benefits or community accessibility, sorry. And uh, that uh, accessibility 
Our advisory committee found that the new space provides for persons with disabilities to participate in sports and includes access to gender neutral washrooms and ramps for field access for persons using mobility aids and uh, an elevator for to the spectator area uh, so that people can, uh, with accessibility needs, can go. And there are sight lines that are to the, to the viewing field that are, that are included in that. I also understand that uh, a special consideration was given to accommodate uh, the Volt Hockey Program, uh, which, uh, uh, which is an adaptation of hockey that allows participants with complex needs, particularly those with, with limited mobility, to play using a battery-operated joystick-controlled chair. Right? I think this e ESA is responding to some of the community needs. Uh, yes, they can do more, absolutely, and uh, we need to continue to push organizations to uh, be more inclusive and, uh, and responsive, responsive to the changing needs of uh, our communities. And we're doing other stuff, too. Right? The ESA is the only organization that we partner with. We partner with other organizations. We PUSHA is a good example. If people are not familiar with PUSHA, I would encourage people to go visit the southeast part of the city just off Henday and 50th Street, and they run a number of fields, outside fields, for for soccer and cricket and uh, and other activities. We just, uh, in the budget process, uh, in the uh, last year, approved a partnership with the private sector to build some amenities in Northeast. So our city is evolving. Our administration is looking for other opportunities as well, right? So I think, uh, and anyway, that's good. And all the questions have been so valuable today, I think really, uh, give sense to administration as well, where uh, how committed this council is on inclusion and, uh, and diversity and meeting the changing needs of, uh, of the city. And, uh, and I, I hope that we honor this decision, uh, sorry, this uh, agreement with ESA and uh, continue, can allow them to continue to provide the good services that they've been providing to the soccer community in Edmonton. And I will be supporting this recommendation and I will call the vote. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. OK. Uh, Councilor Knack. Certainly, Mr. Mayor. The subsequent is that administration provide a report to committee outlining engagement with the Edmonton Soccer Association and to identify options to provide additional community benefits and increase community access. Thank you. It's on the uh, on the deck now. Uh, okay. So, any questions on the subsequent? Seeing none. And uh, sorry, Councillor uh, Stevenson. Uh, maybe just to the mover. Would your intent be uh, that the engagement would also be with other uh, soccer agencies in terms of understanding their yeah, needs? Great flag. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it needs to be include some other folks beyond that. I think obviously the leaseholders the primary, but there would have to be some some other engagement in that. It might be worth making it explicit. Sure, I could I could put forward if it's friendly, just uh, with Edmonton Soccer Association and other other soccer associations or soccer groups um, so, yeah. in Edmonton entities, right? So, entities, yeah. sure. Okay, that's friendly, right? So, yeah. But otherwise, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for bringing that forward. I, um, I think that's a, a great opportunity that is provided by the lease uh, amendment to, to add that in as, as explicit requirements yeah. and conditions. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Anyone else questions or to speak? Seeing none, please vote. have all the votes uh, display the votes please that is carried okay our next item is the Turkish Canadian Society outstanding tax balance option this was exempted by Councillor Nack 
maybe to expedite the process for us to get through the agenda. Councillor Neck, I understand you have a motion, right? Yeah, I was, I was going to make the motion as listed in page three of the report. Can you please move that motion? Yeah, I'll move that administration cancel previously uh, levied municipal property taxes from the 2020 and 2021 taxation years on account 9998985 in the amount of $20,822.62, as well as associated penalties in this amount be recorded against tax losses. Okay, you want to make the introduction? I, sure, I don't have much to say. I think the report uh, explains why I'm, I'm going to make this and uh, why most likely I will be withdrawing the other item coming up uh, in motions pending. Um, to me, this, this was an error of fact as noted here. And so um, this, this uh, closely follows what happened with the Kingsway Legion. Uh, where there was an error. And so I think in this particular case, it is uh, important to, to make this change. Whereas, again, I don't want to speak to the next item, but I'll, I'll or the item at 10.1, but um, that one doesn't necessarily have the same uh, clear error of fact issues that this one does. So that's why I'm uh, making the motion as listed in the report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Okay, questions now to administration or on the motion. Questions? Anyone? Questions? Councillor Rice? Uh, questions to administration. Uh, just want to confirm the policy. Uh, we do have a policy for certain things. And since I, I become concerned, I realize for this uh, tax balance relief happened many times already come to council to make decision. So is there any specific policy we can just uh, Need administration to follow the policy to do it, and instead of every time we need to come uh, to the council to approval, and because every time we always approval, and then due to the hardship and due to the challenge organization face and to release that property tax, and I just want to get that policy clarification. Is there any change? Because the policy I look at uh, is back to one uh, nineteen ninety nine. So that is a very old policy already. So in the report, I mentioned that. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor. Um, you did actually review the policy earlier this year, and we did make some adjustments to it. So although the policy has been in effect since 1999, it is frequently reviewed and updated. Generally, when we see that Council has a, um, a tendency to forgive certain types of, uh, of, of circumstances seeking tax relief, we will uh, put forward to you that we amend the policy so that we removed the need for you to sort of go through um, this process too often. I will say that the vast majority of errors of fact are, cre are able to be corrected under the existing policy without it coming to council under the delegated authority. We do have the capacity to make corrections in this regard up to $5,000, which is the vast bulk of uh, corrections that need to be made. In this specific instance, the amount um, owing, uh, looking for forgiveness, and the amount of time that elapsed between when the error occurred and the error was found uh, is just outside of our current council, um, sorry, our current policy, which is why it's before you today. So it's beyond 5,000, 5, so the total is 20,800, something like that. Uh, it's a little more than that because it does include the forgiveness of the penalties on the tax balance that was uh, owing, so it's about 20, yeah. 23000 So in the report, it says significant outstanding balance. So I don't know I'm allowed to ask that question, what's a specific amount or not. You are absolutely uh, allowed to ask that. The specific amount outstanding is $23,290.75. So that means anything is beyond and 5000 needs to come to the council every time. We will forgive up to the, the first 5,000 and then anything beyond that, yes, comes to council. Uh, so, okay, thank you. Uh, so I, I was wondering and if we, uh, we need to put in motion or something like that. And I do think uh, to the, from efficiency perspective, because we always, we always provide the relief. If there's something we could happen and through the policy and reduce the times come to the council, that would be great. So I don't know, I, I, I saw my colleagues a lot in for that, but that we, we can have further discussion. But my next question uh, is about the, uh, the fairness. 
and because there are many, so we have in total, and we have so many nonprofit, so many nonprofit organizations and cross city, and so if I could get that total number, uh, that would be helpful. That there are so many other organizations and face the same thing, and then they face similar challenge, and if we approve those, that means do we need to approve all of them? So in the in this case, what um, what we're suggesting is the within the motion that I believe Councilman Mac, Mac is making is that it's actually the error that we are correcting, yeah. as opposed to uh, blanket forgiveness for the not for profit. Um, under the sort of rules and regulations of uh, Alberta's assessment and taxation system, a large number of not for profits, so long as they are not restrictive, are automatically tax exempt. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you for that clarification. Due to the time, I'm not going to yeah. further questions. I will touch base with you offline okay. and for other things. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Yeah, I think that's a very important distinction from a fairness point of view. That this was a mis mistake on our uh, uh, on our part, right? So that's why they they ended up being charged this money. Okay, good. All right. So any more questions on this, uh, Councillor Nack? You want to close or pretty self? No, I oh, think the answers to the question. Just hold on, just hold on, 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 hold on. Do not close yet because Councillor Stevenson has few words to say. Just very briefly, I want to thank administration. I, I've been really impressed by all of these reports coming forward. I think you really seek to, um, you know, address address errors, but in a way that's equitable and doesn't doesn't prioritize one group over another. I know that's a very tricky balancing act, but just wanted to, to commend the work that's done there and, and certainly support if there are recommendations that you have to simplify or, or streamline uh, the work so that uh, we don't have to take up your time here at, at committee or council. Very happy to entertain those in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Okay, anyone else to speak before I go to Councillor Nack? I see none. Councillor Nack, sorry, yeah, Councillor Nack, go ahead, close, please. No, nothing further. Thank you. Thank Mr. you, Councillor Nack. All right, I'll call the vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. All right, so that concludes item 6.2. Item 6.3, uh, bylaw 20158, a bylaw to designate the Carlton Sheldon residence as a municipal historical resource, exempted by Councillor Rice. Is there a presentation from our administration on this? You don't need a presentation? Yeah, yeah, okay. No no need for presentation. Councillor, Councillor Rice, go ahead, please. Yeah, I just have a very quick question, and for the uh, for the payment and for maintenance, and so is a one-time payment or is ongoing payment for the maintenance? Uh, uh, Councillor Rice, in the case of a designation uh, scope of work for rehabilitation, as the owner completes portions of the work, they submit their invoices and proof of payment to their contractors to us, and we will review those. We will then go do a site inspection to make sure that portion of the work has been completed properly. And if it has been, we will issue the, that portion of the grant payment at that time. Uh, so for moving forward, once this designation was done, and then that means ongoing maintenance will be happen as well. So I just wondering, uh, for that ongoing maintenance, is our city's responsibility, it's the owner's responsibility? That is entirely the owner's responsibility. Okay, thank you for that clarification. And also, I would like to say, and because for the entire project cost, um, so owners paid almost 50%, right? And for yes. all the renovation, everything. And so city paid uh, uh, fifty percent as well. So, what's in return the benefits for our Edmontonians? Can you describe a little bit more about that? Because I didn't see that information in the report. I think, in terms of benefits to Edmontonians, obviously we uh, get the formal legal protection and preservation of a historic building in the Highlands community uh, that is going to be there for future generations of our. Uh, of our city to to enjoy uh, and be part of our built landscape. 
the owners of this building have chosen to make a significant financial uh, investment in this property. They are hiring local contractors and local tradespeople to do the repair work uh, on the building. So it is contributing to the local economy. Um, and, you know, it is just a sustainable approach to instead of demolishing an existing building and rebuilding it, it is uh, repairing it, uh, upgrading the windows, uh, making these types of adjustments to make the building uh, more sustainable in the future. Uh, do we specific measurement in place to tracking all those benefits and uh, through the years? Um, not, not specifically. Um, in, since around 2000, uh, we have provided over $20 million in rehabilitation grants, which uh, to a variety of buildings that have been designated, which translates into well over $40 million of, of private investment uh, into those buildings. Um, other than that, we don't have a particular way to track how Edmontonians appreciate historic buildings and things like that. Uh, I do understand. I do understand. Preserve some heritage is so important for our city and also for uh, Edmontonians. Uh, however, from our investment perspective, when you also that you mentioned some economic development opportunities for us, and then I think it would be great and for our Edmontonians to see that investment, how their tax dollars used, and to get the benefits from that. Is that uh, so? Um, Mr. Mayor, and then I'm happy to move by law, but also I, I, I would like to, yeah. if possible, I would like to uh, like to provide a subsequent motion and to request some measurement in place. And Please. for I don't know if that we have time to do that today or not, or I can do later. Sorry, Councillor Rice. I was distracted for a moment. Can you just repeat your question? Uh, I said I'm happy to move this by law today, and also I would like to provide the the motion, subsequent motion, and to address the lack of uh, the measurement in place to track in the investment benefits for our Edmontonians. Just to confirm, the bylaws are not for voting oh. on today. They'll be at council. So oh, okay, so refer to the council. Well, we can. We, you, you can think about that, Councillor Rice, and maybe yeah. make the subsequent motion at council. Okay, That'll sure. give you time to work with the administration. Yeah. Okay, good. So good. that means we only refer the bylaw, or is it right writing? Is it right for three times reading? Uh, yes. So from the report, yeah. the recommendation is that executive committee recommend to city council that yeah. bylaw 20158 be given the appropriate readings. Yeah, yeah I'm happy so that's, to move that's that. what you're moving? Okay. All right, so I do have some questions on this. You know, we apply inclusivity lens to the decisions that we make in this case, the, the name chosen for designation is just a male name and does not acknowledge the, uh, uh, the, uh, the female residents of this place, uh, Bessie Sheldon, and about Bessie a bit, uh, uh, that uh, she moved into this home with her husband Carlton in 1915 and she made her own contributions to the community through memberships in the uh, Women's Canadian Club and the Women's Aid Society uh, of the First Baptist Church and the Dorothy Franklin Group. And the Women's Canadian Club was founded in 1912 by Emily Murphy following a proposal made by the Edmonton Local Council Women meeting uh, at the women's meeting. So, you know, she has a rich history in the city as well, but we only acknowledge the male occupant of this house. So we want to get a sense how we change that. Like, how do we, what policy drives these decisions? Well, Mr. Mayor, this, this building was added, originally added to the city's inventory of historic resources in 1993, uh, when there was a initial citywide inventory that added about 450 buildings. Um, it's been known uh, at that time, there was certainly uh, more of that lens uh, to naming buildings. Uh, primarily, that's how the names generally appear in the Henderson's directories um, from 1914. You know, that's just sort of how things were done at the time. And, in 1993, that's how this building was, was identified and added to the inventory. 
of uh, historic resources and it has become known that way in the community and walking tour booklets and um, community plaque initiatives. It is known as the Carlton Sheldon uh, residence. Um, in that particular sense, we have chosen to maintain that name uh, for this designation bylaw. Um, now, when we do add buildings to the inventory, we generally just use the last name only of, of uh, the original owner or a significant person to uh, to be more inclusive uh, in that regard. And so new newer buildings that have been added to the inventory in the last few years, as they come forward for designation, you will see that we are just typically using last names only and, and moving away from that. So that's kind of how this one has evolved. And as I said, it is it is fairly widely known in the neighborhood as the Carlton Sheldon residence through walking tour booklets and other publications. No, I, I understand that. Uh, and I appreciate that uh, context, right? But no, how do we, I understand moving forward, we have more inclusive, inclusive approach, but how do we, how do we revisit some of these things in the, and this is in the context of a broader conversation as well about name changes and statue changes and uh, and you know acknowledging the contributions of diverse Edmontonians women people from indigenous communities you know cultural communities I think is there is there would you give any can you guide us in what needs to be done to have that kind of a discussion, but in a collaborative way, not in a confrontational way, but in more of a collaborative approach we can take to correct some of the uh, the past, uh, 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 you know, challenges or uh, the exclusiveness of, of the past. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we, we are able to, um, you know, make those considerations at the time of designation. And in this particular case, as I noted, this building is sort of widely known as this Carlton Sheldon residence name. There are certainly other buildings that were added to the inventory years ago that have a male oriented name that aren't particularly well known and there's no publications referencing them. And we have maybe a bit more flexibility in that sense to make a change at time of designation. This one was really kind of oriented around you know, they, the Highlands Community Placking Program, for example, they have a plaque on the house that says Carlton Sheldon, you know, 1914. So, we, you know, it's kind of just been known that way, but certainly new ones that come forward, we can, we are trying uh, already and are, are applying those new lenses uh, as we bring designations forward to, uh, to ensure a bit more inclusive approach to the naming of the actual building itself. So you don't recommend changing the name of this particular residence? to include uh, Bessie it, it, Sheldon? It, it, it certainly could be done. I think it would just make a bit of a disconnect to, you know, uh, there will be a plaque installed in front of this building by the Edmonton Historical Board. And if it was known as the Sheldon residence and there's a community plaque on the building that says Carlton Sheldon residence, um, you know, just a bit of disconnect and confusion there. Yeah. I, 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 I'll go to Councillor Stevenson next on this. Yeah, you know, thanks, thanks, Mr. Mayor, for raising that. I think it's a it's a great point. Um, I also appreciate uh, your responses, Mr. Johnston, just in terms of the the known name. But I think I think it's okay that there's a bit of disconnect and confusion as we're transitioning to this this new approach. And and I certainly would be really supportive of either amending the bylaw to to just reflect the Sheldon residence or uh, the the Bessie and Carlton uh, Sheldon residence. Do you have do you have a recommendation of which would uh, be better? I think to be more in alignment with what we are doing with with more recent buildings that have been added would be to just simply go with the last name and you know perhaps just through this process the bylaw uh, title can be can be changed uh, to just designate the Carl or sorry designate the Sheldon residence as a municipal historic resource. Great. Okay, I, I'm happy to move. Um, I'll, I'm looking to clerks if if we can just um, if it's a friendly amendment that we recommend to see council the bylaw two one two zero one five eight be amended to the Sheldon residence and and blah, blah blah or what what would be the best process or can it just be amended between now and and city council? It, may I raise one one point on that? Just um, we do have. 
uh, fully executed legal agreements uh, that have been signed uh, by the owner and the city that are with the city clerk's office right now. Hard copies of those legal agreements have been executed between the owner and the city with the name Carlton Sheldon residence on them. Um, so if there was a change in the bylaw, I'd have to ask somebody from legal services if we would need to re-execute all of those agreements. And I believe we have Mr. Johnson online, so I just maybe would ask for him to comment. Good morning, uh, committee. I, I don't believe there's an issue with the disconnect between the name and the bylaw and the name of the agreements. They'll still be legally binding, and I would suggest those can proceed. The easiest way probably to do an amendment to the bylaw, if you wish to, would be just to, and to add an additional direction in the recommendation to council to, um, well, probably just delete the word Carl Carlton throughout the bylaw. It, it looks like that would be as simple a solution as possible. So the building would just be known as the Sheldon residence. Mr. Johnston, would that work for you? I think we just need to remove the actual word Carlton throughout the bylaw. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that would be that would be fine. As I said, I mean, we've got these uh, executed hard copies, but um, as, if there's no issue there, yeah. then yeah. We, we could carry on with the legally binding nature of those, even if it um, really the address and legal description are what uh, what binds it to them. So. Right. Great. No, I appreciate I appreciate you uh, uh, flagging that and, and great to know that there won't be a, a legal impediment to that. So, yes, if if clerks is able to um, uh, provide that wording. Um, so maybe it would read that uh, the word Carlton be deleted throughout uh, bylaw 20158 and that it be given the appropriate readings. Would that be a fair and friendly? Yeah. Okay. I think so, it's a friendly. Uh, Councillor Rutherford and Nack, Councillor Nack, sorry. No, I'm fine. Good. Thank you, good. Okay, so that will be friendly. So uh, just a quick question uh, to Mr. Johnson, uh, David. Uh, the the plaque at the residence will reflect the the history of both uh, Carlton and uh, and Bassey, right? You're going to include something about Bassey's history and contribution to the to this to the community. Yes, at the time the plaque is prepared with the Edmonton Historical Board, they use our statement of significance uh, as a guide uh, to draft the text for the plaque. And um, uh, we've already been engaging with the Historical Board on new plaques that are coming on stream to make sure that we're uh, are taking that inclusive approach. Okay, great. That's good to know. Good. All right. Thank you so much. All right. So we have a motion on the floor moved by Councillor Rice. Uh, and no more questions on this. Anyone to speak? Councillor Stevenson to speak. Yeah, I just want to thank the mayor again for bringing this forward, uh, and also to administration. It's it's wonderful to know that this is a bit of a one-off at this point, a bit of an anomaly, and that and that you're already uh, you know in your current practices uh, reflecting this more inclusive approach. So I just wanted to give a shout out for that, and uh, look forward to supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Anyone else to speak? Seeing none, Councillor Rice, you want to close? No? Ready to vote? Please vote. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. So that concludes 6.3. And we are next on to 7.2. Valley Line West approval of increase of pipeline agreement amount. Councillor Alexander by Councillor Rice. Is there a presentation? No presentation. No presentation. Councillor Rice, two questions, please. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mayor. So, uh, just want to confirm, um, first of all, the funding. Uh, no requests for additional funds, just the reallocation. That is correct. It says that under budget yeah. and financial implications in the report. And for this uh, reallocation, and after this reallocation is done, and we still uh, under the budget, right? That is correct. The project, Valley Line West project as a whole, is just underway, but uh, 
uh, we are still trending under budget and it is a fixed price uh, contract with uh, uh, Marigold Infrastructure Partners. Uh, so for for some and then because we list a few different um, uh, different contractors there and then we some spend it less and some spend it more and is, is there any specific reason and from project management perspective and why and we spend it less and more for that for these utility relocations it's a bit um at the discretion of the utility companies it's their infrastructure okay um, they uh, identify the costs. Our involvement is limited to securing the necessary funding to accommodate their relocation. So from a project management perspective, it's really on the utility companies related to their necessary uh, relocation or adjustment requirements. But as a total cost, and is we signed the contract and with all of them. So total cost, we, we manage that total cost, right, as a city? We do, but the input to that is uh, specifically on the utilities, is on the basis of what's provided by the utility companies. Okay, uh, that's all my question. And thank you, and happy Th to move if needed. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Just a quick question, follow up on Councillor Rice's question. How do we, how we verify uh, the accuracy of those costs? If uh, it, it's. It's, it's on the basis of similar work that we've uh, completed in the past with other utility companies, and it's not like we get a price and just accept it. It okay. comes with a rigor of review. So there's, the, there's a process to, uh, That's correct. to evaluate. Okay. But in the end, yeah. these are their utilities within their right-of-way yeah. that we are crossing, and we are a bit at their requirements in terms of relocation. Yeah, but we do have a criteria to evaluate against other similar type Comparable, of if we get a price that's unrealistic, yeah. we push back. In this case, there are three utility companies or pipeline companies in this on this site that we, we've we been working with, right? Including that's correct. This, including this one. That's correct. Okay, got it, okay, good. All right. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. This concludes the questions to the motion. Anyone to speak? Seeing none, Councillor Rice to close or to vote? Go to vote. Go to vote. Yeah. Please vote. Do that, you have all the votes? Oh, please display the votes. That is carried. What I would suggest is that we bring forward 10.1 and deal with it. Then we'll take the break, and then uh, we will resume with the the uh, Scona pool recommendations at 1:30. Okay, is it okay, everyone? Yep. Okay. Okay. Then there's a continuity to the discussion uh, on Scona pool. Uh, can, can somebody move that we bring forward 10.1? So moved. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Please vote to bring forward 10.1. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. And I'll go over to Councillor Knack. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, so in order to ask a question to confirm if I'm going to withdraw, I think I actually still need to make the motion initially. So just to follow process, I'll, I will currently move, but we'll have some questions on this. The administration returned to committee with a report outlining options available to council for supporting the Aga Khan Foundation with their current outstanding tax balance, along with related background. All right, it is on the floor. Great, and I do have some questions for, I'm guessing, Ms. Water, Mr. Zavo, if they're, if they're there. Uh, let's see if uh, Anton. Are they online? Uh, they, uh, they probably didn't anticipate this bringing forward. Oh, oh. Can someone else answer those questions? Stacy, can you answer? Well, we'll see. I can make it. I can ask the question, and then maybe we can get information. Um, She'll so, try. Uh, Miss Padbury will try to answer your questions, Councillor Nack. Sure. 
Sure, yeah, we'll give it a try, and if not, that's fine. What I want to check, because I did get something from Mr. Zavo uh, about two days ago that I think um, made it really clear for me, is so the MGA actually has some pretty clear exemptions around when we would accept an application for uh, uh, for making a tax, for, not forgiveness, but tax, or sort of essentially removing this. So I'm just curious, can you can you explain that? Do you have that knowledge, and, and can you explain that to me on, on it? Because I, I think I understand the email. I just want to be sure I do. Your question is around when can we make a tax exemption? Yeah, so I understand. Yeah, so what I'm trying to get confirmation on is what the MGA states in regards to providing exemptions, and and just we'll start with that. Okay, I may need to defer to Mr. Zabo or Ms. Watt. Um, or um, maybe Cam Ashmore, who I don't think is online. But I believe that you get generally broad powers to make decisions on forgiveness at the level of council. Yes, we do. And I, I guess the part that I'm just trying to confirm is in terms of what, what administration is allowed to do under the, the MG, I think is quite limited. And... And this is not this file is not uh, an error of fact conversation like we like we have just had. Um, but this is this is something that is is a more regular occurrence. Where you have sort of nonprofits applying for exemptions, but there are certain requirements under the FGA that, that state what what it means allowed to do versus. I mean, council can consider almost anything for an exemption, but um, I want to make sure I understand what it means sort of rights are or, or abilities are in that. Yeah, you're, you are correct. Um, in general, the act does not afford a, a significant administrative powers for administrations to um, forgive taxes. And re I would say this though too, regardless of the act, I think it would be our policy too. I think the design is important to keep um, administration accountable for I think what you what you're trying to avoid is situations where parties can politically interfere with administration and that is why you don't see us take those powers not granted in the act nor would we even if they were we would likely have a policy that would prevent them um, and require those decisions to be made by a council not by an administration. Mm -hmm. And the only other question uh, that's helpful, I, I think the, the other thing from what I understand, and, and again, just looking to see if I can get confirmation, is that um, even in the administration of internal policy, where there is some, I, I think, a goal to try to help uh, where folks are applying for exemptions, there is a pretty clear um, not even understand, but I think that there is no ability for administration to go back to the previous calendar year and make a change. That is, that is not permitted in any in any situation on the administrative side. Correct. You're asking about the power to forgive taxes retroactively for anything other than an error. Correct. Yeah. So if, it, if there is a qualifying property that would normally get a tax exemption, but they did not submit paperwork until the new year, there's no way to retroactively go back from an administrative perspective and adjust anything in the previous year. That I would just want to check on. So if you can give me the lunch hour to check on that. Sure. Okay. I know we were trying to wrap it up before that. Sorry, sorry, Mayor. So I was hoping we could wrap it up before then, but I just I think I should ask that question for myself to make sure I'm understanding it. So we'll have to probably come back to it. Yeah, it'll be quick, hopefully, uh, at 1.30. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> okay, maybe uh, Anton can join us after that, too, right? So, okay, good. Okay, or someone else from taxation if they have, if they need to. All right, okay, we will take a break now, and we will resume back this, with this item at 1.30. Until then, we are on the recess.
I would like to call this meeting back to order and do a roll call of committee members. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Rice. Good afternoon. Councillor Rutherford. Good afternoon. And let me see if there are other council members joining us. Councillor Wright. Good afternoon. Councillor Prince Hello. And that is for that is it for now. And I'm pretty sure other members will be joining us. Okay, we are on item 10.1. I think Councillor Nack have a few more clarifying questions. Councillor Nack? Yeah, yes, just quickly, uh, and, and I'm wondering if we have Ms. Watts on the line. Uh, yes, we do, and also Mr. Ashmore from Legal Services is also here. Wonderful, thank you. Sorry. So I just wanted to double check. Um, so I've been corresponding uh, uh, with the, about this. So I just want to confirm that uh, the way the MGA is designed is that there's no requirement, if I understand correctly, for municipalities to provide an exemption within the calendar year. Is that correct? That is also my understanding, but I will defer to the lawyer because he will know for sure. Cam? Yeah, Councillor, that's going to depend entirely on what you mean by um, within the MGA, because there's different types of properties that are exempt. So if you're dealing strictly with um, a property that falls under the copter exemption, the copter regulation, yeah. there is both a deadline for somebody to apply for the exemption and a deadline for them to get us the information. And then if they do that by those deadlines, the municipality must provide it for that taxation year. But once the taxation year runs out or the deadlines run out, then things change because there's no way to backdate an exemption to a previous um, year. Okay. Okay. And that's helpful. And so internally we, we have had our own policy that, that, so the way I understand it, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, is that, um, you know, while we don't have to start it until the following calendar year, we have internally as a city, if somebody submitted it in September, we would essentially have it take effect in September, even though it's not necessarily a legal requirement. Is that correct? That is correct, Councillor. We, we try to be as amenable as possible. Um, understanding the law to read what we must do, it does not prevent us from going further, which we do try to do when we can. Okay, and, and so I guess the last question, because I think, you know, we, we had a conversation earlier today about a property where there was an error of fact. This isn't related to that. This, frankly, if, if we can boil it down or, or simplify it, it's primarily in relation to just a timing issue on when information was received. Is that uh, maybe a slight oversimplification, but is that generally the way you look at this particular file? That's the way we have been treating it. Um, additionally, we, we would emphasize that there is some requirement on the purchaser and the seller in this particular set, set of circumstances to kind of resolve their own tax status as part of the negotiation of sale. And it's not clear that that happened in this instance either. Okay, so, so unlike the, the one item we just talked about earlier today and something like, say, the Kingsway Legion, which we discussed earlier this year, we're not, there really wasn't any error done on the city side. Is that fair to say? That is correct. Okay. Um, Mayor Sohi, with the answers to those questions, I, I actually think it would be wise for me to withdraw this motion if, if uh, it is agreeable to everyone else on committee. All right, I will ask that to committee members. Is everyone agreeable to withdraw the motion? Councillor Rice and I'm okay, Councillor Stevenson, Councillor Rutherford got it, and obviously Councillor Nack, you are okay to withdraw it, right? So, yeah. Yes, so I will do that. All Thank right, you. okay, the motion is withdrawn, and that, Madam Clerk, concludes 10.1? Yes. Okay. All right, now we have our only item remaining on the agenda is Skona Pool recommendation. And we have two more people signed up to speak. 
Uh, so, Councillor Stevenson, if you please do that. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'll move that we also hear from uh, Isabella Hernandez and Enrico Lozoe. Okay, please uh, add those two people to the list to be heard. Please vote. I'm yes, and I'm a curve. Thank you, Councillor Rice. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. And I think we got a, a regret message from Councillor Jans being uh, the ward councillor for the area. Councillor Stevenson, you want to just say that? Yeah, I just wanted to convey uh, on behalf of my colleague, Councillor Jans, that he was pulled away for a family medical emergency. Um, he, he deeply apologizes that he's not here today, but he's certainly communicated with uh, us as his colleagues on council and with administration. And he's hoping to be able to, to join again soon. Um, but he wanted to, to have his um, apologies passed along. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, I'll go to administration to make a presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, no presentation, just some opening comments from myself. Uh, administration has provided this information report as awareness to Council of the planned closure of Skona Pool, which has been the path for the facility since 2015. In 2015, the renewal concerns related to Skona Pool were presented to Council and direction was provided to advance the development of the Rolly Miles Rec Centre as a replacement for Skona Pool on the understanding that Skona Pool would reach end of life. Administration has determined we have reached that point. Renewal investment is required to temporarily extend the life of the facility and the suggested path to closure is based on two main factors. The cumulative issues that exist within Skona Pool and previous direction from Council to advance a replacement facility for which design is underway and to close Skona Pool when it experiences failures needing substantial repairs. Substantial repairs are required on the foundation, the building envelope, the walls and roof, interior components and mechanical and electrical systems, all of which are required to ensure reliable and safe operations. These repairs are estimated to be at a minimum $6 million to renew the facility to temporarily extend operations for a period of five to 10 years. From our experience, the required investment may in fact be higher as other unforeseen issues are typically discovered in facilities of this age and condition. A reminder that this facility is 65 years old. Since 2015, the city has invested over $1 million in maintenance activities to keep the facility operational on the understanding that the facility would run to end of life. This level of investment over uh, since 2015 is significantly higher than what the city has invested in facilities of similar operations. Some may suggest that we should continue to take an approach of repair one-off issues in the facilities as they arise, but based on the uncertainty of time required for future closures to, to complete the repairs, the level of investment required, the availability of components and materials to complete the repairs, the limited funding that is available to complete the necessary renewal on the city's large inventory of city assets, the commitment from council for a replacement facility, and the pool options available to, to the community, we feel it's time to close the facility. Administration has suge suggested this pass for closure based on a holistic view of asset management and service options available to the community. But we do appreciate the impact this closure will have on users. To reiterate, it's administration's opinion that we have reached the point where the facility requires significant investment and with plans to advance a replacement facility, we believe the right course of action is to close the facility. Thank you and we'll step back to allow the speakers. Thank you, Mr. Rockman, for, uh, for your remarks. And now we will go to members of the public and I'll call your names and uh, please come down to those uh, front chairs. Uh, Gary Meyer will be number one. <laughs> Gary will be number one. Uh, then Elaine Scholes, you'll be number two. Michelle Chu, number three. Okay, guys. 
just a reminder that in the chambers we do not clap. No, 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 you're okay. Uh, we are we so happy to see you, right? But just the protocols of the meetings are that we don't clap or show any sort of ovation or anything. Uh, just the, these are just the old procedures that we have to follow. Okay. Uh, Hugo Nguyen, you'll be number four. Svetlana Trotitskia. Did I get it right? Oh, sorry. I'll be number five. Kirby Feng, number six. Brian Torrance, joining us remotely. You'll be number seven. Elliot Wright. Elliot, you'll be number eight. Kim Clegg. Joining us in person, Kim. Yes, you're right, okay. You'll be number nine, Katrina, Katrina Semeniak. Joining us remotely. Katrina, are you there? Yes. Okay, you'll be number 10, Felicity Kuziak in person. Oh, wow. Nice to see you. Wow, come on, join us. Num you'll be number 11. And Mary Chan joining us in person. Wow, another young person. Thank you, Mary. You'll be number 12. Amelia Ziani. Amelia, are you joining us in person? You'll be number 13. Jeff Papino, joining us remotely. Jeff, you're there? Yes, thank you. Thank you. You'll be number 14. Jared Buller, in person. Jared, please come down. You'll be number 15. Isabella Hernandez, joining us remotely. Isabella, are you there? Oh, you're in person. Oh, yeah, you are. That's you. Okay. It says remotely, but we're happy to see you in person. And Enrico Lezoy is joining yeah, us. online. Okay, yeah. online. Okay, you will be number 17. Okay. And I will briefly explain to you the process. Some of you are actually familiar. Uh, each of you will have five minutes to make your presentation, and we will hear from all of you. And once that is concluded, then committee members will have questions to you, and other council members may have questions to you as well. Right? So uh, we will start with uh, uh, our first panelist, uh, Gary Moyer. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak. My name is Gary Meyer. And since 2009, my company, River City Recreation, has operated the Skona facility. We've been here before. When I toured the facility in 2010 with then Councillor Ben Henderson, today, as back then, IIS made it sound like the building and its systems were in absolute disrepair, and this is further from the truth. All systems, the foundation, superstructure, and building envelope, interior finishes and fixtures in the electrical and mechanical systems, minus the heat exchanger component within the mechanical assembly, are fully operational. It's not perfect. We know that. But it works. I would like to quickly highlight only a few points. I have made notes, and I have prepared those notes and sent them uh, to the city clerk uh, there's 19 of them in this document that I've, I've provided to, uh, uh, to this committee. So um, please draw your attention to the submitted report for this meeting and the 19 co uh, co comment uh, points in my handout. First would be points 1 and 17. Uh, $1.15 million spent on maintenance and repairs uh, using 2015 until now, that's 84 months resulting in expenditures of $16,700 per month 
over and above the 330,000 yearly funded operational costs. I believe we can recognize proper maintenance is necessary for all City of Edmonton owned and leased infrastructure. This is a good business practice. As the operator, I would ask to see the list of components repaired during that time and the, and the costs associated with that uh, over those 84 months. I've been involved since 2009, so this is quite shocking to me. The amount seems excessive. Points 9 and 10, the mechanical system did not fail. Co a component within the system failed. Regarding the system, the boiler was thoroughly checked and its components passed ex inspection. It was serviced and is currently operating as it is tied into SCONA's infrastructure, so the school's infrastructure that supplies hot water and to the heat for the building. That would have to be, of course, um, maintained if, if closure would be uh, imminent. The heat exchanger component, I believe, is the original has exceeded its life expectancy. That's 65 years it's lasted and requires a replacement. Uh, last uh, week, uh, City of Edmonton Engineering reached out to one of my industry uh, partners who in turn provided four options with varied specifications, different configuration sizes and pricing, all fit into the parameters. One is needed. Each component is in stock, ready, and could be here within a week's time for installation. Point 11, leaking basin. The report is made to sound like the drama storage area regularly floods. My staff in concert with uh, Aquatic Strategies, as well as the school board and City of Edmonton Trades conducted an extensive investigation to try and, uh, and find the source. Uh, there's no evidence water is coming from the pool basin. The school building's age foundation as well, 65 years, and the envelope are a more likely cause. That's on the school board side. On the school side, there is an elevator shaft going to the basement drama storage. This may be the reason Edmonton Public Schools should in investigate further. Point 19 in the last one, the opening statement appears to be subjective and not based on facts. This report speaks of the lack of inclusion, accessibility, gender-based anal analysis plus, GBA plus. Accommodation already takes place. On the weekend, Councillor Rice received a passionate email I was CC'd on from a concerned parent about how Sconapool serves her autistic son in aquatics training and how difficult it's been at other facilities in terms of accessibility. We have uh, wheelchair-bound people or persons with strollers. They buzz into the back uh, to gain access. As well, we have a safe space for gender non-binary individuals to change. We created a private space available for anyone who wants to s a separate place to change as well as um, using the washroom facilities which uh, uh, are in the guard room. Uh, we co accommodate access wi without going through the change rooms. Yet another example is a Muslim lady swims, female only, uh, staff black out the windows and have female only lifeguards on staff. I am sorry, Mr. Meyer. I have to stop you here. Five yeah. minutes are over. Uh, next, we will go to Elaine Souls. Good, Good afternoon, um, members of Executive Committee. My name is Elaine Solez, and I'm speaking today on behalf of Friends of Scona Rec. I'll be highlighting some of the points I made in the email I sent yesterday. Uh, for more than a decade, community leagues, community residents in near, nearby neighborhoods and beyond, as well as other pool users, including students attending high, Strathcona High School and their parents, have been engaged in advocacy on two fronts. First, to keep Scona Pool open, and second, to build a new rec center at Rolly Miles Park to replace the aging pool. Our goal, which was supported by previous council decisions, is to keep the pool open until the new rec center is built. We know that the pool is not getting any younger. We now find ourselves responding to yet another report on closing the pool at a time when the design work on the new rec center which council funded more than a year ago is just getting started. 
In our view, the report exaggerates the problems with the facility and the repair costs and understates the disruption to communities and pool users that closing it would cause. We would like to see uh, the heat exchanger replaced at the modest cost of about 40,000 is our understanding as soon as possible to avoid disruption to pool operations. The current workarounds can't be sustained once cooler weather sets in and school reopens. And it's our view this was a component breakdown, not a system breakdown. Um, as uh, Mr. Meyer mentioned, the system is working. It's just a component that needs to be replaced. Secondly, we'd like a realistic assessment of the cost to keep the building functional at a bare bones level for the next, say, five years. Um, a full building renewal is inappropriate when the pool is expected to see cease operation, operations in a few years. And lastly, but not least, we would like a funded profile for the new rec center at Rolly Mouse Park included in the next capital budget 2022 to 20, 2023 to 26 that will be presented to council in the fall. Currently an unfunded profile is being prepared. We have some comments on uh, the report and I'm just going to pick some of them uh, from my, my email. The report mentions that there are three other facilities within five kilometers of Scona Pool um, and that the uh, residents can access those facilities uh, at Bonnie Doon Confederation and Kinsman. As we have pointed out in presentations to previous councils, the 5K standard in the approach to rec facilities is not appropriate and doesn't work well for our area. Driving on White Avenue, 109th Street or 114th Street at rush hour takes much longer than driving 5K on the white mud. Regarding driving, the report indicates area residents can get to one of these other pools within a 15 minute drive. However, and then also refer references the 15 minute districts in the city plan. The um, city plan 15 minute districts though is based on active transportation, walking, biking or transit, not driving. And the communities near the pool are walkable and attract residents who uh, don't have cars uh, for a variety of reasons, income, age, disability or lifestyle. And they can get to their groceries, they get to work, uh, do other activities um, but they um, wouldn't be able to access a pool very easily. It is very difficult um, to get to these other pools um, and, uh, and especially Kinsman, which requires coming, uh, walking or biking back up out of the river valley, uh, up uh, uh, Walterdale Hill. Uh, in a previous presentation to council, we used Google directions to estimate the time it would get to Kinsman Confed or Bonnie Dune by walking, cycling and transit from an address in the Scona district neighborhood within 5K of those facilities. And it was in the attachment and we chose an address from uh, Park Allen to Kinsman, from uh, McKernan to Confederation and from a uh, Strathcona condo to Bonnie Dune. And you can see on uh, that page seven of that document yesterday that only a very few of those uh, are accessible within 15 minutes and it's not, none of them are accessible by walking um, uh, in, within 15 minutes. Um, and the uh, transit uh, usually requires uh, either a transfer or walking up Walterdale Hill to catch the number nine. Bus. I am sorry, Ms. Soleil, I okay, have to stop you sorry. here. Five Thank minutes you. are over. Uh, next we'll go to Michelle Chu. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving us giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Michelle and I'm a student attending Strathcona High School as well as a captain for the next swim season. It has been a privilege to be on a swim team when I was in grade 11, especially coming out of the pandemic. The spirit of our students and the Scona swim team looks out for each other and makes a positive community. Scona swim has set benchmarks, countless records in the pool, either on deck or in the pool. Our hallways above our school doors represent um, through these halls walk champions, uh, which represents that champions entails more than about being a championship. It also stands for the three principles that our students athletes uphold. 
Students that participate in sports such as swimming are dedicated to their families, their academic success, as well as their teams. Our student athletics and swimmers are well-respected members of the Skona community because of their dedication to these three tenants and their exemplary behavior. The strong legacy and sense of community at Strathcona inspired pride being ablord among its student athletes. Skona Swim is an inclusive environment which allows students to be supported and heard. Students on the team receive ex excellent exercise and re in return, we are more fueled for school as well as motivated to complete school work. The comprehensive environment has improved our physical and mental well-being, including having a positive participation in class, making new friends, and reducing stress off our bodies. When students are in the pool, there is an excellent atmosphere generated by positive attitudes of students. The space and location of the Skona pool helps us foster this climate and play, plays an important part in our school life. Our school and swim team is a vibrant community that dedicates exceptional opportunities for students striving to develop thoughtful leaner, learners and dynamic leaders who are prepared to embrace challenges and make meaningful, meaningful contributions to society. The legacy of our swim team has allowed us to honor our tradition and embrace our motto as one who serves. With the Skona pool being attached to our building and accessible for students, it allows us to continue to preserve and pass on our incredible tradition and legacy to future generations. The dedication to performance fills Skona pool with perspiration, just as passion for education fills our classrooms with and hallways with inspiration. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. And uh, next we'll go to uh, Hugo Ningyun. Hi, thank you for this opportunity. I'm really grateful to be here today. Um, so I'm one of the current swim captains for Strathcona swim team. And besides being one of the swim captains, I've also been a competitive swimmer with Edmonton Kiana Swim Club for the past nine years. And some of the things I've learned from swimming is that nothing in life comes easy. I've learned a great work ethic and how to balance my school load and load for other extracurriculars in my life. Um, with Keanu, I've noticed that it can be really competitive and individualistic, um, really individually um, centered, and there's not really a center on family, community, or supporting others around you. There's lots of people dropping out or not being supported by coaches or their peers, and this competitive mindset really shift, shifted when I got to join Strathcona swim team. And the minute I walked through the doors of not only the swim team, but Strathcona High School, I was ingrained with one of their other mottos, once a lord, always a lord. And this motto uh, almost flew over my head on the first day I was taught to it by one of my teachers. But when I entered the swim team, my swim captains at the time, and also the coaches, really opened my eyes to how a family and group of people can give you pride to your school. And it was there that I learned how to bond over certain weaknesses and strengths with my peers. Not everyone who joined that swim team was a competitive swimmer. Many of them have never swam in their life. But from other stronger swimmers and their coaches, they got to connect with people with like-minded thoughts and ideals and learned how to adopt certain life, um, life ethic morals, I'm sorry, work values and ethics in their life. Whether it be how to work hard in school and in the pool or balance their playtime and their work time. Amongst learning how to swim, they also learned how to take pride in a school legacy that's been ingrained in not only the school history, but Metro Athletics swim history for the past three decades. This dominance has really taught people how to appreciate what they have and not to take things for granted. And I know students like myself have joined Skona just for the swim team because not only is it great to win, but it's also great to make friends with other people and learn skills that allow you to succeed in life. And I know that everyone here in this building has a family. And maybe even you committee members have kids. And you want children to grow up feeling loved and nurtured with good ideals. And I think that it's always great to be reinforcing these values at something such as Skona Swim Team because there are so many negatives surfing the online web of social media with negative mindsets being ingrained into children and even teenage, teenagers my age. And sports is a great way of it's knocking down these negative barriers and surrounding youth with great life lessons and work ethic. And ever since I was a little toddler, my parents have showed me countless ways that family can help you. And one thing I remember growing up was that Lilo and Stitch, a Disney movie, taught me how to love the water. 
and the little rascal, Stitch, who I really reflect with, he went throughout that movie learning how family was important. And there's a saying in that movie, Ohana means family, and family means no one ever gets left behind. And while everyone here may grow old, the Scone alumni may move on, the coaches may move on, and the teachers may retire, no one will ever forget the Scone swim pool, because the Scone swim pool is part of our family and will never leave it behind. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we will go to uh, uh, Svetana Tra It Sakia. Hi, everyone. My name is Svetlana. I'm the mother of four children, and I live in Queen Alexander neighborhood. When my husband, myself, and two our children moved into the neighborhood 18 years ago, there were no official talks about walkability. <laughs> but we have meant to walk everywhere we could. We are very happy that Skona Pool is located in the area. We walk to the pool twice a week. Swimming is good for my health, for the health of my children and their many friends. We have found that so many children love to swim, our neighbors' kids and kids of our friends from around the town. Children with or without their parents come with us to the pool to swim and to play in water. Skona Pool became a major social place for them, where they meet and play. One of my children is a special needs person. Swimming is his passion and one of the few sports that he can do. He's a competitive level swimmer now. He takes swim courses at Stedward Center, University of Alberta, and practices lane swimming during public swims at Skona Pool. Traveling by himself is challenging for him. However, Skona Pool is located such as he can walk there and back home independently. My mother, a 70 plus year old lady, loves swimming. She was hit by a car three years ago. She survived, but she has never fully recovered. When the city pools opened the last fall, I brought her to Skona Pool weekly. I drove her to the back door. I would enter the pool the normal way and would open the back door for her. There is a ramp from the pool and the back door to the change rooms, so she would walk with her four-wheel walker to the women's change room. I lowered portable stairs into one lane, and she used them to go in water. Lifeguards have been very considerate. They were willing to help if we needed help, so there was no problem with accessibility. I have some comments regarding the city council's report on Skona Pool. The report mentions the average number of visitors a year in several indoor pools. I suppose that the averaging was done in the same way for all the pools, so the data are comparable. But was any comparison done as per swim lane or per area per day? For example, 36,000 visitors in a small four-lane pool means 36 divided by four, 9,000 visitors per lane per year. Divided by the number of days in the year, we get 25 people per lane per day. Skona pool is open for a few days than the most of the indoor pools, less than 365 days. So the actual number must be quite higher than 25 people per lane per day. I would suggest to compare these normalized numbers of visitors as per lane or per area of the pool per day then the picture of pool attendance will be more accurate. About availability of other pools, such as Kinsman Confederation and Bonnie Doon pools, I also have a comment. Kinsman pool is not within walking distance and has limited public swim options. It is not intended for families. Confederation pool and Bonnie Doon pool are accessible only through most busy roads, namely 111th Street and White Avenue, respectively. These are prohibitive routes in terms of time and safety. We really do need Skona Pool, and we hope that the city keeps it open. Thank you for your time. Best wishes. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation. And next, we will go to uh, Kirby Fang. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kirby Fang. I'm one of the volunteer coaches of Skona Swim Team, and um, I started coaching back in 1998. 
I was the only volunteer coach back at that time, and I came back to say thank you to my teachers and my coaches. And something kind of really cool happened over the next little while. Um, I came back to thank my teachers, and I started to continue to coach because of the kids. Then the kids finished their three years in high school, and they all left, and they started to come back saying, can we stay a part of this amazing swim team? So over the last, I think, 15 years, uh, Mayor Sohi, I believe we've met on this before, there have been about 30 to 40 volunteer coaches coming back every single year to help our program of about 150 swimmers. Many of them, when they start, they're not swimmers. <laughs> they're just kids that want to be a part of something. So I've got a chance to watch this program grow over 24 years. Everybody keeps asking me, um, how long am I going to keep co going? I say, I'm going to take it year by year. Three years ago, two years ago, um, this whole thing hit the our world, COVID-19. So I got a chance to see something that I'd never seen in my life. And that is maybe like a nice two-year break <laughs> from coaching. And at the same time, we had our first season back in September of this year. And it was markedly different. I have never seen so many kids, grade 10s, come in so hungry to be part of something ever. And this is in 24 years of volunteering with my coaches. The saddest thing is we lost a lot of grade 11s. And, and we, we take attendance. We try to figure out our demographics, how to best serve our, our swimmers. And out of this 150, 160 kids that signed up, we had four grade 11 boys. So we had a whole bunch of kids from grade 12 who remembered being a part of community in grade 10. And we have this lost generation who had to go to school online, had to deal with all these kinds of things. And I spoke with my captains, I spoke with my, my, my swimmers. And I said, do your best to get these people back in. Let's, let's help these people reintegrate into society. And it was very difficult. My biggest concern, and I realize there's a lot of talks of money on the table, six million from the city, um, with all the work that Gary's done, and uh, thank you, Gary, for getting us the stats on that, Forty to $60,000 for a component that is broken. I would like council to think about what is the societal cost if all of a sudden this closes and we don't have a way to move forward. Are we going to have another gap year, a gap two years until a new facility is built? Are we going to be able to help these kids? And what is the long-term cost of that in dollars to our society in terms of at-risk youth or psychological problems or things that might happen in a hospital? I think that's very real. Um, I have been coaching for a long time. We used to go and use Kinsman Pool as well. And before COVID, we had swim meets at Bonnie Dune. It takes about half an hour during rush hour, which is before or after school, to even hope to get there. And a lot of times after school, it took us 45 minutes to go from Skona to Bonnie Dune with two bus loads of kids. And that was less than 30% of our swimmers. So we maintain attendance records and we have 60 plus swimmers plus 20 coaches every single practice, eight to 10 times a week. How are we gonna get those kids there safely and how are we gonna get them back and still be a part of the school? So that's all I'd like to say and I, I hope council would have an answer for that because in the recommendation it said they would look, the city would look at a way to help us displaced groups if the pool were to close, um, to have a place and to continue on this program and Skona swim team has not swam in the city of Edmonton, Kinsman, since 2001. Thank you for your, uh, your attention and thank you for your yep. consideration. Yep. Thank you so much. And next we'll go to uh, Brian Torrance joining remotely. Uh, thank you, Mayor, how's the sound? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, uh, members of the executive committee. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak. Uh, along with many other community members. Uh, my name is Brian Torrance and I'm a community member in Allendale. I have two daughters. Uh, they, they use the, the pool regularly. I also work for Ever Active Schools, uh, which is a charity focused on population health, healthy communities, healthy schools. Um, I am against the closing of the pool and I feel the recommendation is again short sighted to a, to a larger issue of health and well being, accessibility, and inclusion. And really living the city plan and having a city of 15 minute communities. I'd like to commend the city for the leadership uh, in terms of having healthy, active citizens, including 
uh, the most recent player view inclusive playground, uh, the leader access program that supports thousands of families to get into uh, recreation services. Um, and also the, the, the pivot uh, with COVID to open up shared pathways uh, for more active travel. So as much as these decisions are all isolated, these are all decisions that focus on people and the city should be commended, commended for that. Scona pool and the other recreation facilities provide safety, wellness, and a strong sense of longing for all Amatonians, and it's essential to good health. Like this conversation has been going on for 12 years. I know everyone here has put a lot of time into visiting council uh, uh, to go over this uh, time and time again. But I'd like to come back to some maybe some compasses that the city has. So specifically the Live Active strategy that was passed by council in 2016. Uh, also, child friendly Edmonton, other initiatives such as urban isolation, mental health. If these documents and including our city plan are the compass for how we want to live, um, we have to start uh, to follow to follow their direction. So live active highlights specifically healthy and vibrant Edmonton. In which people embrace active lifestyles that improve their individual well being as well as that of their families, neighborhoods and community core principles being inclusion and accessibility. So today's <clears throat> today is a passionate group from Allendale, Queen Alex, Park Allen. But if this situation was East Glen, you know, we would have a very similar response. And then this summer, um, we had the decision or recommendation not to open up summer pools till till July 1st. And I think we clearly saw the care of Edmontonians have towards their outdoor pools and also overall overall recommendations. So Edmontonians value. Uh, their health and the recreation and their overall well-being. So I think it's time to start making decisions and not decision by decision by decision when these things come up, but start to make some larger decisions to the overall health and health and wellness of our cities. Libraries, pools, rinks, parks, school grounds, those are all very, very core services in our city, and we need to support and fund them that way too. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much. And next we will go to uh, Elliot Wright. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Elliot Wright and I'm a grade 11 student at Strathcona High School. For the 2020 through 2021 school year, I attended McKernan Public School in grade nine online school. This was uh, one of the hardest years of my life. I was in online all year and from the lack of socialization, I developed depression. It got to the point where I couldn't even get out of bed some, day, some days. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life or which high school I was going to go to. My friend uh, recommended me to Strathcona High School and I decided that would be the place for me. I heard the school had a swim team and it sounded sort of fun, so I decided to join it. I started out barely knowing how to swim, but I was able to prog progress quite quickly and with much dedication and hard work, a lot of which took place at Scona Pool. I made it to Provincials this summer. I have really found my passion in swimming and Scona Pool has made the, that possible for me. I made a lot of friends at Scona Pool as well. I'm friends with most of the workers and guards there and I've met a lot of people on the swim team that I'm great friends with. I have trained at Scona Pool every single morning since October of 2021, which has tremendously improved my physical health and more importantly, my mental health. Having easy and inexpensive access to a facility to train at was what made this possible for me. Scona Pool has also inspired me to become a lifeguard. I'm currently doing my, ma my national lifeguard certification and will be a lifeguard before school resumes this September. Without the opportunity to be introduced to swimming at Scona Pool, none of these accomplishments would have been within my reach. I want to continue to give others the chance to transform themselves into better people and better Edmontonians at Scona Pool. Thank you. Thank you so much. And next we will go to Kim Clegg. Hello, good afternoon, Honorable Mayor Sowey, City Councilors, member of members of administration. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm coming from the Queen Alice Community League. I'm also part of a lot of the, uh, being a part of a lot of the committees uh, dedicated to the Rolling Miles facility. I'm also a, a Scone alumni. Um, 
I just wanted to also state what, how great it is to see all these young people here presenting in front of city council. I hope they come back over their whole lives and continue to, you know, uh, to speak like they're doing, and, and uh, it's awesome. Um, yeah, and I, I appreciate their earnest positivity. I'm a little bit more grumpy, I'm sorry to say. Um, it's really hard for me to come back to this again, as it kind of seems we had an equitable agreement in the past as to the future of Scona Pool, how it was going to happen. And it seems like we're kind of throwing out all this hard work we did over the last decade about making sure that Scona Pool is kept going until Rolling Miles is built. Um, like throwing it out for $40,000 after everything we've done is so frustrating. Um, one thing you might not know is the Queen Alex Community League, as part of the membership, subsidizes swims for people at the pool. So a senior in our neighborhood can buy a $5 membership and they can go swim at the pool 30 times and we pay for it. And families get great deals as well. So it's a huge service to people in our neighborhood. It's so important. We're, we're sort of confused as to why this $40,000 charge for this one part has triggered this massive, uh, you know, um, review and these million dollar figures being thrown out. It doesn't seem to really correlate with the reality at the pool, as, as many people have said already today. Um, we feel like the common sense should really prevail here, and it really shouldn't be informed by just the spreadsheet, but by the human element. I mean, a lot of rec facilities and facilities like libraries don't necessarily make fiscal sense, but they make human sense within the city, and that, that has to be, that has to be uh, considered here as well. Um, I realize that administration's job is to point out those numbers, but we kind of rely on council to temper those numbers with the human side of things. And so therefore we feel closing the pool is a huge overreaction to kind of a relatively small problem right now. Everyone's talked about the importance to these groups. Uh, it's kind of the part of the DNA of our area, this walkable, carless, bikeable access to this pool is huge and, and as we've discussed, access to other pools is poor. Uh, and um, everyone is okay with the pool being a little tired and a little worn out. As long as it's safe and it works, we prefer it warts and all to no facility because that would be terrible. Um, our area is densifying a lot. We need amenities added to the area. We don't need things taken away. Uh, we're gonna be more and more packed with people over the next 10 years and we need facilities to stay open as long as they can to the nth degree and uh, hopefully the new facility is on its way. Um, one of the things I have to comment on is that one of, the, one of the comments in the report kind of indicated that closing Scona Pool might accelerate the new facility being greenlit and funded. But that also reads as keeping the pool open could delay the new facility being opened. And I find that a troubling statement because um, we kind of get that uh, message from developers that kind of use a bit of a, a scenario where they say, if you don't agree to this, it could harm your, your community. And I feel like because the city and us community leagues, we're on the same side. I don't really feel that language is, is great. Uh, I feel it was an unfortunate statement. And, you know, we shouldn't be kind of scared into agreeing to this closure because it might affect all our work on Rolling Miles. Because as you know, we have put in huge time into developing the Rolly Miles facility. Many, many people have. So I, I do ask that you consider that and we hope that you can come to the sensible agreement that keeping Scona Pool open is the right way to go. And uh, I thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for uh, being here and your presentation as well. And uh, next we'll go to uh, Katrina Semeniak. Hello. Go ahead. Thank you, so, thank you for having me. I'm a mom of four and a volunteer in Queen Alex. I believe this is the fifth council facing Scona Pool decisions since the pool last closed in 2008. Thank you for having us share our recommendations for this community hub. I also enjoyed celebrating the 100 years of Queen Elizabeth Pool this week. That that pool has been moved renamed and only stays open for three to four months of the year, truly demonstrates our city's traditional commitment to recreation. I brought my daughters to Scona Pool yesterday and prayed that it wasn't our last visit. We enjoyed swim camp, swim lessons, and the mini Olympians programming there. They're stuck right now. They don't know what's going to happen with their fall schedule until things are discussed today. I also started a parents and taught swim with our community league 
and we would not be swimming if it were not for Skona Pool, for the reasons that Elaine mentioned. We're not here to ask for a major reno, just a heat exchanger that can be sold or moved when it's no longer needed. This will keep our pool operational until City Council, until this council, builds Rolling Miles Rec Centre and retires Skona Pool indefinitely. Between the families that live across the street from Skona Pool, I count 21 zero to 10 year olds who thrive because they can walk to swimming year round. This number increases exponentially as we look further than 105A Street. This is where our kids are growing up and we need the pool in operation or Rolling Miles Rec Center to be ready so we can just keep swimming. My kids can swim because of Skona Pool. We're willing to continue working with your council to provide this recreation opportunity for everybody and are physically demonstrating that commitment through our GoFundMe to pitch in. It's an easy decision today. Fix the heat exchanger, keep the pool open for now, and approve funding for the Little Rolly Miles Rec Center replacement. Thank you. That's my presentation. I also have a video and two questions. And I'll just say my questions now and then maybe my my 49 second clip can be played. But number one, is what would be the timeline for demolition? How much would it cost? We don't want a derelict or empty building when we can enjoy a good enough swimming facility to use for now. Let's demolish Skona Pool at the same time that the heavy equipment is there to build the Rolly Miles Rec Center. And number two, how much will it cost the city to close Skona Pool when the mechanical systems are integrated within the high school? Mm. Yeah, we will ask those questions to administration when that time comes. Uh, you want to play the video? Yes. Yeah. I love swimming without a life jacket in the whole entire pool. that video this morning <laughs> with the swim that we did yesterday and I'm I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak today and take care everyone thanks for being here well thank you so much uh, and next we will go to Felicity you are come on let's do it you got whole five minutes to make your presentation hi my name is Felicity Cusick, and I will be presenting a slideshow to save Skona Pool and keep our community happy. I will be presenting the first half of the slideshow, while my partner, Maddie Chan, will complete the other half. Skona Pool matters to me so much, and these are some of my reasons why. It takes five minutes to walk all the way to the pool, whereas driving to another pool not only pollutes the earth, but also takes way longer to drive to. Kids would have to get an adult to drive them to another pool, whereas at school now, we can just walk us there ourselves. Add the time of getting prepped to go and double checking to make sure we have got everything as well as finding a parking spot you will have probably taken at least double the time it would have taken to just have walked to a pool close by. Skona Pool is important to me and my community because kids can easily apply for, less, for less, lessons. Both me and Maddie have learned to swim by going to Skona Pool and taking lessons, and we have had so much fun learning. Not only that, but we also just go to the pool with our friends and family and have always have a lot of fun. What would you even do with the space and would it cost more or less than fixing one thing that is important to my community, me, and Skona High School? Even if you decide to shut down Skona Pool, then you should build the new rec center while we still have a pool to go to. If Skona Pool is to close, you should de demolish the the pool area and build the Rolling Miles Rec Center so we have a place to swim when we and others are in high school. 
Thank you for having me. Have a good day. Well, thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Uh, Mary, you're next. You want to finish up the presentation, right? Go ahead. My name is Mary. And Can you move close to the mic, if you don't mind? My name is Mary, and I'm going to... And speak up a bit so everybody can hear you. My name is Maddie, and I'm going to complete the presentation that was started by Felicity. In three years, we are going to be going to Kaskona High School, and we want to go to a pool that we can easily access. Of families and neighbors are going to be wanting to go to an easily accessible pool nearby that they can use often. We've been swimming at, in this pool since we were babies, and we love it. As it is not far from our house, houses, we can go there often, and we would hate to see it close. Skona Pool is a great pool for adults and kids alike. The pool is great for everyone because there's a diving area and ropes for older kids and shallow areas and lots of toys for the younger kids, as well as lots of great learning equipment for the people who are just learning how to swim. We can even purchase Queen Alexandra memberships for $20, and we can get 40 swim free swims out of that membership. And it costs even more to go to a different pool for, like, families of larger, who have more people. When Sc Skona Pools has al almost closed many other times, and many members of the Queen Alexandra community were standing up to keep Skona Pool open. Skona Pool has been on the brink of being closed down many times, but they stood up against the decision to shut down the pool. So, Maddie, can you speak up? We're having a difficult time hearing you. Go Skoda ahead. Pool yes, has been that's on good. the brink of being closed down many times, but they stood against the de decision to, to shut the pool down and succeeded in keeping Skona Pool open. As we all love Skona Pool, we are willing to stand against the closing of Skona Pool once again and hope you will give our community pool one more chance. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your presentation, both of you. Uh, okay, next we will go to uh, Amelia Zian joining us in person. Hello, um, I'm Amelia Zian. I've been living in Ward Papasteo since 2001. I'm a community member, a former Skona student, and a volunteer coach for the Skona swim team since 2018. I'm also one of many children across several generations that use Skona pool for leisure, social events, and learning to swim. I'm also one of many high school students that use Skona as part of the swim team, both during the swim season and out of the swim season as well. Often, myself and several of my classmates would go to the pool during our lunch hour or during our spare classes. Now, as a swim coach, I have the pleasure of supporting other students, many of whom are here today, who have this, to have the same experience with Skona Pool as I did in high school. Not only for Skona students, but several other schools use Skona Pool for training, physical education, and special education classes. Community members throughout South, Cent South Central Edmonton use Skona Pool for leisure, social events, and sport. Throughout my time as both a swimmer and a coach on Skona Swim Team, our training sessions coexisted with community members coming in for public swim and this fostered multi-generational community connections. Reports exploring the potential closure of Skona Pool always name the number of pools in the vicinity, and for many of us living in South Central Edmonton, myself included, it's true that there are other pools even closer to our homes. There's a reason many of us choose Skona instead. Skona Pool is human-sized. Giant institutional sports complexes don't fit the needs of the users of Skona Pool and can't serve as viable alternatives for the majority of us. For many community members and the multiple schools using Skona Pool, it's within walking or biking distance and accessible by small community bus on 76th Avenue. Other pools require a longer and less accessible commute with barriers like the Walterdale Hill and high traffic roads. Furthermore, these larger facilities don't act in the same fashion as Skona's community-sized pool. None of us who use Skona Pool are walking into it expecting it to be a brand new, beautiful facility like the Meadows or Twilliger. Skona Pool's human-sized space in the community has fostered a sense of trust among us as users of the space. Parents bring their young children to learn to swim in a welcoming place, or children come on their own. Skona Pool is a place where teens can feel comfortable to exist as themselves and practice sport, which is an opportunity that's not as accessible in larger rec centers. And adults of all ages, including many seniors, come to swim in a space where they feel respected. Throughout my life, I've had the privilege to be part of all of these groups. Learning to swim as a child, staying active as a teen, 
and now as an adult, as a community user, I'm, and I'm not alone in that experience. As an industrial designer specializing in inclusive, accessible, and human-centered design, it's also impossible for me not to look at this issue from that design perspective. It's true that Skonopool's facility is outdated and won't last another 65 years, and all of us here today understand that. However, if Skonopool is closed before there's a viable replacement, the community and surrounding schools will lose a hugely important community center and invaluable opportunities to stay active and foster connection. I just want to highlight that importance of keeping it open for use until there's a proper re replacement. I've worked on many building and service design projects based on the city's winter city design guidelines. Skonopool serves as a facility that is aligned with guideline number five, design and provide infrastructure that supports desired winter life and improves comfort in cold weather, as well as outcome number one, buildings are designed so that their impact on the public realm creates better microclimates as well as public spaces that are more vibrant and inviting from policy number C588 from October 2018, uh, sorry, 2016. And I'd like to highlight that, quote, desired winter life includes opportunities for staying active throughout the winter months. In the past year, I've worked on a project for the City of Edmonton's Neighborhood Revitalization Committee that highlights the need for safe and welcoming spaces for youth in the city, spaces of which the city is lacking. In this project, loose general guidelines were recommended to promote well-being through physical play and creativity, to encourage bravery through safety and security, to facilitate gathering and community, and to inspire growth for belonging, through belonging in an inclusive environment. Skonopool also serves as a facility that aligns with this need and these guidelines. The size of this facility and use by a large number of teens has made it a space that welcomes teens to practice sport and foster a sense of belonging among each other and with the wider community too. The proximity it has to many schools also supports the creation of sports programs that align with these recommendations as well. Moving the patrons of Skona Pool and these programs to larger pools further away before there is a viable replacement in the area would not have the same positive outcome and impact on the community as it does currently. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. And next, we'll go to Jeff Papineau joining us remotely. Good afternoon. Go ahead, we can hear you. Yes, yeah. thank you, Mayor, Executive Council and City Administration for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm Jeff Papineau and I'm with Friends of Scona Rec. I live in Allendale and I have uh, two teenagers, one at Strathcona High School and one at McKernan School. And uh, I support many of the points that have been made by the amazing speakers that, uh, that have already presented. Uh, but I'd like to reemphasize that the, uh, a few of the, the points. And first is that the other facilities in the, in the area are, are really pretty difficult options. And, uh, you know, they fly in the face of the, of the city plan. And like most of the people um, that I know, we're busy trying to get out of our cars and keep it local and that sort of thing. But I'd also like to reiterate the recommendations from the Friends of Scona Rec um, to replace the heat exchanger, um, to perform a realistic assessment of the cost to keep the building functional at a bare bones level, and uh, most importantly, a funded profile for the new rec center at Rolly Miles Park, uh, included in the next capital budget. And um, I'll just I'll tell a quick story about how I was out on uh, the weekend. Somebody came up to me who I recognized from Queen Alex, and he said, "Hey, are you still involved in uh, in Skona Pool? Uh, because you know you've heard about everything that's going on." And I said, "Oh, you know, definitely." He said, "Yeah, um, I wrote my letter, and uh, he's got two little kids." And he's and I said, "Well, tell me how you feel about this because I plan to to come to council." And he said, "Well, my biggest concern is that even if uh, allowing them to close the pool." If it moves things forward about getting a replacement, uh, we just have no guarantees that that replacement isn't going to get built on time. You know, budgets creep up, things happen, and suddenly we've gone a few years without a pool and everyone gets kind of used to it. We can go a few more and a few more, and pretty soon, you know, where, where are we? Uh, so he was very concerned about that, and they, they live pretty close to the pool. He said that they spent a lot of time there um, over the summer. And, uh, and I really appreciate that. I think, on the other hand, though, I, I spoke to my teenagers about this, and they said that uh, they would like to keep the pool open. They go there, of course, but they also recognize that, um, that if, if it can be modernized or if, if we can have a new facility that is, is modern and can incorporate other features, it will serve uh, the, you know, uh, many more people than it's going to pool currently does. So, you know, uh, I'm between those two points, I'm thinking that it would be great to keep it going, but more importantly, it would be really great to get that funding for the new uh, the new rec center on board as uh, soon as possible. 
And because uh, we've had so many people speak already today, I, I'd like to uh, conclude my remarks there. Thank you. Thank you so much. And next, we will go to Jeff Papineau. Sorry, Jeff has already spoken. Sorry about that. Yes, Jer you. Jared Buller, in person. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Your Worship, Mayor Sohi, Councillors Rutherford, Stephen, Rice, and Knack. My name is Jared Bueller. I'm the volunteer president of the Olympian Swim Club. To my understanding, OSC is the largest single organizational user of Sco Scona Pool and is the primary user of the facility from September through June annually. We have been for some time. Fifteen years ago, I was a much younger father of four and five-year-old boys who learned to swim at Scona Pool at the Olympian Swim Club's Minio program. They both still compete competitively. I've spent literally hundreds of hours seated at a picnic table at Scona Pool and know it well. Those bricks that have fallen off the exterior wall have been doing so since 2007. This pool has been the victim of active neglect by the city for much longer, but has defied the odds in large part because of River City Recreation, who with limited resources has been fastidious in their care of the interior facility. Wear your shoes past the change room threshold at your own risk. While the city now pays handsomely to build murals honoring Queen Elizabeth Pool, rebuilt three times, those who understand know Scona Pool is the year-round workhorse of Edmonton swimming. The Olympian Swim Club is a not-for-profit competitive swim club. We offer programs ranging from pre-competitive Learn to Swim, our minio program, to high-performance programs. We're currently part of the High Performance Pathway Program at Kinsman Sports Centre, but many of our feeder groups are based out of Scona Pool and have been for some time. A successful high performance sport program is built on a much larger foundation of the club's pre-competitive and junior development programs. These programs are normally based out of smaller accessible neighbourhood pools like Scona. Scona Pool's central location makes it an ideal entry point to our club for central Edmonton families and our swimmers at this pool are exclusively Edmonton residents. While modest in size and without the amenities of even comparable pools named in the current report, Scona has always produced many of our to club's top swimmers. Most recently, Manyo Mena, a new immigrant to Canada when he started swimming at our Scona Minio program with my son, represented his native Kenya and our club at the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham, England earlier this month. Scona Pool, from a developmental and training perspective, is a great place to learn and train. Perhaps counterintuitively, the close quarters for parents, swimmers and coaches without distractions of larger facilities are conducive to the development of the coach-athlete parent relationship and produces good swimmers. In the past week, our club opened registration for the 2022-23 season. We expected this to be the first season not affected significantly by COVID-19 since 18-19 season. We anticipated Scona Pool, as it has for the past decades, would accommodate 45 swimmers from our three junior competitive programs there and 72 additional participants in the pre-competitive Minios program, along with six coaches who've already been hired to coach these swimmers. Less than a week ago, on Thursday, August 18th, coinciding with public reports, we received the, the first news of a breakdown of the heat exchanger, which now threatens to close Scona permanently. The timing of the present announcement when our own key, key staff and city staff are on summer vacation in combination with the speed of this announcement that the city is, is moving permanently to close Scona has left users with no time and few resources to organize an effective response. It is difficult to avoid the impression that the deck was intentionally stacked in favor of a quick closure without meaning, meaningful consultation with your current stakeholders. The COVID-19 pandemic has been immeasurably difficult for all organizations, particularly so for volunteer nonprofit organizations. The 22-23 season was meant to be a year of rebuilding. Our current circumstances threat threaten to throw our operations, budget and our development program into disarray and have already caused significant issues as we prepare from the, for the start of the season, only weeks away. In addition to the current proposed closure, within the past two years, our club has lost the use of Nate Pool, a six lane 50 meter pool. The loss of that facility resembles the current circumstances in that a quick announcement without meaningful consultation was followed by a quick closure. 
Shortly thereafter, the City of Edmonton, without consultation, announced the indeterminate closure of Peter Hemingway, an eight-lane 50-meter pool. Both these facilities formerly comprised a significant portion of our club's pool requirements. We continued, in part based on an increasing reliance on Skona Pool. The current City of Edmonton pool allocation process is based almost solely on histor historic use at individual facilities. It has provided no avenue to accommodate the loss of space at Peter Hemingway Pool. I must stress that despite public assurances and comments in the present report that Skoda Pool user groups may be accommodated at other city facilities, my past experiences and conversation with city personnel over the past 72 hours leave me with no confidence whatsoever. Sorry, Mr. Buller, I'm going to meaningfully I'm compensated. going to stop you here. I gave you a few extra seconds, but uh, five minutes are over. I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. And next, we'll go to Isabella Hernandez. Hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, good afternoon. My name is Isabella Hernandez. I am in grade 11, and I am a captain of the swim team this year. Moreover, the span of the pandemic has taken two years of our time at the Skona Pool, which has profoundly influenced our physical and mental well-being. Many of us, our stress levels have increased during this time period as many activities and programs, including swimming, were prohib prohibited from operating. COVID made us feel alone. We were isolated from the world and our friends, not being able to go anywhere or do much. The only contact we had was with our phone or some type of screen. New, re re new researches present evidence that the more time we spend on our smartphones or electronics, the more likely we are to feel depressed or think about suicide. The pool is a way to escape um, from the screen time and interact with others in such a vibrant, oh, sorry, <laughs> um, interact with others in such a vibrant community. If Skona Pool is taken away from us, many may enter that phase again and may feel ex excluded from an environment as most of our athletic teams at our school are cuts or tryout teams. Take to consideration um, of a student of ours on the swim team na named Grace Fe Feist. During our swim season, Grace has a reason to wake up and look forward to each day. The environment on our swim team, regardless of in the pool or on deck, allowed her to be supported, happy, confident, and not judged. Grace has ADHD, which means that she could not focus without medication. She felt that after a few weeks of swimming, she felt better with completing simple tasks and motivated to participate in school. Either she was working hard in school or at home, she had something to enjoy, as well as share with her friends and family. The dedication of students' times, the dedication of students' times to the swim team at, and at Skona Pool resulted in many beneficial improvements to to students such as Grace and many others who didn't share their story today. My next topic is exercise. Exercise in general has been shown to reduce blood pressure, stress, and anxiety levels, even with just 20 minutes each week. When students take part in our team training, they are more likely to set goals because of, of team building. Thus, this is critical for Skona Pool to remain open as it allows more students to show up and reduce stress from academics, have more energy, get an improved sleep, get an improved sleep, Increase, increase positivity as well as being included in a spirited community. Plus, it's right beside the school, therefore we have the advantage to shower, to get out and walk right into school. My personal feelings about the swim team are that I love swimming and anything to do with water. Um, with me living so far away, I like to drive because it's so easy to get to the pool because I just take the, uh, the Hende and then the Fox Drive and then I go straight into the Skona. Um, the swim team is more than just a team. It's like a family to me. Over the months, we bond, laugh, and make many amazing memories together. The pool has been where most of my memories have been created and cherished. For others, it has been 35 years. I've already made some great memories there, and I don't want them to be torn down and forgotten about. It's like when you live in a house for so long, and then it burns down, and all those memories and moments are gone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we will go to... Enrico Lazoy? Lazoy. 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 Okay, go ahead. Lazoy. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Enrico Lazoy. Uh, thanks so much to Council for this time. Uh, I'm just blown away by the amazing outpouring of, of kindness and stories. And really, what I hear uh, is a narrative where community members are saying, here's going to be the detrimental effect if we take this thing away. So I get to be right now in the position of. Uh, Queen Alexandra Community League president, and I'm really grateful. I'm following in the line of decades of people who have been advocating for the rolling mills. Um, 
renewal for a new building and to keep this pool open. And I'm on the phone constantly with half the people on this uh, on this list here today that spoke. And so it's just, uh, it's really moving me. My, my other day job is uh, as a sociologist. And so I really get to think about um, the effect that some sort of social um, good that we have has on the lives of people. And we've heard those, those stories. So what can I say right now that's going to, uh, you know, move council or get us to the point where we can have uh, an agreement that the funding will be in place for uh, the next budget cycle to get the shovels in the ground. And what we're asking for, and this has already been asked for a couple of times by the speakers we've had today, is um, we, we are grateful for the funding that's been given for doing the planning and development that we are absolutely grateful because now we have drawings. Drawings are, are happening, they're in play. But what we need next is that commitment. And so we really worry that if we take away this pool right now, then we're going to have that several gap years. And some of our youngest participants today, they spoke about, you know, are we going to allow this building to become derelict? You know, it's connected to the school. Um, will that space, what, what will happen to that specific piece of land? Is Something else isn't going to go there. It's probably not going to get knocked down because it's connected to the high school. Um, and so I really wonder, you know, is there a metaphor here that's really useful for um, for us? So let's imagine that you are a, a driver of a car. Like, for example, the last speaker said, you know, they drive from, you know, Twilliger and then they take box drive and they come into the neighborhood. And so with that person, if we took away their car for five years and said, but don't worry, in five years, you can have another car. Or if you're somebody who uses a, a cell phone every day and you need that phone to get your work done, you said, well, we're going to take it away. And then in five years, you can maybe have another one, maybe. Or if you're a very young person, you say, well, we're going to take away your caregivers, but don't worry, because in five years, will hook you up with another caregiver. I think it's untenable that we're going to uh, remove something that is such good bang for your buck. Um, the figures that I've heard, I know that the $40,000 number is floated, the $60,000 number is floated, but I believe it's actually closer to $25,000. And so the first thing that we thought of as a community league board is as an organization, the community league, well, we have money in the bank, you know, money that's been raised by doing things like fundraisers and uh, casinos. And so the first thought that came to my head was, well, could we foot the bill on that $25,000? Now, I don't have approval to do that. I haven't been able to call an emergency meeting with our board and say, is this something we can contribute? Because what we're asking for is, can the pool limp along, right? The other thing we did right away was start a GoFundMe campaign. And we haven't raised a ton of money. We've raised $1,100, and that's been in the last five days. And that's simply through community members saying, you know, let's we'll put our money where our mouth is, and we'll put that money forward as uh, whatever, here, funding, in-kind donation directly to pay for, you know, this one implement that, um, yeah, that needs to be fixed. I, that's That's almost all I'm saying. I guess... I'm trying not to be hyperbolic about thinking about like giving something and taking it away. But what we really need is that continuity. We need warts and all. We need this pool to be maintained in operation. River City is doing a fantastic job of keeping it going, being frugal with their budget to make sure that they provide a space that's safe for all people. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. So that concludes the, uh, the speakers. And now we'll go to uh, questions from uh, committee members and council members. So please sign up to ask questions. Uh, there we go. All right, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, thank and you, sir. Be sir, sorry, if before you do that, I really want to, on behalf of the committee and behalf of. Uh, uh, members who are joining us from council. Uh, we really appreciate your love for Skona Pool and, uh, and thank you for sharing the impact it had and continues to have on you. We really, really value that input. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, you took took the words right out of my okay. mouth. Um, absolutely wanted to thank everyone for coming out today. It was wonderful to hear uh, what a community has been built around around the pool. So thank you all so much for sharing your experiences and, and your passion. Um, I, I'm, I'm learning more about the, the history of the pool. I uh, just wanted to, to go back. I think, uh, Ms. Semenuk, you mentioned that the pool had closed in 2008. 
Um, could you just tell me a bit more, like how long was it closed for and what, what happened to the swim teams during that closure time? That was actually before my involvement with Skona Pool. So can I redirect that question to Miss Elaine Solas? I believe that she would have the answer to your question. Sure, please, Miss Solis. Um, I might not be the best person to answer that either. I've um, not been, I was, that's about the time I got involved, maybe. maybe. Kirby, you have the answer? Go ahead, yeah, yeah. I'm happy to answer for you. Um, I was driving to the pool at about 6 a.m. when I heard it on 6.30 Ched that the pool was closing. So what happened was it was in about March of 2009 I heard on the radio that the pool is going to be closed in June. So we were able to connect with councillors um, to speak with the mayor, Mandel at that time, and um, Councillor Sohi at that time now. Um, and we had a whole bunch of meetings and the community came together. So there was an emergency kind of stay of execution. Um, at that time, uh, Don Iveson was a brand new uh, councillor and Brian Anderson helped spearhead to give us the advice and, and guidance on what to do. So they were able to do a stay of execution six months to keep the pool open while a report was commissioned. Um, and that's what started off that first one. So in 2009, it was slated for closure, but we managed to get it to stay open for six months. And then after that, and uh, the report went through, it was one more year. And then it was three years after that when they, they realized it wasn't in as bad shape as Gary was mentioning as what we thought it would be. And it was much more used than, than what the numbers might have shown. Okay, and that, um, and so so the pool itself never actually closed down the operations? Correct, since? between March okay. and um, I think our final council meeting was in early June or late May um, of 2009. Okay. We no, got enough funding just to keep it open for a little bit longer yeah. and see what it did. Okay, no, thank you, that's that's very helpful. Um, and then Mr. Mr. Mayor, I think you were saying that so the report reflects, uh, I think, you know, sort of over a million dollars that's been invested in, in um, capital repairs in, in the past few years. Uh, and you were saying you weren't sure what those investments were. So just, yeah, what, what repairs have been happening at the facility in that time? Uh, sure, thank you. So <clears throat> uh, just quickly on Kirby's uh, thing, uh, my, my sons were in high school at that time and they came to me and said, Dad, the pool's closing can you do something? I formed a company and I started running the pool. So back to your question, um, uh, regular maintenance is done. That, that's part of, a, part of any, uh, any smart uh, business decision. Um, and uh, I don't wanna throw anybody under the bus, really, but I, I just can't, can't envision and see uh, that type of money being uh, being in, in invested, um, it, it's, uh, you know, there's maintenance costs, of course, uh, but uh, my company takes care of the, uh, all the chemicals and, and so forth. Uh, um, we take care of all the cleaning and uh, especially through COVID, we took care of uh, all those things as well to, to bring us to uh, City of Edmonton standards. But um, uh, regular shutdowns are done. Is that part of a re regular shutdown? Uh, um, you know, that's that's done every two, three years. Uh, so, in terms of uh, investing in, in new equipment, um, uh, I, I'm I'm not sure to, to how to answer that. Okay, no, I, I appreciate that. I think um, that's that's something I can follow up with our city staff about just to get a better sense. Because I think I think what I'm mindful of is that. Sometimes these small costs can accumulate into quite large numbers in, in a short amount of time. So I just want to get some clarity around that. But thank you again all so much for coming out today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rutherford. Yes, uh, echo the same sentiments as my past colleagues, especially love seeing, though I'm not there in person, my daughter's sick today. So I'm, I'm here at home with her, seeing so many youth um, coming before council. I think that's really amazing. Um, one of the things that I heard th through several speakers was around, you know, the importance of this as part of the school culture. And so I wanted to reference something in the report where it talks about the school board, Edmonton Public School Board has no desire to operate the pool and no capacity to support maintenance. So I wanted to know 
what the thoughts are on that, because it's great that it's part of the school culture. I know, Isabella, you referenced, for example, that most of the other teams are cut or tryouts. This one doesn't seem to be that way. And yet we don't have Edmonton Public School Board coming to the table. Did, did Isabella, did you want to talk about that? Your thoughts on that? Um, I haven't really heard much about Edmonton Public Schools saying they can't support it. I'm sorry. I don't have an That's answer okay. for that. You can redirect it to someone else, though. Probably my coach. <laughs> Is that Kirby? Yeah, that's Coach Kirby. <laughs> sure. Coach Kirby, go ahead. Um, it's kind of funny. Um, here, so you know we went through all this in 2009. Yeah. And it was um, up for legal de and debate on who owned the pool, whose land it was on. I think we figured out in the end. Um, the city from the start has been maintaining the pool. This is built on school lands and it was built as a joint project in 1957, I believe. Um, so it's kind of like saying, what's the school board going to do to step up? Well, they've never ran the pool in 65 years. So I would just leave it at that and say, it, yeah. this, this is the way it's always been done. Yeah, I, I hear that. And we're at a different position right now, right? Fiscally as a city, fiscally um, with this site. Um, I really like just going to, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, the president of the Queen Alexander Community League. It's, sorry, it's Andrico Lazway. Yes, I signed up late, never done it before, my bad. That's okay, no, that's okay. You kind of had a few analogies in there and I was actually thinking about an analogy as I was listening to and reading this report, similar to the car analogy, but a bit different take and I wanted your thoughts on it. So there's usually a point, right, where you if you own a car, and, and a little piece goes, you maintain it, you maintain it, you maintain it. But at some point, you have to decide whether investing and continuing to maintain that car is worth it or it's better to just put that money to save that money for a new car. And that's kind of what I feel like we're in in this situation. But it sounds like you don't see it that way from what I heard. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, I, I would definitely agree, right? We're going to anybody who's driving a car is going to put money into it to fix the thing. The issue that I have is with the gap. And I think that you or I, if we own cars and drive those cars, that there wouldn't be a three to five year uncertain gap that you would change all of your habits around transportation to say there will simply be no car. And I'm going to guess that most people who are drivers and reliant on their cars are going to figure some other mode out very quickly to fill that gap. And I just I think from the stories that we heard from neighbors and, and even students that are driving in is that this specific location has a lot of importance, that it can't just be something else somewhere else, because whether it's about disability or gender, or sexual orientation or race, religion, it, every single thing about it was this specific one. And and sure, I think you could stretch the analogy and say, well, okay, well, we'll, we'll get you a different car. I think what we're looking for is that assurance from city yeah. council. There needs to be this assurance around um, the funding in place in the next capital budget um, for rolling miles. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's the piece. Yeah, and I and I hear that. Um, I mean, I'm going to level with you, though. Like, I when I hear five kilometers for other swimming pools, and it's sad that you can't walk to them or that it's busy, I think about my ward where people have to drive 20 kilometers to get to a swimming pool. That is their only option. So it does still feel really amenity rich to me. So can you speak like for somebody that doesn't mm. live in that area, can you help sure. me understand why this is needed? Cause I'm really struggling when I look at it from the totality of the whole city and access to pools across the city. I can I can respond, but I wonder if anybody else wants to jump in here. You know, anyone else who's a neighbor in this region? Yeah, we did hear neighbors, for example, Kim Clegg had mentioned, you know, we are going to have this influx in a densifying neighborhood. And certain neighborhoods are going to end different wards. They're going to have different population uh, density. And so in this particular region, which, you know, the most famous landmark, I think, in the city is going to be White Ave, right? White Ave is the known place in the city. It's a place that people come to. They want to live in this area because of walkability. And people make different decisions about where they live, where they work in relation to the values of their families. And so 
I think it comes down to a question of values. And it's not to say that one is right or wrong, but it's just that in this region, and so I would just, you know, just imagine walking back up the Walter Dale Hill. Like going down, sure. In a car, no problem. But walking back up the hill or walking back up on the other side, there is there is something tangible about that that I just don't see, you know, my 87-year-old grandmother doing. Dang. You know, Fair but enough. she could. I'm, make her I, I am out of time, way Thank over time. So way, way over. But I wanted to hear that answer. So apologize for going over time, Mayor and Sohi. Yeah. Um, but appreciate that answer. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rice. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Chair. Uh, I would like to start say it's so great to see uh, so many uh, youth and then sit in the chamber and with the yellow t-shirt that is really the team uh, spirit. And also I was so impressed by our two little uh, young <laughs> lady um, speech and that is so inspirational for you to engage to our community and support our community. So I would like to start to say that before I ask a question. Uh, so uh, my first question is uh, to Mr. Kim Glick. Uh, specifically, and then uh, what I heard here is uh, agreement with the cities. Uh, it seems there's some uh, understanding. Um, say, uh, what I heard the concern is a city change that, that agreement and then regarding and to keep this pool open until the new facility is built. So is that the common understanding and for our community say right now city is not following that agreement? So uh, yeah. if you can uh, provide more details on that agreement with sure, the city. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think we felt that when we last defended the pool from being closed, and we've had many meetings with the pool closing and also building Rolly Miles. So they do blend together a little bit, um, like, the, like the stuff about the radius. We've had many talks about how the five kilometer radius needs to alter its size depending on the density of the, uh, the city that, it, that you're creating at the center of that radius. But anyway, the agreement we, we came up with, it, I, I guess in a way I felt like the last time we talked about uh, closing the pool, it was agreed upon by the current council at the time that keeping it going was the right thing to do until the new facility was built, if possible, unless there was some major uh, reason to close it, a safety reason and a huge cost reason. So this is why we feel like that agreement, and I guess you'd have to consult minutes from those meetings and even look at some of the video. I know Ben Henderson uh, was speaking on behalf of us quite passionately, and, and we all felt like, I mean, not that it's a competition, but we, we felt like we won that argument and city council said, yes, you guys are right, let's keep it going, it's worth it. Even though it doesn't necessarily make fiscal sense, it makes sense for the humanity of it. And so we felt like we kind of won that argument. And if you were to come and say, the roof's falling down, it's gonna cost two million to fix it, we would say, okay, you did your best, we understand, it can't stay open. But this is a twenty-five to forty thousand dollar part that has suddenly triggered this closing, and that is what we feel is, is uh, uh, you know, in uh, opposition to the kind of verbal agreement that we came up with in that council meeting. So there was no paperwork signed or anything. That's just what we we all felt was the agreement we had, the consensus of that day, and we all left feeling pretty happy. And now we're we're pretty sad. Okay, thank you. thank you for that uh, information. So the next question, you talk about the 41K uh, as a trigger and for the city to review the condition for this pool. Uh, can you uh, explain a little bit more about, uh, so I, my question is I really want to understand for city to review is to based on uh, some concern, physical condition concerns or is something like you mentioned about that cost 41K. 41,000 uh, as a trigger to for city to review. Um, I guess my question, I can't really answer that. Well, I'll answer it with a question and that is, if this heat exchanger had not failed a few months ago, would we be here? Is that the only thing that, that has caused this pool closure? And it feels like it is. Like all the other stuff that's wrong with it, we know there's lots of things minor wrong with it. And we understand that we're, it's hobbling along. But when, when it, I guess my question would be, and maybe this is something administration could, 
could uh, answer is, if that had never happened, let's say that 65-year-old part still functioned, would we be here today? Or could we still be hobbling along? And why is that small? Like, if you think about, let's say we have spent a million dollars since 2015 on that pool, <coughs> and a lot of people can't understand what that money is, why does this small amount, relatively small amount, pull the trigger on closing it? Because you're, you're saying you've spent hundreds of thousands or 140,000 per year on the pool maintenance. Why is $25,000 suddenly triggering a closure? So that's why we're confused. We don't understand that. <coughs> Thank you, Kim. So, Mr. Mr. Chair, and then my time is up, but I, I do wish to come uh, with other questions. Absolutely, absolutely, Councillor Rice. Uh, I think uh, I can't speak on behalf of the committee, but I do get a sense from Council and colleagues that if this was an issue of forty thousand dollars or sixty thousand dollars or maybe eighty thousand dollars, that we wouldn't be having this discussion to keep it open and we can explore. Then I have I have that question. Maybe I'll start with you, Mr. Mr. Mayor. About uh, are you certain that replacing the uh, uh, this small piece of uh, you know heat exchanger will keep it going? for six months, one year, two years? Yes, because there hasn't been anything else in the last number of years that have, have indicated that the, um, the, the, the pool needs to be shut down. Okay. Um, we, uh, I've, uh, yeah, we, we've been running, just like um, been mentioned, that you know, it's, it's, it's a component that failed. Uh, sometimes components fail. Um, in, in in systems and and you know they have to be replaced. Okay. Um, but so in terms of your your question, Mr. Mayor, um, th yeah, there's there's some minor repairs that that need to be done that that could could improve uh, uh, the building. But um, I don't have a sense or haven't been given the sense being there that there's uh, there's these huge major problems that uh, suddenly um, are glaring. Okay. We'll ask that to uh, our administration about uh, how how their analysis is kind of conflicting to what uh, what you're suggesting uh, on uh, the uh, again. I think uh, we'll seek this clarification uh, came from the administration about the understanding of the community about keeping it open until Rolly Miles uh, is built because. What the report says is that the previous council gave direction to administration to just keep it alive as long as they can and then close it. And we are at a point, according to administration, we are at a point where it needs to be closed. I don't think that commitment was made, but we will definitely need to seek clarification on that because that is different from your understanding. Sorry, just to respond. I, I don't think what you're saying is, I'm not disagreeing with that. Like, it, the, the term until Rolly Miles opens wasn't part of that agreement, okay, okay. but was as long as is possible. Okay. And so we feel okay. that it's still possible to keep it open. And that's, I guess that's the point is, this yeah. is this should not be the killing blow to that yeah. facility. You know, I, yeah. I think we are at a very kind of tough, and I would say regrettable situation where we have to, we have one option, explore, maybe changing the or fixing the uh, heat exchanger that's not huge cost but the other cost is six million dollar minimum to maintain it uh, or to do all the work that administration is recommending to keep it open for the next to 10 years or build or and build rolling miles right I think that's the tough situation that we are we are struggling with right and uh, in in light of deficiencies I mean lack of amenities other parts of the city which we have to also respond to the needs so I think we got to this regrettable situation but we need to figure out a way like what is the so my question maybe this is to uh, 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 to uh, mm, Enrico about that certainty right that certainty about rolling miles like what can we do as a committee or council to give you the comfort uh, even though money is there for to get that project to stage three of the uh, uh, or checkpoint three of the uh, 
uh, the way our city designs infrastructure, but what can we do to give you further certainty that early miles will be built? Can I defer my question to Kim? I think sure. Kim's probably in a better, yeah. Okay, sorry, Kim, go ahead. Yeah, I feel like the, I mean, what a lot of people have said is the gap could mm -hmm. be very problematic for so many people. Yeah. And as we have no horizon for that actually being built, I feel like the keeping the pool open as, as, as many issues as it has is the right thing to do um, and a kind of a responsible thing to do. And as for the millions of dollars, I guess what we are looking for, like if you were to want to close it, we would like to know, well, what is those millions of dollars going towards? Because all we know is that there's that $40,000 heat exchanger. Yeah. Why are these mystery items not being real to us? If they were to say, oh, there's asbestos exposure that's, that's hurting your kids, tell us that. Like, what is it that's, that's causing this problem, you know? Like, I don't think there is a problem, and I just think it's, this, this has triggered this closure, and you're taking all, to, to, no one wants the facility to be put back to some sort of perfect state. Yeah. We yeah. know that. But we will. But if we can limp it along for a few more years, and yeah. so at least Rolly Miles is on the horizon, that would make us at least feel like all this fighting was for something. Yeah, we, will, we will ask those questions to administration, what is, if it can limp along with nominal investment. So we will ask that question to her. Uh, and uh, I'll go to Councillor Rice uh, next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the question to Mr. Jared and Bo Helner. So hopefully I pronounce your last name right. Uh, so, so I think I really appreciate you brought as a point to the value of the uh, volunteer uh, coach based and non-profit organization, how that contribution uh, to the Olympic and then program on high performers and this pool actually contributed. And also you mentioned about the difficult. So my question is, and if uh, city feel it's a time to close this, and then in our report, uh, city administration provided and talk about uh, what the support our city could do and to support the community, to support the school, to support our swimmers, and also the community leagues and coordinate that support. And then, so is there any specific city support and then you are expected? How does that look like? I'll try to answer that question. I'm going to start by correcting you on one thing. Um, I want to draw a distinction between Skona High School swim team and the Olympi Olympian Swim Club. You referred to volunteer coaches. The swim team at Skona has volunteer coaches. We're a nonprofit volunteer led uh, uh, swim team, but we employ a professional swim staff. This shutdown is going to cost our club six jobs. There will be six coaches who are unemployed in two weeks because this pool has been shut down. Um, so our club has about a $1.5 million budget. I, I'm not exaggerating when I say that uh, coming off COVID-19 the, and the loss of uh, uh, Peter Hemingway, of Nate, the recent news that Fountain Park is now shutting down, uh, these things together are going to put us on our knees uh, we pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to the city in other pool rentals and other facilities throughout the year, but our business model is being shattered by this announcement. We've been given one week to, to address it. Um, you know, these are people's jobs that are on the line. This is a club that has existed 50 years um, uh, that has relied on this pool as a big part of our programming. Um, and I think... Uh, a big part of my, my concern, I'm gobsmacked that this is taking place with one week's notice at the end of August, that it's, it's literally on the table to be chopped. I, I, I don't even know how to deal with it as a volunteer. I've been spending every evening this week trying to figure out how our club is going to move forward from this. Um, so I just wanted to make that clarification that we, we might be a volunteer-led organization from a board perspective, but not from a, a coaching perspective. These are real jobs. Um, and okay. the, the problem is more complex than, you know, this is not people who are not going to be able to go to public swim and can just move to 
Kinsman Sports Center or somewhere else to go for a public swim. Okay, uh, thank, I, I thank you. Thank you. I get your answer, and then just to be mindful for my time, yeah. I, I still have another answer to the president's uh, QSL. Um, so, Mr. Rizani, I know, hopefully I'm right. And so, you specifically mentioned about the financial contribution and for the operational model. Uh, so, I will ask the same question back to the administration. And then, did you get opportunity to discuss this contribution with our city? And then, because right now we are faith, we are talking about six million dollars for the continued maintenance to uh, remain open. So, if we could find a opportunity for financial support, so it might be the opportunity for us to look, look explore some options. And so, can you talk about this a little bit more detail? And for that, is it just the thought or is there anything we could explore further? Uh, President uh, Alex Strangia uh, said, yeah, the last, the last Minister year, uh, yeah, Lazaway? Yeah, Lazaway. So I didn't, I didn't have a name in front of me. Enrico, it's to you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, just, I think there's a little bit of a, there's just something a little bit askew with the $6 million. Uh, I just want to go back to what Kim has already mentioned and Mayor Sohi has already mentioned, um, that there's a small component piece. Uh, and I just want to once again emphasize that um, even $6 million, uh, that's, I don't, I just don't think that's the conversation. That's why as a community league, we're sort of struck by why does a $25,000 to $80,000 part that can foreseeably keep the, the space running for a good while? We don't know exactly how long. And, and no, we're not arguing that it's up until, you know, the next thing is open. Um, but what we're really looking for is can we bring the um, into the fall capital budget deliberations? Like, can we bring it this really miles forward? Like, that's the assurance we're looking for. And I think we're looking for you know, we're looking for two bits, 25,000. Okay, thank you so much. Councillor Stevenson. Yes, I, I just want to sort of manage expectations and apologize for uh, any angst that this question will, will cause, but a, a thought has occurred to me. So I think, I think that one of the challenges um, with this city, you know, being owners of this building is that we, we, we are liable for the repairs. Um, it becomes uh, potentially a big risk. Again, not knowing the full, full extent of repairs that might be needed in the future. But Mr. Mayor, is there any capacity if the city funded the repair for this component and then like assigned the ownership of the building over to your organization and we, we would no longer have a, a hand in it? Like is that, a possibility and I don't know that it is a possibility on our end um, obviously this is just a, a fresh idea but just wanted to run that past you for your thoughts I receive a, um, uh, a money money to uh, to provide the uh, um, I don't I don't do infrastructure how's mm -hmm. that yeah. um, that I, I don't have deep pockets I, I, I can't buy a pool, and um, that would mean that um, it becomes a private facility, in a sense. This is a public pool. Mm -hmm. The public, my contract states I have to offer, and I exceed the number of hours I, I um, River City Recreation offers uh, for the, um, uh, for public swim and so forth. So th that that becomes a really big conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think just where my mind is going is that, you know, the city as an organization, as a public body, has to maintain the buildings that we own to, to a certain standard and to quite a high standard mm -hmm. that I think probably exceeds what, what many community groups might might be comfortable with. Um, so wondering if that's a way to, to bridge the gap. Well, in, in this case, uh, then, then we'd have to set up a society. We would probably mm -hmm. have to start uh, doing major fundraising, looking for federal money, provincial money, 
Um, well, uh, but I think, I mean, but the idea is that, like, or not, if your organization that owns this building doesn't feel that some repairs are needed. I, at yeah. this point, I don't, I yeah. don't see any, uh, any need. Um, uh, Mayor so he asked, uh, you know, am I certain about, uh, you know, the availability of a heat exchanger? I have industry partners. Yes, we've we've gone through numbers to uh, to provide four options that uh, that satisfy what's uh, what's required. It can be here in a week, and the city of Edmonton has uh, has staff, has plumbers, has welders, has all the trades that they need that can install this particular. Um, a uh, piece of equipment. They don't have to hire, uh, you know, a, a special um, organization to do that. It can be engineered in house. It can be relatively quick. It, it's it's uh, um, uh, other other areas of uh, uh, that. Uh, um, one, one question was quickly the uh, uh, the one wall. Well, in 2010, uh, repairs were done to to help with that wall and and. Similar repairs and patching can be done at a reasonable cost. Um, uh, fencing was put around uh, that the city owns, you know, owns that fencing to, to you know, to protect uh, uh, from uh, stuff falling. But uh, things have been quartered off, so there is no risk uh, to the public. That is a, a non-accessible area. It is an emergency exit that people can can go through, and things are are made sure to uh, uh, to remain clear uh, in case of that emergency. But that's not an active area along that wall. Yeah. So okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and yeah. Thanks for that. I think uh, we'll have lots of questions for our, our city staff. But thanks again to everyone for for coming out today. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. So, uh, a few more questions. Uh, First of all, I want to let everyone know that, uh, and I can only speak for myself, uh, I intend to bring forward a motion today to uh, uh, have Roly Miles Phase 4 of that project uh, uh, to be considered as part of uh, the, uh, uh, the budget, budget discussion in uh, uh, October, and November, and December when we would debate the rest of the budget. So I'm going to make that motion. Uh, I hope that committee will approve that. Uh, then that gives you some, some certainty that we are serious about Roly Miles uh, during that budget deliberation. Uh, I think, and this is again uh, to uh, Mr. Clegg, I think, I think the difference where I understand in, in the understanding is that if it needs forty thousand dollar repair to improve, uh, to uh, change the uh, replace the uh, heat exchanger. And administration assessment is that's not what is the, the more is needed. What I want to understand from the committee and some from th through you maybe uh, um, speaking on behalf of the community league. Are you still? Would you still push? Even though the, the, your desire would be to keep it open, but if it's going to be six million dollars, is your position will be the same to keep it open? Or will it be different, say, you know, make the regrettable decision of closing but move forward quickly on rolling miles? Yeah, I think that would, that would definitely be our decision. I think it would be hard to say, yes, let's close Skona Pool. But if the promise of the new facility and those monies going towards that new facility, okay. if it did ignite that and make it, because right now it's not real for us. It's, 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 it's a maybe. I know you've moved through many phases, but we still don't know if that could, it could still die, right? Yeah, yeah. And so the more assurances we have, but okay. more importantly, it's the gap. And we are worried okay. about what happens to all those people that need that pool. And because it, it, it will be at least five years before okay. people can swim at rolling okay. miles, even if you approved it immediately. Okay. And so, you know, we would, I mean, and, and as for the money, I mean, you know, as Andrico said, I mean, we could probably chuck some money in to pay for that part. If that's really only what it needs to be, yeah. be safe and to function, yeah. we would, we, and we fundraise, would do that. We yeah. want to help, and we want to work with you okay. on a solution that makes sense to you. Got Obviously, it. $6 million is way too much to throw into Scona Pool. Absolutely, we agree. We just don't know what that num where that number yeah. came from. Okay. So I think we're coming to some common understanding, uh, which is good, and we'll ask that to administration. Is there a way to further explore uh, replacing the uh, heat exchanger and more 
information they'll share through questions from us uh, about the six million dollar cost and if it is six million dollar if you can't see heat exchanger is not the only thing that is broken or will be broken soon and other places are uh, need repair then making that decision okay then we have to make that regrettable decision of closing and put that six million dollar into all the miles okay good thank you so much really really appreciate that uh, uh, okay, so that, any any further questions, uh, colleagues? Okay, so that concludes the questions to uh, uh, to all of you. Thank you so much once again for uh, for uh, coming to make your presentation and sharing your uh, uh, love and uh, the impact of SCONA on your, on your lives. It's okay, good. All right, so we'll go to administration for next for questions. Okay. Please step back and uh, uh, we'll go to the next process. Yeah, well, in the meantime, uh, we are coming close to our uh, uh, break. Uh, we'll be back at 3.45, uh, so we'll make it. We'll, we'll break now. Okay, thanks.
Okay, it is 345 and I would like to call the meeting back to order and do a roll call. Councillor Stevenson. Good afternoon. Councillor Knack. Good afternoon. Councillor Rice. Here. Councillor Rutherford. Good afternoon. And I will check if there are other council members joining us. Oops. Councillor Wright, you there? Yes, I am. Good afternoon. Yeah. Councillor Prince Pay. Hello. Councillor Cartmel. Hi there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, before I go to Councillor Knack, uh, want to go to our administration. You can use my five minutes to. Uh, respond to some of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, input that we heard from, uh, from, the, uh, from the presentations from the public? Uh, happy to, Mr. Mayor, and, and with me today is Pascal Lavasseur, our branch manager in IIS on, uh, on the life cycle management side, Eddie Robar, our branch manager of Fleet and Facility Services, uh, and Judith Rahobi, and I apologize, um, uh, Tim Harris uh, from Community Services around the operations. So uh, thanks for the opportunity, Mr. Mayor, and do appreciate the folks coming out to speak. And I just wanted to touch on a few things. There's been um, suggestions made that this is a two-week closure. It is not. Uh, if, if we go forward with the closure, we're required to uh, provide a 30 days notice, and we would do uh, everything to uh, make sure that that's extended as possible based on the current operating approach that we have um, to run the facility. In addition to that, our folks in community services would work very closely with the different groups within the facility to uh, ensure that we do our best to find options for them in terms of different spaces in city facilities and non-city facilities. That's the extent that they're going to go to to make sure that we do our best to accommodate. Um, back to 2015 when the decision was made, uh, our concern was that it would be um, a facility that would require uh, closure quicker than the time frame that we're at right now. And in, at that point in time, we, we anticipated that it could be a two-year decision. Through the hard work of city administration and working with the the operating partner and, and obviously the community, uh, this has been extended significantly from what the original anticipated closure date was. I referenced in my opening comments, it's in the report, it's been significant investment in this facility to keep it going. But throughout those seven years, we have regularly checked in on the facility to confirm the condition. And if this was just a heat exchanger issue, uh, we wouldn't be having a uh, report in front of council uh, a discussion about this today. Um, whether it's 25,000, 120,000, a decision like that wouldn't um, uh, prevent us from uh, continuing the operations. In April, we started to see a uh, concerning situation with the, the uh, wall that is falling, uh, concerns with the roof, concerns with uh, the interior and exterior envelope of the facility. All of those uh, prompted us to undertake the latest condition assessment. That latest condition assessment identified a significant investment required, minimum $6 million, in order to prolong the life of the facility for five to 10 years. So I wish this was about a part replacement, but rather it's the cumulative uh, repairs that are required to extend the life of the facility. From a holistic asset management perspective, we need to consider that. An investment of $6 million in this facility where previous direction had been provided to um, not um, uh, renew it to the same level as other facilities because there would be a future replacement facility puts at risk a number of other facilities that would um, not be renewed um, in place of the renewal requirements for SCONA. And in saying that, 
that six million dollar investment would uh, give us five to ten years of life. Uh, so it's a tough decision. We, we, we really empathize with the uh, concerns raised by community, but for the reasons that I mentioned in my opening comments, when you look at the holistic investment required, the future uh, commitment to Rolly Miles, uh, the proximity of other facilities, understanding that it isn't what they have today, uh, the investment uh, required in the renewal of other city assets of which we have over 900 um, this is the tough decision today again we don't make these decisions lightly the in the assessment was completed by an engineering firm and and the level of repair required to safely and reliably operate the facility is significant again if it were just the heat exchanger that work would have already happened. Specifically on the heat exchanger, if we get to that level of question, um, the, the heat exchangers that have been discussed with the operator and our folks in engineering services um, identify um, capacity requirements. And I just want to uh, clarify that the $40,000 option provides a capacity that is 7% of the required capacity for the heat exchanger for this pool. What that means is that it would take days to heat the pool, not the necessary hours to have um, appropriate pool operations. Again, if this were just the heat exchanger, we'd be having a different conversation. Well, I suspect we wouldn't be having this conversation, but in April, we, we started down the path to confirm the more significant issues that are realized in this facility. Thank you so much for that, uh, recapping that uh, input from the, uh, or responding to that input from the community members. I'll go to Councillor Nack. Thank you, Mayor Sovi, and, and thanks for that additional information. That was helpful. I assume to be here if this was just a heat exchanger piece, because uh, I thought that would have been your delegated authority. So I do want to ask, and, and I don't know how far down this path we can go uh, uh, without uh, without going into private, but what is the legal risk of those other items that you have raised? You've raised issues about walls, ceilings. Um, so I, I imagine there is a, a legal conversation to be had about how close those are to, you know, falling down, you know, breaking, breaking apart. W what does that look like? I would say, Councillor Knack, without uh, in the in the public session, I I can say uh, very very clearly that the risk of injury and the risk to the city is 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 very very high. So I think um, you know, depending upon where council goes, if if we want to get into that conversation a little bit more depth, we can go in private. Uh, but that would be uh, my summary position. And so that is where the report, Mr. Lachlan, comes in to suggest you're, you're looking at approximately $6 million because we are not just having to do the heat exchanger. You would need to take all of these items, which you've identified essentially as a high legal risk to the city that now need to be addressed if you're going to go in and do that work. That's correct. From our perspective, if there was a decision to extend the life, we would need to allocate $6 million and we would begin immediately plans to complete the, the renewal needs that are identified within the report. Did you, and I'm sure you did, but just, I think it is fair to ask, you know, it, was there a, uh, you know, the, the $3 million option, which took care of all the highest risk legal issues, but left us with a medium risk issue somewhere else that we could have said, eh, you know, not great, but maybe we'd be willing to accept that level of risk. Ms. Latticer can speak to this in more detail, but when we do our condition sure. assessments, we identify timeframes where uh, a particular item needs to be addressed. The items that we've identified in the report are all within the one to two year time frame. Pascal. Oh, that's good enough. That that that's answers that. Um, so then the other question is, you know, I know we've had some uh, work done on some of our other older pools in the last number of years. Um, 
those projects, I think about Jasper Place, I think about Peter Hammond, they, they have taken much longer than expected because once we opened up the wall or you know did certain things, um, those projects turned into substantial longer projects. So what I'm wondering about is that of this six million dollar work, does that does that involve us doing not the same work? Clearly, I realize we're not talking about the same body of work we did in those, but in terms of opening up the walls and potentially having to then deal with asbestos, as an example, like we dealt with in Jasper Place, is that the is that why there's this uncertainty? Would we actually have to close down the facility for these six million dollar uh, six million dollar worth of work? So I'll work backwards. To complete sure. this work, we would have to close the facility. Our yeah. concern, and we put it in the report, this is a minimum $6 million investment yeah. for the very reason of the experience with other facilities when we go into Renew of a similar age and, and use that you can only do so much in terms of testing and destructive testing before going into and, and design before going into start the renewal. Um, and and we find many unforeseens, uh, which we, we've been working to try and improve as we go into these facilities, but um, they But it's are, happening in all of our pools. I mean, correct. quite simply, pools of this age or older are having that happen that's every correct. time you open it up. So we would anticipate asbestos, we would anticipate structural issues, we would anticipate uh, electrical issues, we would anticipate mechanical system issues. Uh, to the, the degree that we've experienced in other facilities, which is why we identify this $6 million as a minimum. Right. Last question for you in my last few seconds is that because of my experience with Jasper Place and going through that um, nightmare, <laughs> I think, and not nightmare because of your work, but nightmare just generally took a long time, it, it would seem to me that if you're going to be doing this type of work, we're talking about a two or three or four year closure to do this. Is that fair? Because that's how long it took us to do in these other spots. Uh, Councillor Nack, uh, in this case, we would be looking at um, a less extensive renovation and renewal, but uh, absolutely it's, as Mr. Lachlan was explaining, it's really hard to predict once we start when we finish. Uh, we would have expected this uh, closure to be potentially uh, shorter but really uncertain given what we're the age of the building and what will the unknown that we would be dealing with. Thank you, I'm out of time. Thank you, Councillor Nack. And I would uh, humbly request council members to leave a little bit of time at the end of five minutes so administration can answer that que your question, last question, sorry. Uh, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The first question I would like to say, uh, to do some comparison. Uh, to for the new facility we were under plan to build replace this one. So how much total cost for that one could be? Well, we're in design, so we're yeah. not at checkpoint three yet. And that's when we would have a definitive cost estimate for this facility. Design is underway, and so we're not at a point yet where we would have a definitive cost. Uh, so average uh, speaking, and based on the past experience, we build a swimming pool and a recreation center, how much cost could be? So uh, again, this is conceptual. Uh, I, wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't bank on this being the estimate because we're still in design. Okay. Order of magnitude, $80 million. Two billion. 80 million. 80, 80 billion, okay. Uh, and also, for the project timeline, and that I heard because Rhino is uncertain how much time it could take and to renew this. And then if we look at the new project timeline and how many years could it take us to build that recreation center? Councillor Rice, uh, we are currently in design and we expect to reach checkpoint three by the end of 2023 or early into 2024. And if council was to fund the project at that point, it could be in service. So the new pool could be in service by 2020, in 2027, 2028. 2028 or 2027. Okay, so that's uh, shorter than I expect to build a recruiting center, including swimming pool. 
Um, that's first question. And then the second question that I heard uh, my colleague mentioned the legal uh, risk. But that legal risk only happened if we didn't do any renew work. Uh, if we do renew work, we address the issues what needs to be repaired. So that risk will be reduced. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I would say, Councillor, um, at the min, what we've heard from the team is that a minimum of six million dollars would need to be spent. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, if if you want, if council wants to spend that that kind of dollars to address the all of the issues, then yes, our legal risk would be managed. Yes, uh, but there's no doubt about it that it, yeah. it's not a patchwork kind of kind of okay. approach. Uh, thank you for that. That is, I just want to confirm. And also for the uh, six million dollars, I understand is the minimum. And where is the funding source for this six million dollars come from? And it's for Lakes budget or already existing included in our renew program budget? So again, we wouldn't recommend investing six million dollars in this facility. We do not recommend investing six million dollars in the faci facility on the basis of of other facilities that would um, require that renewal investment yeah. that... Uh, is that $6 million already exist or we have no. to invest from next year budget, Correct. next four years budget? Council would have to allocate that out of the renewal program and Ms. Latticer has a list of, of potential projects that we wouldn't do if council identified um, Okay, from next from year from budget. The... Okay, I, I just need that answer. And then from Lake's new budget, not for, from existing budget. Uh, Lake's question, an inflex. Can I clarify? Yes, please. If, if council made a decision that they wanted to extend the life of the facility, we would need that direction immediately in order to advance the necessary design to uh, build the facility. So essentially it would be earmarking the six million dollars out of the twenty-three to twenty-six, but we would need that direction. We feel immediately in order to undertake okay. these repair efforts. Does that mean we have to put the motion and to bring on funding the package for that piece? And what type of direction you need? No, uh, administration is pursuing uh, the path that was set uh, based on previous council that this facility would close when we've reached a, a point where. It requires significant repairs. If council's direction is contrary to that, we feel we would need direction today or immediately next council meeting to allocate the funding to undertake the necessary renewal. To, um, to allocate that funding, do you need the unfunding the package or you need the funding the package to al allocate that funding? What I'm saying is there's a decision point for council to um, extend the life of the facility or not. If the decision is to extend the life of the facility, we can subsequently okay. so need... So I, I get it now. It's about the... Uh, oh, and <laughs> my time is out. Okay. So they remind me. So I will come back yeah, to finish please, my question. Yeah, come back Thank for you. a second round. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks, uh, thanks for the additional context and information. You know, I was surprised to hear that so there's an area that's been fenced off to uh, prevent a, a wall from collapsing or bricks falling off of that. Yeah, that seems pretty significant. That's correct. Um, the other part of the assessment, and Pascal can speak to this, we've, we're recommending actually closing the patio area if the facility continues to operate. Maybe you can speak in more detail to that. Yeah, so the, um, there's existing fencing around the exterior wall. Uh, we've recently added uh, some overhead protection to the staff door uh, due to uh, the, um, the, the issues with the brick kind of um, deteriorating and uh, going into the other walls around the facility. And so the latest assessment, uh, if, we, um, if we do continue to operate, we would be looking at closing the patio immediately and uh, taking additional um, measures to monitor the situation around the, um, the facility. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. I, I appreciate the contextualization of the, the heat exchange for within those other, other costs. 
Again, maybe could you just speak briefly to that that 1.15 million that was referenced in the report? And I, I think just in terms of highlighting how these costs can accumulate quite quickly. Yeah, certainly. I think um, from the maintenance perspective, we spend on average about 81,000 to upwards of $285,000 uh, per year on the facility. So in aggregate over the past eight years, that's kind of the low end and the top end of what we've spent. We do shutdowns every every few years. Those shutdowns are obviously more expensive years that we have. Uh, but just to give you some context, just to descale the boiler in that facility, it's a $60,000 bill. Mm -hmm. So the, the cost adds up quite quickly when you look at, at a shutdown of a facility and draining the pool is the $35,000 bill. So, and, and there's a multitude, there's 34 different things that we do through the, the, through the maintenance package uh, year over year. So that's just a couple of contexts and nuggets of, of some expenses that okay. we, we incur. So that's but not even, that's not like a, a major capital repair or anything like that. That's just kind of the ongoing right. keeping things right. And, and of that, okay. of that 1.1 million, uh, 600,000 of that is unplanned repairs. Okay. And, um, and that's over and above the, I think 330,000 uh, operating that was noted in the report. So the operating agreement. Correct. Okay. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Um, and just, just to clarify as well, just to make clear that these operating costs, um, these ongoing maintenance costs, those would exceed what we would see in other facilities. So it, it is our, our comparable facilities, it is higher than other facilities, but it's close to the same um, cost. But when you put that in context of we're not putting the same level of maintenance into this facility that we put in the other facilities to keep it up to a certain standard, um, it's, it's an exponential cost. The maintenance investment has been on the basis of the 2015 decision of to um, carry it as long as possible. If, if it were to uh, maintain the facility indefinitely, those maintenance costs would be significantly higher. Yeah, we would have dealt with the building envelope issues, all the stuff that we're talking about here yeah, today. Yeah, and then just just to that thought again, I know I know the city city has, you know, an obligation um, and also desire to maintain uh, really excellent facilities. Community groups may be happier with less. Do you think that there is? a viable option where the community can assume responsibility for the building, recognizing it will run to ruin, like not for them to repair or upgrade it, but to run to ruin at, at, at their discretion, I guess, rather than ours. It's, um, it's a facility that's on school board land, uh, and one of the speakers spoke to who owns, that's still not clear. Um, that liability would then be a public school board decision. Mm -hmm. And just from a, from a liability perspective, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if an organization would, would uh, uh, take on that risk. Uh, the reason we're here with this information is because we feel the risk is imminent. Well, and, and, and Councillor, if I may add to that, the city cannot offload completely its potential liability in a situation like this. We, we would be sued. We would be brought in uh, if someone was injured. Uh, we are aware of the ill, you know, the, the, the state of this building. And with that awareness, we carry a very big risk of liability. And we will continue to. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. So I had my five minutes at the start, and I'll go to Councillor, oh, sorry, Councillor Rutherford, you signed on. Go ahead, Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I don't actually have any questions at this time, but I've heard enough to move uh, receipt of information of this report. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. So we have a motion on the floor, but we can continue to ask questions uh, to administration on the broader report or what we heard from public speakers. Uh, yeah, and I won't speak to introduce this motion. I think yeah. it's pretty clear, but I would like to speak to close. Yes, of course, yes. of course, of course. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Uh, Councillor Cartmill. Thank you, Mayor Sophie. So, uh, Mr. Lockman, I just I just want to go back through a couple of your answers to uh, Mayor Sohi's question to start this session. Uh, it, it sounds like uh, that administration became aware of the boiler failure 
uh, and understood that that was going to be, you know, a, a cost and, and have its own complications. But then that triggered essentially a, a building review to see what else was, you know, essentially to see the status of the root of the building. Is, is that right? Do I have that right? Actually, it's a little bit reverse and apologies if I wasn't clear. It was in April that we noticed uh, through, through our regular inspections that we noticed uh, additional concerns related to the, the curtain wall of the facility and initiated uh, a more detailed uh, condition assessment. That was in April. The uh, heat exchanger um, failed in June and the finalized condition assessment or, or the completed condition of assessment report was in July. Uh, and as I said earlier, uh, if this was just the heat exchanger, yeah. we would have advanced that repair. Yeah. So it sounds like then the, the review that was done in April um, heightened our concern about the the status of the structure. Right? That what we might have talked about two years ago, three years ago, uh, had accelerated to the point of of I'm I'm hearing some grave concern uh, as you provide your your comments. We are. Is that yeah? So there's there's no um, there's no limping along here. Uh, again, from your earlier comment, if 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 there's any inkling at all that we're going to continue to use this building, we have to get into repairs uh, immediately. There's no delay. There's no uh, nursing it along. There's no patch the roof and block a window. It we need to get on with getting on. That's correct. We would actually those very things that you mentioned. We would actually start doing those things while continuing the design around the five to 10 year um, renewal requirements because there are those imminent things that you just mentioned, patching um, areas of the roof that are immediate need, um, uh, curtailing some of the spalling wall. We would actually undertake some of that work immediately because of the risk while we're still doing the design on the other repairs. So this was based, this was essentially a visual review not a not a destructive review of any kind. There was no testing or anything done. Essentially, it was uh, with an educated eye, having consultants walk through the building and identify uh, areas of distress. Do I have that right? Uh, that's correct, Councillor. I would add that um, we have a lot of historical information, and it's also re been reviewed on the level of deterioration we see uh, from uh, our monitoring programs. Do we know if the tank is cracked? If the if the actual pool structure is cracked or, or deficient or were we able to see that? At this time, we are aware of water leaking into the basement, but it appears that it might be coming from the envelope itself and not the pool basin. Uh, so further analysis would be required to understand exactly where the water infiltration is coming from. But if it were the tank, that would be a significant cost. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm uh, just going to the report then. I'll try to be quick with these. Uh, it says in the report that um, funding is in place to the completion of development design. That's not to checkpoint three. It's sort of to checkpoint two and a half, or am I wrong on that? Checkpoint three. Checkpoint three? But that's not shovel ready at that point. No, we would need to... Uh, checkpoint three is the decision point for council to invest in the larger capital cost, which is the continuation of design and construction. Do you, again, ballpark figures, $80 million more or less for the rec center. Do you have a, a, a sense of what the cost would be to advance to the, to essentially to make it shovel ready to complete the design? Ballpark, not holding you to it, but kind of round number. Another four to five million dollars. So almost as much as it would be to keep Skona Pool going for five years. Correct. Thank you. Those are my questions. Yeah, thank you, Council Cartmel, and also uh, for the benefit of the uh, uh, the public. Uh, I did uh, say that I'm going to make a motion on uh, having this discussion at budget. I just want to let you know that motion is not required because your ward councillor, Councillor Jans, already made such a motion on uh, May 16th, right? So uh, it will come to discussion uh, uh, for council during the budget. So I just want you to know that your ward councillors has been already foreseen the, 
that having that discussion and uh, advancing more resources through council discussion for the rolling miles. Okay, uh, and I'll go to councillor Wright next. Councillor Wright, you are on mute. Thank you. Um, just a couple questions around the contract. In the report, it says it's three to five year. Is which is it? I, I don't. I didn't quite understand that. I, I believe it's a three-year agreement with two one-year extensions. Oh, okay. Thank you. And I'm just because I was just wondering: does the, does the compensation we have to provide them? Um, like, is that, is that relevant to what the compensation would be? Like, is there a, do we have to sort of pay out their whole contract? Uh, no, there's a 30 day payment that would be required uh, once we decide to, to close the building and terminate the contract. Okay, and, the, and is there sufficient funds available to cover that 30 day payment? Yes, there is. Okay, okay, so we don't need any further funding here. Um, and then I'm just wondering about the staff that are at the pool. They aren't they aren't city of Edmonton employees. They are they're hired by the, the River City Recreation, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Um it can can any accommodation or any help be provided to assist them and yeah, absolutely. That's a really good question. We've got um, the ability to hire onto a 90 day ticket or any of the lifeguards. So they would be able to, they'd already have their qualifications. So we could immediately bring any lifeguards over. Uh, instructors, it'd be a little bit more complicated because they teach a different set of courses than we do up till January. Um, but we would definitely work to them with them to see if they have the qualifications to immediately come over and, and start working for the city. Okay. Okay. That's great. That's all I. That's all I need to know. Thank you. And we've been short in that area as well, right? Because we've been having difficulty hiring people. Yeah, absolutely. Like We're that. definitely short yeah. in the lifeguards uh, and instructors, both worlds. Got it. Sure. Okay. All right. So for second round, I'll go to Councillor Rice. Go ahead, okay. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Ms. Mayor. Uh, my first question is, if this motion on the floor received as information, uh, it's my understanding that means uh, we, we are continue to go in uh, the decision already made to close this pool, right? That's correct. This is, uh, again, based on previous direction. Administration um, was empowered to make this decision, but based on the scale of it, we needed to make sure that council uh, was aware of that. So if that is the case, that means and they save the information and then means uh, the pool will be closed in one, two months or several months or one year or? As Mr. Harris said, we would provide 30 days notice. And then from a, um, uh, the method in which we're currently providing support to operate the facility, we would carry that as long as we could. There are some temperature, outside temperature reasons why we would uh, eventually have to close. Okay, so that's Perfect. Thank you for that. So, is there any plan and for the site if we are going to close this uh, swimming pool and for that site, is there any further plan how city will leverage that site or any future uh, infrastructure capital project will come on that site as well? So, since the pool is actually on school board land, uh, we would be looking to work with them to decouple, decommission and uh, turn that over back to the school board. So then what's the cost could be for all this closure process, and then including deep, uh, demination and everything like that? That is something that we will have to uh, work out uh, following uh, the decision on closure, and uh, we, have, we will be doing that work along with the Rolly Miles design, uh, since we have the same partners and we're looking at uh, what that would look like and what the timing would be. So is that fair to say for the costs to close this pool and uh, to make the uh, all this building done and it will cost over a million dollars and it will come from the next 2023-26 uh, budget as well? We, we don't know at this point in time in terms of the cost. Uh, as Pascal said, we would leverage the existing um, engineering and consulting uh, architectural teams that are carrying out the work on Rolly Miles to develop an estimate for that. And if there is a, a, a budget need that can't be um, 
uh, accommodated under administration's delegation, it would be part of budget discussions uh, um, in 23 to 26. So this is another concern I have to pass this motion on the floor. And if we don't know how much money cost to close and then how we can make decision and because based on that six million dollars to renew and then to close the pool. Uh, so I just uh, continue my question. Uh, I have another question is about, um, uh, back to my first question, uh, I asked the community as well uh, opportunity to explore some financial strategy and to accommodate accommodate the six million dollars and also the possible future cost uh, for the maintenance for the renew so did we uh, do this type of uh, consultation or did we engage the community to have this type of meaningful conversation uh, I heard they're willing to do all the fundraising everything like that So as it relates to Skona Pool, uh, there hasn't been engagement because back to 2015, the decision was made to um, move away from Skona Pool in place rolling miles. In saying that, there's been a number of council reports or committee reports related to the different opportunities to fund rolling miles outside of the normal budget process. And that included uh, uh, tax, opportunities within a localized area, sort of a community version of a, of a CRL, um, looking at different fundraising opportunities. Um, we don't have that information at hand, but we can certainly share those reports with you previously. But to be clear, we haven't engaged in discussions around the extension of Skona Pool because, because the decision was yeah. made to move away from it. Okay, uh, so that means that means the decision, if we need to change that decision, the decision uh, needs to be made is about should we extend the life cycle or should not. So it's not a budget decision, right? It's both. Okay. So if the decision is to extend the life of the facility, we would need clear direction from council that at minimum, six million will be allocated for us to undertake the renewal requirements. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, thank you. Um, just speaking to the timing, so I, I hear there's the 30-day notice. Um, you know, I just this is this is on behalf of Councillor Jans as well, who who texted me this question um, earlier in the day. But is there are there any options that would allow the facility to close out the swim season? So now until December. Uh, I I would I would say based on on weather conditions, I would say no. And to explain, when the heat exchang exchanger went down, our folks um, creatively went down the path of pumping in domestic hot water to keep the pool at the appropriate temperature. When the outside temperature reaches a point where that no longer is possible, then it becomes very difficult to heat the pool without that heat exchanger. Um, so, I think our approach would be to uh, carry out those operations as long as we could based on the ambient outside temperature as it relates to the interior pool temperature. Right, which which creates a challenge just in terms of the certainty for the teams and, and their planning around the season. Correct, but a commitment and certainly um, Mr. Harris or Mr. Miss, Miss Rehovi could, could uh, comment on this with a commitment to look at every option, um, both city-owned facilities and non-city-owned facilities to accommodate the current needs. And I don't know if they'd like to speak to that. Yeah, and, and the city would, would work collaboratively with the SCONA groups, and we'd be looking at where we can get them into other city facilities as well as other non-city facilities, such as the U of A and some of those other ones. Um, understanding that likely that would mean a decreasing family swim time or spontaneous use at some of the other pools if we're going to expand what the rental opportunities are. Yeah, I mean, that's that's an important um, counterpoint or implication, I guess, of looking looking for that. So I appreciate you, you flagging it. Um, also wondering what 
opportunities there are to to celebrate and commemorate the space in terms of programming, um, having our historical team, you know, this, you know, what I heard so clearly is that this is such a, a special and exceptional uh, facility for so many people. So just wondering if there are thoughts um, about how we how we commemorate that, how we recognize that and, and provide opportunity for gathering and celebration around that. Uh, public engagement on Rowley Miles is, is about to get underway or the next phase of public engagement. Uh, I think that's a takeaway for us, Councillor Stevenson, to see what opportunities could uh, we, we could provide to celebrate um, and certainly work with other parties in the city to, to see what we could do. But Great. there's an opportunity to link it to some of the the engagement that's upcoming related to Rowley Miles. Great, and I and I should give credit again to, to Councillor Jans for for reflecting on that and and trying to find um, an approach forward. Okay, well I think I think that is all my questions. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mayor So Hughes. Just a few more questions. Uh, Rowley Miles, where does that fall in our current prioritization list? Um, I think based on the checkpoint it's at, I think it's sort of next in line. Is that right? From a rec facility perspective, yes. Yeah, from our rec, yeah. it's next in line, right? I, I would want to clarify though, from a rec facility perspective. Yes, from a rec facility perspective, when correct. You, when you look at the broader priorities, um, that's, work, Absolutely. that's work that's underway yeah, and then it becomes uh, sort of comparative priority, so to speak. Without a doubt, I just wanted to make sure that was my understanding. And so, you know, council will have the debates about our overall priorities, but to know that this is top of that list is important. The only other question I have, um, you know, appreciate that, and I'll speak to it at the appropriate time, but I, it feels like we're in this direction, closure, but um, with the amount of money we spend every year on maintenance, I'm curious, you know, is one of the things we will look at you know, maybe taking some of that and using that funding to provide a transit solution to one of the nearby recreation facilities. I don't know if that's an on-demand or if it's a special bus route that gets to those locations for those residents, because this is an area that I think it's at least 50 percent of residents do uh, walk or bike to their primary mode or walk, bike and take transit as their primary mode. So we, we have to recognize the reality. they face. So is that something we could look at as a creative way to try to connect residents to other recreation options? I just spoke with Mr. Robar, uh, not his portfolio, but connected to city yeah. operations and I think it's something that we can explore um, around accommodation. I think one of the things we'd have to consider, Councillor Knack, is just the work that community services would need to go through around accommodation of existing users at what facilities, uh, what whichever facilities they are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that that needs to be done in tandem. I just I think we do need to really reflect on the ease of access for residents in this area to, to other places. And and so that's it's good to hear that we would we would consider that. I think we're, you know, if we're essentially going to save money, I'd rather see if we can use some of that money to to reinvest in the community in the short term while we figure out the, uh, the bigger body of work. OK, uh, thank you. Those are all my questions. Thank you, Councillor Neck. So, few questions on the uh, the assessment that was done in April, or com com completed in July. Started in April. Yeah, and completed, yeah in July. completed in July. Is that not public? That assessment. We we don't typically uh, share engineering reports publicly. But is there any harm to share that publicly so that community has some? understanding that this is really the situation, right? And we can deal with that different point of views that we have on whether it's $40,000 $40, 40, $40, problem or is it a $6 million problem? Yeah, I think I think part of, of what we can do is articulate the concerns. I have to take that back and think about that, uh, Mayor Sohi, because okay. That is not something that we typically do. Yeah. It's a if, level of granularity and, yeah, and that, detail. If, there, if there's no legal risk, right? We are not talking about uh, information that is uh, confidential. 
I think it will be good transparent way of sharing information with the with the community. Okay. So if that is possible, then maybe I don't know if our legal uh, folks have any opinion on that. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I, I think we'd need to look at it from that perspective. Um, there could be a privacy perspective, so I think okay. we have to have uh, all of those pieces in mind uh, when we when we review that report. Okay. Another question I have: If we were to make the decision to invest six million dollars or more, depending on the need, how long will it take to? bring the pool into good condition and how would how long would it have to be closed it's really hard to say at this point in time um has mr mr lachlan explained there are some immediate repairs that we would be looking to undertake and then we would lo look to hire the necessary consulting team to start the design uh, and so timelines are are really hard to pinpoint um likely with considering the um the, the extent of the work, uh, we would be looking at significant closure. So it's a six month, one year, two years. Yes. It's really hard to say. I, I, I would say at least a year and then uh, we would okay. have to go from there. Okay. Um, and when that would happen would depend as to when we're ready. Because right? what, what I'm trying to understand is that the new facility, if it's approved, will come on board in five to six years, right? And if that's we were right. to close for repairs, that's about a year. So community will be without a pool for one year in that one scenario and five years in a, another scenario. Just that that's why I'm, what I'm trying to understand. The, uh, on the work to be done for demolition, and that work would have to be done anyways, whether we do that now or whether we do that when Rolly Miles is built and this facility is closed. That's correct. It's included in the Rolly Miles project. Okay, so that so to Councillor Rice's question, it's not it, you're not going to save money by continue to have the facility open because that money would be required at some point, right? So, okay, uh, on Rolly Miles, why would this be considered a growth project, right? When it's a it's a, a a certain uh, replacement of an existing facility, even though with additional facility uh, amenities added to it. That that's why, Mr. Mayor, it's it's uh, if it were a like for like pool, it would be a a pool built to uh, a previous standard. Um, so it's considered growth because it is a uh, a new facility. Yeah, I. Uh, maybe we need to have further discussion on that in in, in different form uh, for, format, right? Sorry, uh, but I I raises flags for me because then because it's growth and we have so many renewal needs and we have replacement needs, right? If community already has an amenity and we don't replace that because it is grow it goes into growth category where there's less emphasis on. Uh, on putting resources because we need to main, maintain what we have. Just trying to grapple with that, yeah, that, I, that question. I, I, I think regardless of whether we call it growth renewal, um, the dollars allocated to renewal, this project would yeah. consume... Maybe some other time on that. Okay. Two-thirds of yeah. or yeah. a third of what we have for available funding yeah. potentially. So what I hear from you that there's no possibility of having that this cannot limp along right based on the latest condition assessment no okay and with, there's a liability with, issues without investing. without six million dollar minimum Correct. investment okay 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 so that concludes the questions any further questions from colleagues or uh, sorry colleagues uh, so that is it we have a motion on the floor and at this time anybody wants to speak to the motion on the floor to speak councillor rice please start uh thank you mr mr mayor 
So I would like to start say, I will not support to close this pool. So f the reason for this, and I don't believe we should pursue close the pool without clear planning and including understand how much cost could be for close the pool. That is the first reason. And we don't have that analysis, detail analysis in place. Uh, the second from usage experience and usage uh, perspective. I would like to say this is the pool and then in among many pools our city operated is the strongest use tied together and community-based use the pool that create the environment we can bring our city's future use together and for that. And why we need stop doing that. And specifically, another point I would like to see, uh, from South Edmond perspective, in my world, we don't have recruiting center, we don't have swimming pool. Lots of residents in my world from South Edmonton use this pool. And then even though and the city uh, is doing really great job and hard working, try to balance the recruiting center and across different worlds. But from the timeline perspective, this pool still required and for many users and from South Edmonton. And based on what I heard from South Edmonton and the many residents in my world want the pool, want this pool to be keep open, want to use this. And then to me, we're talking about the city plan, we're talking about five kilometers driving, we're talking about 15 minutes community. And this is actually aligned with that, the goal, that picture our city is painting and for our residents and why we cannot support this alignment. So the second reason, the third reason is uncertainty. Uh, yes, Ward Councilor Jens brought the motion and for the another replacement and for the new recreation center and in the world. But that's based on what I heard from city administration that is right now is uh, current in checking point two, still not uncertain for moving forward with so many requirements for the new budget cycle pri prioritizing. And because with a larger huge amount capital request, we don't know how that will go. So that is uncertainty. We cannot provide that guarantee to our community and to our school as well. Uh, also, I, I wanted to do some like time timeline comparison. And so for the new uh, recruiting center for building and cast that huge capital investment will take a larger five to six in on schedule, in project on schedule, on budget, and otherwise will take even longer and based on the past experience. But for this, for keep this open to extend the time cycle and to, by invest more than $6 million and with the willingness our community would like to contribute will extend our life cycle for another five to 10 years. And then I think this is basic mathematics questions. And then I don't, say the reason why we reject uh, to the community's request to extend the life cycle as well. Uh, I think that's my key points, so I'm not going to support uh, this motion on the floor. So in for this motion failed, uh, I would like to put subsequent motion to extend the life cycle and for this facility. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thanks, Mr. Mayor. This is uh, not an easy decision, and it's uh, not easy for anyone, uh, anyone here at all. Um, I think about uh, the the time that I spent uh, at at a local pool in my community, the uh, Jewish Community Center pool in Rio Terrace, uh, and all the memories I had there. Um, and that pool eventually eventually closed as well, and. 
uh, it's hard. It's hard because we do create so many memories there. And what what came through to me in hearing from the speakers, you know, wasn't just the the building and the memories, uh, but just the phenomenal community that you've created within that facility. Um, and that's something that you can take with you. That I think that no matter what happens uh, to the pool. Um, that that community that you forged, that approach that you've uh, created will go with you, it won't be left behind. And I actually think that the inclusive programming that you've, that you've um, championed, the no-cut policy, I mean, what a wonderful thing to take to other, other facilities across the city. So as, as difficult as this is, I, I do think that um, part of transforming our city, part of building towards the future that we want to see is about not only starting some things, um, but but stopping others. And, and unfortunately, I think this is an example where we are uh, not able to sustainably continue investing in this facility, recognizing that that, that takes away from our opportunities to, to build a newer, uh, more environmentally friendly, more financially sustainable facility for more Edmonton, Edmontonians to enjoy. So I will be supporting this motion, but again, really appreciate all the speakers coming out today and, and for all the wonderful work you do in that pool. Thank you. And thanks to administration as well. Also not a very easy conversation for you. Um, and appreciate your stewardship of, uh, of our city assets. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rutherford? I have to close. Oh, Mayor. Sorry, yeah, right, okay. Councillor. Some, thank you for reminding me that, uh, Councillor Knack. Thanks, Mayor Sohi. This, um, this is really, well, I mean, incredibly challenging because I thought it was as simple because based off how I read the report, I thought it might have been as simple as a heat exchanger, and if that was the case, and that was going to get us another, even if it was like another year or two, like great, like, just do it. Let's do what we need to do to keep that afloat. But we've heard today that we, with the other things that need to be addressed, there is now a high risk to the users of that facility um, for their safety. And I don't think there's any reasonable way to say I'm okay with a high risk. You know, even if there was a medium risk, I might... I might be willing to say, like, let's figure out a way, you know, put some, figure out just something that lets us keep it going. But to put folks at a high risk of their safety, um, I, I, I can't, I can't approve that. Um, there's just no good way I could do that in, in good conscience to, to do that. Um, and, and the challenge, and I appreciate, you know, Councillor Rice's point earlier, but I mean, even if we did the 6 million piece, and I'm going to come to that in a moment, we're still going to ultimately have to demolish it when Rolly Miles is built. So like the, the cost to demolish, that's not, a, that, that'll be a, a cost today or a cost five years from now. So that, that to me is, is, is a neutral sort of cost because you're facing it no matter when. I think the unfortunate experience from Japs Replace Pool and I think now Peter Hemingway Pool at this stage, uh, because that pool is now also behind schedule in a pretty substantial way, I believe. Um, it's not in the ward I represent, but it's across the street from the ward I represent. Um, this is now two pools of similar age to this, probably slightly newer than, than, this, than this particular pool. Uh, when we started doing that type of work, that rehabilitation work, those projects went from, you know, a couple of years to a couple of years on top of those couple of years. So for us to put in $6 million, it's probably A, not going to be $6 million based off our experience from Jasper Place and Peter Hemingway. I think that would be a, a very unrealistic expectation. And then B, it's likely going to be closed as long as it would take for us to finally build this new rec center and we could just have the new one built. So repairing it, spending, you know, even $6 million to have it only reopen around the same time we could open up the new one, again, doesn't really feel like a good decision because it doesn't actually help the community's concern of getting a facility that they can use in the short term. Um, and it's just essentially throwing money away that could be used towards 
the the main facility. Um, you know, where my head is at, and this has always been my view, is that rolling miles, and I was glad to hear from Sir Lachlan, like th this is the next priority for recreation. Like this is the one that needs to be built next. Um, I think that's an important conversation that I know we'll have at budget, but to me, this is this is critical for a space like this. And it touches on an earlier point I mentioned that these communities in the core on the south side of the river um, are heavily less car centric than most of the communities across the city of Edmonton. And so it's not as reasonable to say, oh, you know, just head down to Kinsman, just head down to, to the nearest one um, when you don't have a car. And so we need to make sure that this next stage is approved so that we can actually get this built and we're not losing any time. To me, it's it's never been an issue if we're doing rolling miles. It's always been a when, and, and we'd started down the checkpoint process. And my expectation is upon completion of checkpoint three, we, we approve the next body of work. Um, and I know that doesn't help in the short term, but I, I come back to that point that if, if if I'd been told today there was a low to medium risk to residents, to users of that, that facility to find a way that would allow us to keep it going for a bit, no question, uh, whatever, we'll, 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 I would have been happy to support that, but that's not what we're facing today. And so, uh, unfortunately, we're, we're at the end of this particular piece and my my commitments in my last 20 seconds is that uh, I, and I have been supportive of early miles and moving these these stages forward. Uh, you know, former Councillor Henderson was a strong advocate for that, and I know Councillor Jans is advocating strongly for that. Um, it's the next recreation priority. I think we need to make sure that we we expedite this as soon as possible so that this community is not without that space. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack. So before I go to Councillor Rutherford. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you for being here today and sharing your uh, views with us and uh, your uh, love for Skona Pool and how it has impacted your lives and uh, lives of many of the young people uh, at, uh, in, in, our, in our community. I have always been a uh, supporter of uh, keeping Skona open. Uh, some of you know that, uh, the world work together during my time on council, uh, and this is a very disappointing and regret regrettable position that we are in today, and uh, it is nobody's fault. And I want to also commend administration for uh, keeping it open as long as they could have, right? And uh, and uh, and also giving us very uh, objective analysis uh, of uh, of this uh, this facility. So my decision may disappoint some of you today. Uh, but I cannot, in, uh, uh, I cannot support continuing to keep uh, this going open anymore because of uh, many uh, points that council members have uh, have identified. Uh, but I look forward to moving forward. Uh, I can assure you, each and every one of you and people listening, that my commitment to Rolly Miles is very deep. And I'm going to do whatever I can in my capacity to ensure that that project gets built and gets built faster. And then I really want to commend my colleague, Council Jans, uh, for bringing forward a motion in, uh, in May to have that discussion uh, during our budget uh, in uh, uh, November and December. And that motion was debated at community services and the entire community services committee supported that motion. So that probably speaks to the commitment of the council as well to, uh, uh, to, to that project. I don't think it's physically responsible to be putting $6 million into a facility or more than $6 million into a facility that would have to be closed for a number of uh, months or years, even if we do that. I think uh, we need to, uh, and I think having Rolly Miles once it's built would add more amenities and programs and, uh, and, and uh, it will be better facility, absolutely a better facility uh, for, for, the, 
for the community. One thing that I lo would look forward to, and uh, this would be could be a very good subsequent motion for committee to consider, is how do we accommodate the groups that currently use SCONA, uh, whether at our facilities or at private facilities. I think we need to make sure that happens. And uh, maybe we could give a direction to, uh, uh, to administration to make sure they are accommodated in uh, uh, once uh, that uh, once the uh, the SCONA pool closes, I really uh, like Councillor uh, Nack's idea as well. Figuring out a way to improve access for communities members who don't drive to uh, other facilities in in in, in close vicinity. Uh, I don't know what how, what kind of bus service there is from uh, that neighborhood to. Uh, 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 to Bonnie Doon or to Confederation or to Kinsman, but something to look at. We should be looking at that, right? You know, I know Isabella still would have to drive from uh, uh, <laughs> from um, uh, 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 right? But people who live in the community probably would get on the on the bus to uh, go to uh, go to that facility. So I, it is not a decision that any of us. Uh, uh, Takes uh, takes lightly. It is uh, we're doing making it with the, with pretty uh, in, in a uh, in a regrettable situation. Uh, and uh, sorry to disappoint many people, but uh, I think the responsible thing to do, both physically as well as looking into the future, is to make that decision and put that six million dollars into uh, into further design work that needs to be done uh, on Raleigh Miles to get it construction ready then approve their budget to get their project going as quickly as, as possible. And that's my commitment, and I hope that during budget we'll be able to demonstrate their commitment to the to the community as well. So, yeah. And I will uh, go to Councillor uh, uh, Rutherford to, uh, to close. Yes, uh, thank you. I don't want to, you know, take a bunch of time to repeat what a lot of my colleagues have already said. Um, and yet I think I, I think I need to in many ways, just maybe in a different way. So first and foremost, I want to make sure that that the community members that came today understand that the decision before us is very hard. And by making the decision we're making today, it doesn't mean that we don't hear you. We have heard the value of recreation. We have heard the value of you know those 15 minute communities and your commitment to to that we've heard the value of community at least that's what i have heard today and we are really in a rock and a hard place with this decision as with many of the decisions that are coming before us quite frankly now and and into budget um you know and you gave the example of the the car and, and you're right, like maybe if it was just a, a, a belt, a motor belt that needed replacing, we can make that work. But this is a complete overhaul of the engine from what I'm hearing. When you talk about foundational issues, that's what you're dealing with. And we can't keep investing in, in this at this point. It's, as Mayor said, not fiscally responsible nor do you achieve the gap. I know I know that Councillor Knack already talked to his experience with Jasper Place. I haven't experienced Jasper Place, but I, I sure as heck have experienced in my short tenure, some of the complexities and challenges with Peter Hemingway. You know, that pool has been closed for a significant amount of time and many community members have been looking for it to open because they had the same sentiments and same feeling of community. And it, it's just iterates the complete complexity of these refabs on older pool facilities. And I, I agree with administration's assessment. I think six, six million is the absolute minimum. I don't think that's where we would end up being, quite frankly. And I know the call from community members to, you know, just keep limping it along as much as possible. But what I also hear is, we have limped it along as much as possible since 2015. It has limped along. And at some point, you know, it, it can't keep it can't keep going. The the risk is too high in terms of financial, the risk is too high in terms of safety and security, which, you know, as my colleagues mentioned, we we have to take very seriously. I would I would hate 
to you know try to limp this this along and something devastating happened like the roof collapses and people are hurt or injured i just can't even contemplate something like that as as a risk that that is potential i also want to take a minute to talk about engagement because i think often we we say there's no engagement but this today was a process of engagement. Community members could come and talk directly to decision makers about the decision that affected them. That is, that is a form of engagement. However, we also have to recognize that engagement is a, a you know, a factor of looking at both policy, technical expertise, and public. And this is where right now the technical expertise that we're hearing is just how much this facility itself uh, cannot be sustained. I wish I could be as optimistic as my colleagues with Rolly Miles and say that I have the same deep commitment to support it at budget. Uh, I definitely want to, I absolutely do. However, again, we just, we just approved two rec centers, brand new rec centers in Edmonton as a whole. And we have, uh, we have, uh, transit facility we need to to build we have other growth uh items like the the walker yards is it walker yards ambleside ambleside yards uh that need to be built for snow clearing and transit so i'm i'm glad that it is going to be part of that debate i definitely will hear your voices when we are having that debate uh, and i do know that the coronation rec center for example that conversation was started in 2000. So I, I hear your your concerns about it being a maybe right now, and I don't I don't disregard that. Um, but do know that uh, if there is a path forward, we will absolutely find that path. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. So please vote. I mean yes. Just a moment, uh, because we are past our eight hours, eScribe needs to be refreshed. Apo and apologies, Councillor Knack, was that from you? Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. I voted no. Thank you, Councillor Rice. And apologies again, Councillor Mack. I'm sorry, could you please repeat your vote for clarity? Yes, my vote is yes. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. It has passed four to one. Okay. Uh, there is subsequent, Councillor Stevenson, Councillor Rutherford, are you going to make that subsequent? Okay, go ahead. And, and can I actually move first uh, to extend orders for 10 minutes? Because I also do have a notice of motion. Okay, so just well, let's make it 5.15. So can we, we 515. extend orders to 5.10? 5.15 is to make it just to be on 5.15, sure. Yeah. So I move okay. that we extend orders to 5.15. Okay, please vote. I mean, yes. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Okay, and so I will do the subsequent motion now, which is uh, that admin work with all users of the SCONA pool to accommodate their existing programming, including transportation options. Um, yes, that is yeah. my motion. Yeah. Good. That's a very good motion. Uh, Just subsequent give us motion. one moment, please. You want to make a quick introduction, Councillor Rutherford? Yeah, I think you know, just quickly highlighting that you know we did we did hear that, and and so I think it's really important that we still find places for all of these amazing sports teams and and youth that want to practice and continue their love of swimming. I think we need to make sure that they have ways to to get there uh, easily and effectively, and if that means a shuttle, a direct shuttle from the school, let's say to 
to another pool. Um, I think those are options we need to explore to make sure that in this stopgap, that that there is those options for residents. And I'm, I'm not sure if many of my other colleagues have anything to add, but I, I, I do feel strongly that uh, this this is a viable option considering, you know, when you think about the budget between, you know, a transportation solution versus the money we would have spent on operating. I think we can we can make that work and then help the community in that way. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Okay, we have a subsequent on the floor. No more questions. Anyone to speak? Seeing nobody. Oops, Councillor, oh, sorry, okay, here we go. Councillor Stevenson to speak. Or, or you have questions? Yeah. Qu I just, uh, questions? I just, yeah, I just have a very quick question okay, to, ahead, to Councilor. the mover. Okay. Uh, I do think this is very important for the transportation options and also how we can uh, support existing programs. But my question to the mover, uh, do you have any uh, sense and how much cost could be and then for this additional uh, accommodation and including transportation uh, options? Because for transportation option, we, we are already in the difficult and the struggling challenging situation even to enhance the existing current level of services and for transportation for many, many neighborhoods and specifically in the newer neighborhoods. Uh, but I, I really appreciate the great attention here, yes. And then that means we, we don't want to do that six million dollars. And right now we are put another maybe million, million dollars and to do this. So is that something uh, we already considered or not considered yet? Uh, for you. Yeah, I was on mute. I know. <laughs> Thank you. For me, I considered it in terms of, you know, the report highlights that in addition to those capital costs that we would have had to invest to bring the, the facility up, which we discussed at length, there was also operational costs that we, we paid monthly. Um, so I, I feel like there is absolutely operational budget to be found for for transportation options. And I think, you know, it's about the what's the right thing to do. And, and for me, based on what we heard and finding that balance of like knowing we had to make a very hard decision on the closure, this is a way to still, to still um, help those residents um, and it's the, for me, the right thing to do. Uh, I, I'm definitely, I, I'm going to support this because this is a, something we could accommodate and to address some concern from our, our community. I just don't want to bring that concern uh, to us. And then because there, there, there are two different funding sources in, involved with this. One is the capital and one is operation. So specifically, and for all those involved, will definitely significantly impact our taxpayers. Our taxpayer dollars and is widely used for the cross city. And then, so is that the proper way and then to do something and use our taxpayer dollars and be physically responsible and to address some, something we could address in a different way. So I do have that concern I want to put there, but definitely I'm going to support our use and for the programs as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ray. So you've spoken on this, Councillor Stevenson. Yeah, maybe um, really appreciate the mover bringing this forward. I think you're right that uh, there is that existing operational budget that, that um, we could support this through. Just wondering if administration had anything they wanted to add. I saw saw some conversations and just wanted to open up the floor if there was something to to share. Well, just that the first part of it is something we've committed already to do. And through Councillor Knack's questions, I committed that that would be a takeaway, you providing this direction. Um, I think within our delegation, we can determine the best method to provide this. Um, which, from my perspective, doesn't require a report. It's just direction to administration to carry out the work. And um, we were just musing about different options that we could pursue around the transportation options. Okay. 
Great, great. No, wonderful to hear. I agree there's no need for a report back. Um, but I think this, this demonstrates the, the commitment that we have to see these programs continue uh, to support you during, during the transition phase uh, and that bridge until the new facility is ready. So thanks again to the mover for bringing this forward. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, and quickly speaking to this, this is a very good uh, subsequent motion. So thank you, Councillor Rutherford, uh, for putting it forward. I think it uh, is not only will benefit uh, the people who might have to access other facilities uh, in the vicinity, but excellent overall improved transport. If we are able to figure out a way to improve transportation within that community, it will help everyone else in the in the neighborhood as well, right? I think uh, this will really. I think it will, might be a great way of. Uh, looking at transportation options in uh, some of the uh, neighborhoods where uh, 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 people are opting for more sustainable modes of transportation. Yeah, it will be interesting to know what administration comes up with on this. Good. All right, so I will call the vote. Oh, sorry, Councilor Rutherford, you want to close or you want to vote? Go to vote. Go to vote? Go to vote is okay. fine. All right. Okay, please vote. I mean, yes. Thank I'm you, yes. Nack. Thank you, Councillor Rice. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. We have all the votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. And Councillor Rutherford, you, sorry, just hold on. Just give me one second. So that concludes our item 7.3. And a response to consular inquiries, none, private reports, none, motions pending, none. And we already dealt with 10.1. Notes of motions and motions without customary notice. Councillor Rutherford. Yes, I do. I do have a notice of motion that I'd like to provide today so that I'm giving notice of a motion I'd like to make uh, to council on Monday at the council meeting, and that is that administration pause efforts to wind down the aggregate recycling program until city council determines if the program is in alignment with city priorities and strategic goals. Administration is to provide a report uh, to council through committee, which includes the following documentation and analysis. An analysis of the proposed wind down of the aggregate recycling program in alignment with city strategic plans, business cases, audits, and program service reviews related to the aggregate recycling program, a cost and risk analysis of closing the aggregate recycling program, including documentation comparing the program cost, material quality, waste diversion rates with that of a private industry, and an overview of plans for disposal of materials from city projects and breakdown of costs. And this would be due to utility committee either uh, November. Uh, do I have to say the due date now, or do I just have to say that? At the I, I'll sorry. say the due date of November fourth uh, or twenty fifth, and to council on December fifth. Yeah, this will be debated at council. Yeah. It'll be debated at utility committee. Or utility. It's supposed it has because it's a utility. It, I've been advised it's supposed to go like so. I can put the motive, motive motion forward at council. It will be debated at utility committee, but because of the way I've worded the motion, it will still end up being a council, ultimately a council decision. Yep, got it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. So that concludes our agenda, and we are adjourned.